All right. So here's Tom's question. I'm very much aware of Mike's view of inspiration and degree. Humans are very involved, and so is God's sovereignty. Indeed, it seems that Scripture is 100% the work of the human author, but also 100% the work of God. It occurs to me that there are clear parallels to the written revelation, the Bible, and the incarnate revelation, Jesus. Our theology tells us that Jesus is both fully human and fully God, and there are no trade-offs or losses of either humanity or divinity. Is it fair to say that the written word is fully human and fully divine, just as Jesus is fully human, but also fully divine? Is that a fair observation? And does that help anyone better understand Mike's view of inspiration? Well, I would certainly say scripture is 100% the work of human authors, and it's 100% the work of God in terms of providence, sovereignty, and whatnot, because you, you wouldn't be able to speak coherently about the really anything happening that doesn't escape, you know, God's notice or his sovereignty. You know, of course it gets you into how you define sovereignty and whatnot, you know, in, in light of free will. But sovereignty is not absent, let's put it that way, even though it's subject to definition. However, I, I'm really I'm really not comfortable with describing or assigning divinity to a book. And the reason for that is divinity, as I think of it, is a quality of a supernatural being, in other words, a living entity. So that's why it works with Jesus on both sides, human and non-human, human human and and deity, because he is a living being, either way, either either incarnate or you know not not incarnate. Uh, You know, God is the spirit and all that stuff. So that that's why that language, the language of divinity works uh, for me. Uh, I, since since I, I, I parse divinity that way about, again, being a quality of a supernatural being or a being created in God's likeness, you know, like us, we're created in God's likeness and we can speak of ourselves as being divine, especially in our glorification. But again, we're living beings. So that that's why I hesitate to take that term that works so well with living entities and assign it to an inanimate object like a book or a manuscript or something like that. So I don't I don't really like that that language for that reason even though I affirm, you know, that God didn't take a day off or a minute off, you know, while while you know he was you know engaged in in however he was engaged in providentially overseeing the process by which we get this thing called the Bible. So I think you can still affirm that, but again I would be very wary of of using a word like the Bible is divine just for that reason. It's, it's, it's a semantic thing, you know, for me. So I just don't think the word fits inanimate objects really well. Um, you, you know, you have holy vessels, of course, you have holy vessels, of course, and, um, a word like sacred works well, you know, with, with a, an object, an inanimate object. Scripture is certainly 100% sacred, but again, I just don't like the word divine when used of an inanimate object. So that maybe that's just me, but you're asking me, so that, that's how I look at it. Now, having said all that, I would express the idea a little bit differently. I'd say that the final product of the process of inspiration is fully human, again, since it came by virtue of human hands, and fully acceptable to God. That is, it fully accomplishes what God had in mind and contains no errors in terms of its truth propositions. And I've, I've said you know, things to this effect before on the podcast. Uh, again, I can't expect everybody to have heard all that, but um, that, that's, that's sort of the way I would express it. It, it. Scripture is exactly and fully what God had in mind. So this thing produced at the end of the process of inspiration, I do not view inspiration as an event. I view it as a process. There are many hands that touch this thing you know, we, we call a scripture that contribute to producing the final product, again, this thing that we assign sacred status to and call it the Bible, uh, most of whom we'll never know, most of whom you know, aren't even alluded to in, in the pages of the text itself. But God prepared each one, each writer, each editor, each you know, person who had played some role in giving us the final product. God providentially prepared you know, people for you know, that 
moment, that touch point, that contribution to this thing we call scripture, thing of this thing we call the Bible. So providence is a big deal for me. A process is a big deal. So I would say at the end of all that, God was happy. Okay, it, it was what God wanted it to be, and it contains no errors in terms of its truth propositions. Now I distinguish truth propositions, as many listeners will know, from the means by which those propositions are expressed or communicated. In other words, the thing claimed, okay, a, 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 that's a proposition, the thing claimed and the means of making the claim are not the same, okay? They're not the same items. They're different things. They're different but related things. So, for example, a biblical writer can say something that doesn't conform to what we know that, that's true about earth science, okay? Something like that. Again, just I'm speaking in generalities here. A scripture writer, you know, can, can make an allusion to something that we know is demonstrably contrary to physical, natural reality. But who cares? Because that isn't the truth proposition. It's a means by which the biblical writer is moving toward expressing and asserting a truth proposition. And I believe that Scripture's truth propositions are not errant. I believe in, in, in inerrancy in that, that way. Again, everybody gets to define inerrancy and all that stuff. And we all know that. If we've spent any time looking at the subject, so I, I this is why I'm comfortable with using a word like inerrancy of Scripture because the things that it asserts, that it demands that we believe, these truth propositions, they are without error. But the means by which they are expressed might be a different story. Okay, so I think that's a necessary distinction. It's a coherent distinction because the thing that is claimed is not the same as the means by which it is claimed. This is a simple you know, sort of lesson in coherent thinking, you know, logic, that I think applies really well to Scripture and does not impede on Scripture's authority at all. Because authority is rooted in truth propositions, not the means by which those propositions are expressed. Dennis has our next three questions, and the first one is, any insights on why the demons that Jesus cast out seem to have a specific notion of when? Jesus is supposed to exercise authority over them? Yeah, I, I would say the reason they have a sense of this is likely, you know, the Old Testament, uh, specifically Day of the Lord passages. Um, you know, my point is not that, my, my point is not that um, demons are subscribers to every little scrap of scripture that comes along and, hey, did you read the latest? You know, we're, we're, we're like doomed in, into the abyss, you know, until the end of time. But I, I think as people, as people, again, you know, talk about that as they think about it, you know, I think a, a divine intelligence, a supernatural intelligence, of course, is going to run into that idea and be told that idea by God himself. God isn't going to tell them one thing until, you know, prompt scripture writers to write something down that's different. There's going to be consistency there. So we don't want to turn this into a cartoon. But the information, again, you know, should be available. So that that's why I think you get this sense. Of course, you could you could say, well, this is all the writer. The writer can read the Old Testament. This is the way the writer casts the story. You know, sure, you can say that too. But you know, since I believe you know demons are real supernatural intelligences that interact with human beings, and of course interact with God, and God is going to be consistent what he you know the sentence he you know pronounces on them, and telling humans what sentence he pronounced on them, God's going to be consistent there. It's not a surprise that they know that they're under a curse. And that the Day of the Lord you know, is that, that that's what they got to look forward to. So you have Day of the Lord passages in the Old Testament that specifically telegraph the idea that it's that at that time that the supernatural forces that are hostile to God are going to get judged along with the wicked, you know, the wicked on earth in terms of people. But God's going to clean house in both places. You know, and there are passages that allude to this, just just a couple. And then I'm also going to mention a couple Second Temple passages like from Enoch that say the same thing. And, and Enoch's getting it from the Old Testament, too. So you have Isaiah 34, 1 through 4. Draw near, O nations, to hear and give attention, O peoples. Let the earth hear and all that fills it, the world and all that comes from it. For the Lord is enraged against all the nations and furious against all their host. He has devastated them to destruction. He has given them over for slaughter. Their slain shall be cast out. The stench of their corpses shall rise. The mountains shall flow with their blood. Yeah, that's, that's very earthly because they're bleeding. And then we have all the host of heaven shall rot away, and the skies shall roll up as a scroll. Their host shall fall. 
Now, I've mentioned before, and this would be like naked Bible trivia time, um, that the phrase in Hebrew, their host, sava, with a third person plural suffix attached to it, that that is in the Hebrew Bible always, that's a, that's a morphological form that in context is always about supernatural hosts, not earthly hosts. And I didn't come up with that. That's the work of Joel Reemsma. Uh, I've mentioned his uh, ETS paper a few times on the podcast before. Uh, he did his dissertation in this area, specifically Isaiah 34 and its relationship to Psalm 82. Uh, Isaiah 24, 21 is another one of these. Let me just read that quickly. On that day, and that's stock vocabulary for the day of the Lord, on that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. So they're, they're the, 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 the two you know, God cleaning house in both realms is pretty clear in Isaiah 24, 21. So in view of this teaching, again, this is why I think we read what we do read coming from the, the, the demons. And, and think about the context. Jesus shows up, and, and they know who this is, you know, son of the most high, like duh. Okay, of course, they're the only ones that, that refer to Jesus with that language. They know who this is, and they don't necessarily know what, what the plan is, but they assume, look at what they assume. They assume that the son of the king, who is the, the crown prince, he's you know, in, in, in fact the king, he's the co-regent, he shows up. So ergo, therefore, it must mean that the day of the Lord is upon us because that is the time when God rectifies all things. The wicked is punished, the wicked are punished, the righteous are vindicated, and the kingdom of God returns to earth. So when they see him show up, that's what they're thinking. And, and they're asking, well, you know, like, give us a little more time. You know, don't, don't like, wipe us out. Because, you know, they, they, again, they know that this is eschatologically what the picture is. And in one sense, they're right. The kingdom has come. Jesus himself uses that language. But what they don't know is real important. He has to die. Again, this, this, this becomes part of the matrix of ideas that, that, that prompts them, and of course Satan, to kill him off. And they're duped because they don't know that, that his death is actually the thing that is the plan, the, the linchpin of the plan, because you can't conquer death unless you have a resurrection, and you can't have a resurrection unless, until you have a death. Okay, so you have to have you know, God incarnate die and rise from the, you know, the dead to, to, to fix this problem. But all that they're tracking with is the kingdom stuff. And again, largely it's because of the Old Testament. You get this in Enoch. I'll just read one, uh, one passage in Enoch. I was going to read a couple, but just for the sake of time, we'll just restrict it to 1 Enoch 10. You get this again in Second Temple period. People in the first century are going to be familiar with this as well. So we'll flavor this with a little bit of Old Testament, a little bit of Second Temple literature. First Enoch 10 verse 12 says, When they and all their children have battled with each other, when they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them for 70 generations underneath the rocks of the ground. This is the judgment of the watchers passage. Bind them for 70 generations. Again, 70, the number of you know, totality. Underneath the rocks of the ground until the day of their judgment. And of their consummation until the eternal judgment is concluded. In those days, they will lead them into the bottom of the fire and in torment in the prison where they will be locked up forever. And at that time when they will burn and die, those who collaborated with them will be bound together with them from henceforth unto the end of all generations and destroy all the souls of pleasure and the children of the watchers, for they have done injustice to man. And this is God's. You know, pr- ju- you know, pronouncement of judgment on the watchers. So it, the watchers are sent to the abyss, they're in prison, they're going to be there for 70 generations. And then, you know, when that's up, then they're going to be there permanently, you know, they're going to get, you know, destroyed, so on and so forth. So this is what the, the language of, of demonology, again, in the Gospels and in some of these passages, is what it's tracking on. And isn't it interesting that you have a similarity be- between the Gospel ideas of what the, the demons in the Gospels are expecting to happen to them? You have an overlap here with this material in Enoch, and again, it's connected to the Watcher story. Again, we, th- this takes us back to the whole you know, paradigm of Second Temple Judaism that demons, the demons in the Gospels, those guys are the departed spirits of you know, the Nephilim. You know, they're, they're, they're in the abyss and all this kind of stuff. So you know, we've talked about this really at length. You know, reversing Hermon deals a lot with it. 
Archie Wright's book, Origin of Evil Spirits, is the book to get on on that particular topic. Of course, Archie's going to be with us at the Naked Bible Conference, and hopefully we'll have him on the podcast before we hit the conference. So it's very consistent. It's very consistent thinking between you know what we read in this this area in the Gospels and what we read both in the Old Testament and in Second Temple literature. And also, Mike, we were there at that location, the site of yep. Jesus casting out those demons, which is yeah, in the area where yeah, where Legion that, that whole story happened. Yep, yep, yep. yep. you get so, to see stuff like that. So it's crazy, you know. Just uh, for me personally, you know, now that we're talking about get a question like that, and I go right back to that location. Uh, if you haven't gone to Israel, people, you need to go. That's all I'm saying. Because yep. it turns out the Bible's true. It was it was nice not to see anybody naked running around and screaming or something like that. That would that'd be a little upsetting there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all see right. now, so th- there was your opportunity for one of these get naked comments you're yeah. always doing, and you know I, I laid that out. I gave you the soft. I was a softball. I yeah, I dropped it. I, I apologize. But, uh, <laughs> I, I was going with you know you need to go to Israel, and you're thinking about going <laughs> naked. So I think our roles have flipped here. Now you're okay. You've become right. the. Uh, I've right. lost my mind. Okay. Okay. So. Here's Dennis' the second <laughs> question. Are there any other alternative theories or teachings regarding the origins of demons in second temple literature or other relevant literature other than the disembodied Nephilim? Well, the only one that's really secure, you know, that that's not problematic in terms of uh, the idea is Philo of Alexandria. Uh, again, right in his book, is going to discuss Philo. Philo, I'll, I'll, I'll just read how Archie Wright describes Philo's view of you know, the, all this origin of evil spirit stuff. He says, Philo is the lone voice in the Alexandrian diaspora during the Second Temple period that has a different view, whose, whose view differs considerably from the tradition set forth in the Book of the Watchers. So yeah, there is one. There is an alternate view, but it is a lone voice, you know, crying in the wilderness. So Philo of Alexandria again did not um, buy into the uh, into the Book of the Watchers stuff for the origin of demons. So if you wanted, you know, to read him, you could, you know, get you could get Archie Wright's book again. He's gonna he's gonna track through, you know, some of that material or some book on Philo or whatever. The, some scholars would would toss in uh, something in in a line in Josephus, specifically in the Jewish Wars. Uh, book seven, uh, line 185. Uh, apparently, again, depending on which text you read, so there's a text text critical issue here. Uh, apparently, you know some of the some of the manuscripts define demons as the spirits of wicked men, which enter the living and kill them unless aid is forthcoming. Other texts say it's just the spirit of of the wicked. So it it, it lacks the word anthropos in the text. So the spirits of the wicked could be wicked anything, and of course. You know the the disembodied you know spirits of the Nephilim they would of course be wicked. So it, you know Josephus could be very consistent on that point again, but there's there's a manuscript issue. If you look at like Nice, the Nice edition of Josephus and the critical apparatus, it's going to suggest that Anthropos was added to you know to quote unquote correct or help the text. So Anthropos could be a secondary term, and I think again given the given the uh, significant uniformity of second temple judaism on this matter it it probably is a a late addition but for you know the the only one that's secure the only departure from this that you know isn't embroiled in issues like text critical readings would be philo of alexandria it seems fairly clear to me that the passover happening during christ's death and resurrection and the feast of weeks pentecost seem to have played some sort of prophetic role and perhaps are meant to help us understand these events more clearly by the feast that they are connected with. Do you believe that the Feast of Booths will play a similar role in some future event since it has not been connected with anything as significant as the Passover and the Feast of Weeks? Yeah, I mean, the, you have Passover, of course. You have a, a, the typology issue. You know, Christ is the Passover lamb, so that that's kind of obvious. You know, it has nothing to do with the future. That's, you know, the, the crucifixion. You know, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, again, it's the new covenant coming of the Spirit. That's what happens in Acts 2, so that, that's pretty easy. Uh, as far as the Feast of Booths, you know, Sukkot, 
I would, um, the best way I can answer this is, is to say, go listen to episode 206. We did an episode called the 70 bulls of Sukkot, 70 bulls of, you know, the, the feast of booths. And it, it's zeroed in on a passage in numbers 29, 12 through 34, that scholars have noticed that there were 70 bulls offered in that passage. And, you know, since you get 70, it, it draws attention to, um, you know, the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, the table of nations and all that kind of stuff. So it, we, we went through all of that material. Uh, critical scholars like to say that this part of the Feast of Booths celebration, these were 70 offerings to the gods of the nations sort of to pacify them. So you have this sort of residual polytheism going on in Numbers 29. I don't buy that at all. Uh, I, I think, again, f- for the reasons, the detailed reasons, go listen to episode 206. But I think the 70 bulls are offered not to the gods of the nations, but to commemorate deliverance from all other gods hostile to Israel. Because that's what the Feast of Booths is about. It commemorates the deliverance through the wilderness. The wilderness is the bad place. The wilderness is where you know, under dominion of, of you know hostile supernatural forces. This is why when Israel goes through the wilderness, the presence of Yahweh is with the camp. Outside the camp is a different story. So God guides them to the promised land, the portion, you know, Yahweh's portion for his people, Israel, you know, and surrounded by all the other nations that are under dominion of other gods because of Babel and Deuteronomy 32, all that stuff. So what I think is going on with this passage in Numbers 29 is that the bulls are offered to commemorate Yahweh's deliverance, his triumph over all other gods. He kept his people safe. It has nothing to do with offering to foreign gods. I think that's just, you know, a, a, a really significant misreading of the text. So we're not offering the bulls to kiss up to the other gods or to ask Yahweh for, you know, a show of common grace to those other gods or anything like that. You'll read this in, in rabbinic material. Again, just listen to episode 206. But the, the whole idea is to thank Yahweh for his deliverance. So that is, is how I'll handle that here. Again, for details on, you know, Sukkot. And there are, there are passages, again, that, that connect uh, the observation. There are passages that connect the observation of Sukkot with, again, a, a future time when the nations are regathered and reclaimed and all that. So, again, I, I tie that all in with the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, uh, the reclaiming of the nations. So, for the details, episode 206. Our next question is from Ed. If the Magi, who were not Jewish, recognized the signs in the heaven as foretelling the birth of the, a Jewish king, were there not any other astrologers who recognized this? In particular, it seemed like many sects of Judaism in the Second Temple period, such as the one at Qumran, felt they were living in the time of the coming of the Messiah. Are there any extra biblical references suggesting that others saw these particular signs and interpret them as announcing the imminent coming of the Jewish Messiah? Yeah, I'm going to refer uh, Ed and anyone else who's listening to another article. I'll I'll put this. It may already be there because I brought this up before. I just can't remember which episode. But uh, there's an article by Beckwith on the – the, the, the Jubilee chronology and the Qumran calendar and having something to do with the Messiah. I can't remember exactly what the title is, but the author's name is Beckwith. But the short answer is, yeah, you know, the, there were other people who, by virtue of the calendar system they were using and their beliefs about the calendar, were expecting a Messiah. And, and specifically, I have in mind here the, the, the sect at Qumran, whether they be Essenes or somebody else. It's not really an issue here. They, Whoever they were, they were using a particular calendar. They were using a mathematical calendar and not a strictly astronomy-based calendar. So the, the short version of this, again, I, and I know I've mentioned this before in the podcast, I just can't recall exactly where, was that uh, you read in the, the Second Temple book, the, the Book of Jubilees, you read in certain Dead Sea Scrolls that, you know, how history is divided into certain periods. The Book of Jubilees, history is divided into Jubilees. That's why it, get, it gets its name. So you have these Jubilee cycles. And the people at Qumran, this was very important to them, these 49, 50-year cycles uh, dividing up history. Now, what the people at Qumran did, again, they, they used a mathematical calendar, not, not one that was tied specifically to astronomy. They divided up the year into 
four quadrants of 90 days between each one, they would put a day. So now you have 364 day calendar. They knew that this did not conform to, you know, the strict observation of the heavens. They understood that again, Beckwith goes into great detail in his, uh, his, his book, not just the article, but his book on uh, calendar and chronology uh, by a- in ancient Judaism and Christianity. So they were aware of this, but they didn't care because they viewed this calendar, this particular mathematical calendar, as reflecting the mind of God. And you say, well, why, why would it reflect the mind of God? Because if you use their calendar, and they started their calendar on day four of creation, that was, that was the first calendar day. You say, why day four? Well, that's when the sun, you know, was the, you're, the timekeepers were, were invented then. So they, that's when they started their calendar. That was the, the, the first day for them. And if you plug in this numerical system, what it produces is that for them, for the people at Qumran, every Sabbath, every festival, every Passover in the Israelite calendar always happened on the same day of each year. It never varied. It was perfect. And they would, they would mock. And this is why the, the people at Qumran separated from the Pharisees in the Second Temple period. They, they, they fought with them over calendar because the calendar used in the mainstream Jewish community was an astronomical one. And it, re- it required the addition of a 13th month every so often to help calculate the date of Passover. And the, the, the guys at Qumran would say, you know, you, you people are, this is a human calendar. You're fiddling with this calendar. It doesn't work because you invented it. You know, you're, you're not going with the mathematical precision that God created from the very, you know, at the very first, you know, you're, this is, this is a flawed human calendar. We're not going to use a calendar that you have to tinker with. What God intends us to use is something that is untinkerable and you don't need to tinker with it. So they actually split. They left, these are priests. They left the priesthood of Jerusalem which is where the temple was. And they went out to live in the desert. And then for the rest of their time there, they would pretend, they pretended to have a temple where they observed their calendar in the desert because they believed that the order of the universe, the perfection, the mathematical perfection of the mind of God should be lived out and mimed on earth. They believed that they were connected to the angelic priesthood. This is what the angels in heaven are doing. They're, they're, they're doing these things up there on these certain days and at certain intervals. and It's always regular. So we need, to con- we need to connect to them. Heaven and earth need to be connected. So they're down there in the desert conducting rituals without a temple. And they produce these esoteric writings about the heavenly temple and their temple and all this kind of stuff. This is what they're doing. And you look at them and you think, these are crazy people. Well, they might have been crazy, but look at the reason why they're doing it. They believed that their calendar reflected the perfect order that God intended. Now, you say, how does all that relate? Well, part of that calendar were these jubilee cycles. And they actually, you know, Beckwith lays this out in his article, that beginning with day one, the 100th, and that was a sacred, another sacred number to the people at Qumran. Again, you can read Beckwith for why, but the 100th. 49 year cycle that would be 4900 years that at the end of that grand set of jubilee cycles the messiah would appear and if you just plug their system in they were expecting a messiah sometime and it varied because are we going to use 49 or 50 and all that kind of stuff so back with this is playing with the math here they were expecting the messiah according to their system sometime between 10 bc and 2 AD, 10 BC and 2 AD is, is, is how Beckwith lays it out. Now, you know, if, if you, again, take the view of the birth of Jesus that, you know, I've, I've argued for here, September 11, 3 BC, it falls in that window. So right around, again, the, the, the time of the birth, let's say you don't buy the September 11, 3 BC, but, but somewhere in there, you know, most, the consensus view has Jesus born 6 BC or 4 BC or something like that. You're in that time window. So this is part of the reason that there was this expectation. Now, certainly among the people at Qumran, and of course, you know, people are going to go out and they're, they're going to talk about what the nutcases out in the desert are doing and what they're saying. So there would have been the, these speculations would have circulated to some degree. 
uh, within the the interested community back in the city of Jerusalem, and in the in the wider you know wider Judea. So this is directly related to calendar, you know how just how they marked time. This is what they were expecting. Joshua has our last question. Directly after the deluge and also the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, there are sexual sins, Noah's nakedness, and Lot's drunken incest. Is God trying to indicate that no matter how much he destroys the problem physically, the problem remains, and what man needs is a spiritual remedy instead? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not completely sure what Joshua is, is angling for or asking for here, um, and, and here's why. Based on, on the wording of, of that question, here's what makes me uncertain about what the point of the question is. Nobody was destroyed in the Noah episode. I mean, what, what happens with Noah, the sexual sin there, is after the flood. So Ham isn't destroyed. Canaan isn't destroyed. I mean, the, the Canaan is cursed. But nobody's destroyed. Nobody's destroyed in response to Lot's sexual sin with his daughters-in-law either. So I, I have to confess I'm not really following uh, the question. And, and I would even add, in the Sodom and Gomorrah story, we presume – Again, that's a dangerous word, but we presume that God is looking to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of their sexual sin, because of homosexuality or something like that. It kind of actually never says that. You do have you know, homosexuality in the picture after the two men, the two angels, get into the city and they have that episode with Lot. You know, then the men surround the house and come out, you know, bring those two guys out here that we may know them. And, you know, and that is sexual language. Okay, so this is it's it's a it's a brewing incident of homosexual rape, you know, at, at the very least. But that's that's after they get to the city. We actually have nothing in the biblical text that says that the city was targeted because of sexual sin. So e- even there, I, again, in my head, there's a disconnect between the the data of the text and the question. So I'm not really sure what what Joshua is is asking for here. Um, you know, I would think there, there's, there are lots of reasons why tar- Sodom and Gomorrah were targeted, one of which you know, is the, the sexual issues. But I don't want to confuse the, the targeting with you know, what, what happens afterwards or what doesn't happen afterwards in the, in the case of Ham and Canaan and Lot and his, his daughters-in-laws. Nobody gets destroyed there. So beyond that, you know, I'm not really sure how to answer the question other than to just say that for sure the solution to sin isn't behavioral reform. So if that's the question, that, that the, the real solution to sin, like these stories can teach us an idea, like the real solution for sin is, is heart change or having a new heart, you know, following the Lord or something. That, that's certainly true. Uh, and, and it's not just behavioral change or, or even necessarily, you know, judgment because people are hard hearted. They need new hearts. So if that's the point of the question, yeah, but I'm actually not sure that I'm tracking correctly uh, on on what Joshua was asking. Mike, I'll just take a stab at the uh, question, and the answer is yes. There you go. That's okay. <laughs> so, okay, well, there you yes. go. There you go. It's yes. <laughs> so you're welcome, Joshua. I'm ready if you are. Yep, yeah, let's jump into it. Our first one is from Margo. I have read arguments that Caleb, a prince of Judah, was most likely a Gentile convert, And I've also read arguments that Caleb was most likely not a Gentile convert. This seems to be a lively topic in Messianic circles, with Messianics favoring a Gentile origin for Caleb. Do you take a position on this question? Yeah, we should tell everybody. Trey let me see the the, the questions here, and and it's fortunate that he did, because this question is extremely complicated. We're we're probably going to take half the episode. Uh, to address this question. Um, so it was good to get a, a heads up. And I, what I decided here was rather than trying to wing it, since it is so complicated, you know, in the interest of time and clarity, I'm going to quote at length uh, on and off from the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary articles on Caleb, which the, that one's by Mark Fretz and Raphael Panitz, and the article on Kenaz. Uh, which is by a different author whose last name is Kuntz. We're going to have to hit both of those, and I'll I'll make some summary comments along the way to you know try to tighten things up here. But you know I don't really know why um, the Messianic movement 
cares about this. Uh, well, after I'm, I go through the material, I'm going to I'm going to venture a guess here, uh, at least part of the messianic movement. But I, I really don't see any importance to it one way or the other. And I think in the end, um, you'll see it's it's a bit of a moot point because. Does it really make much of a difference if some if someone was born into Abraham's lineage or married into it, you know, or absorbed into the the family of Abraham, the family of God, uh, at some other point or in some other way? So I, you know, I, I don't know why it's important, but we'll just we'll just jump in here. The, the first thing we have to sort of establish here is that there are actually three people in the Old Testament with that are named Caleb. So Fretz and Panitz write this to, to summarize kind of the uh, getting into the topic here, at least the at least the beginning part here. They say any discussion of the name Caleb and its variant form must of necessity also entail an investigation of the Calebites or the descendants of Caleb. Uh, and that's going to become an issue, uh, as we'll see. It's kind of important because depending on sort of which Caleb you're talking about, it's going to involve geography and sort of, you know, towns and things within a certain geographical area that, that get uh, absorbed into the tribe of Judah. So uh, sidebar here before we, we jump, you know, back into the three candidates or the three Caleb's here, the root, you know, someone might be out there wondering if this has anything to do with the question. I actually don't know, but I'm, I'm just throwing this out here. But the root of Caleb is KLB, okay, you know, Kaf Lamed Bet in Hebrew, which means dog. And and that should not be presumed to be automatically a pejorative or a negative thing. The root occurs in basically every Semitic language. And it can indicate either some sort of self abasement or debasement, that would be the negative connotation, or it can denote faithful servant, like you know, faithfulness as in just servitude. So you'll actually see if you if you ran a concordance search on Caleb, uh, the Hebrew term in the through the Hebrew Bible, you'd get examples in the Bible of both a negative and a positive uh, connotation. So with that sidebar over, the, 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 let's go to the three Caleb's here because there are three of these guys, and they all. This is where it gets kind of kind of convoluted. You have to sort of land on one uh, for the sake of the question. So. Again, quoting from Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary article on Caleb. Uh, the Frets and Panets write, The son of Jephunneh and the representative of the tribe of Judah among the twelve spies sent out by Moses to reconnoiter the land of Canaan is you know, sort of the first one. That's the one everybody thinks of. In contrast to God prohibiting the people from entering the land because they rejected his recommendation, God singled out, quote, my servant Caleb. Unquote, and promised to bring him into the land where he had gone and to give it to his descendants as a possession. It's Numbers 14, also Numbers 26, Deuteronomy 1, 36, so on and so forth. This promise set Caleb apart from all his peers, even Joshua, and it raises the issues of geographical location and genealogical identification of Caleb and the Calebites. And continuing, the land that came to be owned by Caleb through apportionment, that's the you know, doling out by lot you know, the, to the tribes, the land of the tribes, Joshua 14 and 15. So the, the land came to be owned by Caleb through apportionment, through force. Again, he has to go and, and fight for it. Or a combination of the two, uh, t- the, the, these two means, was associated with Hebron and Devir in southern Palestine. 1 Samuel 30, 14 identifies part of this area as, quote, the Negev of Caleb, unquote. If we identify the cities and boundaries of the tribe of Judah, it becomes obvious that the land owned by or associated with Caleb is located within Judah's borders. And the reference for that is Joshua 15, 1 through 12. Hebron is a key element in this association, in part because of its proximity to other Judahite cities. But in light of the centrality of the Davidic dynasty in the biblical tradition, it was as the first capital city of David that Hebron played an unquestionable and an important role. Note that Nabal, Nabal or Nabal, the first husband of David's wife, Abigail, was a Calebite 
who lived in this region. That's 1 Samuel 25, 3. Uh, that, we'll stop the quote there just to say, here's at this point, you know, that's the guy that we're all thinking of, okay, that the question is really targeting. But it's actually at this point where things get complicated uh, with the other two Caleb's. So c- going back to the article, we'll read uh, some more. So, so quote, in First Chronicles, several genealogies contain the name Caleb, and these reflect inconsistencies of lineage and raise questions in light of the other biblical information about individuals named Caleb. First, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, is only explicitly mentioned in a genealogy of the sons of Kenaz, or the Kenizzites, that's First Chronicles 4, 13 through 15, which is set within a section concerning the descendants of Perez. The daughter of this Caleb is named elsewhere as Aksa, that's Joshua 15, 16, and 17, and Judges 1, 12 through 13. While an Aksa is listed as the daughter of Caleb, the son of Hezron. So you got one, you know, you got this daughter of Caleb uh, in those references. Then you have a daughter of Caleb listed uh, as, the, as the daughter of Caleb, the son of Hezron. So you've got you got the Jephunneh guy, the, the Jephunneh Caleb. Now you got the Caleb, the son of Hezron here. Aksa is listed as the daughter of Caleb, the son of Hezron, and a grandson of Perez. Second, the Masoretic text never identifies the wife of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. So, you know, right away you think, well, are they the same? Are they different? What's going on here? Back to the quote. However, Caleb, the son of Hezron, has several wives and concubines. And his descendants are not easily placed in his genealogy. It's First Chronicles 2, 18 through 24, 42 through 55. One identifiable descendant, Bezalel, First Chronicles 2, 20, a great grandson of Caleb, the son of Hezron, was a contemporary of Moses, according to Exodus 31, 2 and 35, 30. And therefore, that one, you know, he, he can't be the great grandson, or excuse me, can't be the great grandson of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. So right away, we're we're, we're getting a confusion here with Caleb, these two Caleb's and the relatives. They they you know they they can't be the same. So third, a Caleb, the son of Hor, can be identified according to the Masoretic text of First Chronicles two fifty, but according to his genealogy, First Chronicles two forty two through fifty five, this Caleb appears to be his own grandfather. Fourth, the names of some of Caleb's descendants are place names. In other words, they're not people names, they're place names. Tekoa, Ziph, Madmana, and Hebron, which complicates an attempt to understand the purpose of the genealogies. Now, Williamson, in his New Century Bible commentary on First and Second Chronicles, resolves these problems by assuming that the chronicler pulled together most of the genealogies but was not concerned with the details of genealogical consistency. Rudolf, who is a German scholar, on the other hand, attributes the inconsistencies to later editions, which disrupted the consistencies of the chronicler's composition. It is generally agreed that one section, 1 Chronicles 2, 42 through 50, derives from a tradition which predates the chronicler probably from the United Monarchy or shortly thereafter. That's according to Williams, uh, his opinion in his New Century Bible commentary. Now, the Anchor Bible article continues and says, the key to resolving the tensions in these genealogies is the fact that Caleb is part of Judah's genealogy. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, is a Kenizzite who gained special status through his deeds in the wilderness wanderings and the conquest stories. On the other hand, Caleb, the son of Hezron, plays a role only in the genealogies of Judah, and Bezalel, the tabernacle builder, seems to be the central character in his genealogy. The chronicler does not attempt to relate Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, to Caleb, the son of Hezron because neither of them is central to his purpose of establishing a royal and cultic origin in the tribe of Judah. And that's the opinion of Williamson on page 52 of his commentary. Caleb the Kenizzite is important, rather, because of things he did, Numbers 13 and 14, Joshua 14, and the associations he had, Joshua 15, Judges chapter 1. Outside the chronicler's framework, let me read that sentence again without the verse references. Caleb the Kenizzite is important, rather, because of things he did and associations he had outside the chronicler's framework, 
although these were not unknown to the chronicler. Therefore, in addressing the questions raised above, Caleb the Kenizzite, who appears in 1 Chronicles 4.15, within the lineage of Perez, is to be identified with the individual so well known from the tradition of Calebites in southern Palestine, Numbers 13-14 and Joshua 14-15. To ask whether his daughter Aksa is the same as the daughter of Caleb, the son of Hezron, in 1 Chronicles 2.49, misses the point of the genealogy, at least in, in, in Chronicles. So you know, we have to distinguish these two. Now to continue again with a quote just a little bit more, this introduces the final issue of the function of genealogies. According to Wilson, and I little rabbit trail here, Wilson is, is one of the recognized experts in biblical genealogies. He's got a bunch of articles and, and a book on it. Uh, according to Wilson, genealogies can be used to delineate social and political ties. Now, catch that. Social and political ties, not necessarily blood ties, okay? Social and political ties between two groups and in particular to incorporate marginally affiliated clans into a central group. So I'll stop here just to make the point again. That genealogies are not always about lineal biological descent. They can be about social and political relationships. Okay, Back to the quote. The genealogy of Caleb is related in this way to the tribe of Judah, that is, socially and politically and was assimilated into the Israelite tribal system thereby. Not only the individuals and groups of people, but the places associated with them become part of the tribe of Judah. Thus, the genealogy provided a means for legitimizing social relations and for defining the geographical domain of the individuals or groups concerned. And here's their, their conclusion. It would appear that Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, is the name of a Kenizzite, whose personal exploits became the tradition of the clan which took his name as a patronym. That's who the clan is named after. This clan existed independently in southern Palestine, but through political, economic, and religious ties, it eventually became part of the tribe of Judah, even within the larger Israelite tradition. The distinctive stories of the Calebites were retained into the post-exilic period. Now, that's the end of the... Uh, Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary article on Caleb. And, and the thing to, to take away from this is that you could see why some would insist that Caleb is an Israelite because of this relationship to Judah. But what the article points out is that you can't rely on the genealogies to talk about biological relationships, blood relationships. Sometimes genealogies are about social and political circumstances. And again, the, the evidence points to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which is the, you know, the, the Caleb that everybody's thinking about with the conquest story, that that Caleb, he, was, he and his relatives, he and his tribe were incorporated into Judah, not because of blood relationships. They're not Judahites, but the incorporation of Caleb and, and that tribe into Judah is based really on geography and political relationships and social relationships that, that really are, are tied to geography. So, now that last paragraph, it would appear that Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, is the name of a Kenizzite, again, who's from southern Palestine. That last paragraph means we now need to think about Kenizzites. Okay, what's up with them? And for that, I'll go to a different article in the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, the article on Kenaz, that's K-E-N-A-Z, for those of you who have that resource. And if you don't have the resource, I highly recommend it. It's very detailed. The Kenizzites are ostensibly related to Kenaz, but there are three Kenazes in the Old Testament. Uh, so here's how the article, or the author of this article, his name, last name is Kuntz, summarizes the three Kenazes. He says, quote, first, there is Kenaz, the son of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau and Adah. That's Genesis 36, 11, 1 Chronicles 1, who functioned as an Edomite clan chief, again, according to Genesis 36, 15 and 42. Though Kenaz of Genesis 36, 11 is ordinarily understood to be the eponymous ancestor of the Kenizzites, in other words, their remote uh, progenitor. According to Genesis 15, 19, Kuntz writes, this connection is not buttressed by hard evidence. 
Second, there is Kenaz, the younger brother of Caleb and the father of Othniel. That's Joshua 15, 17, Judges 1, 13, 3, 9, and 11. In 1 Chronicles 4, 13, Kenaz is credited with a second son, Sariah. Third, there is Kenaz, the grandson of Caleb, through Elah. That's 1 Chronicles 4.15. The plural gentilic adjective, that's, that's sort of a people, gentilic refers to a people group term. The plural gentilic adjective Kenizzites surfaces but one time in the Old Testament, Genesis 15.19, within a promise that Yahweh makes to Abraham in a theophany. Listed in second position just after the Kenites, this is one of ten peoples whose land Yahweh intends to deliver to Abraham's descendants. In the singular form, this gentilic adjective is three times attested. Numbers 32.12, Joshua 14.6, and verse 14. In the phrase, quote, Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, this predication probably should be associated with the Kenizzites of Genesis 15.19. The Kenizzites were a non-Israelite ethnic group that presumably penetrated the Negev from the southeast. What little is known about them emerges mainly from consideration of their wider geopolitical context. Though scholars lack the necessary data for reconstructing the early history of these tribes in any detail, it is nonetheless clear that owing to the prominence of David and the increasingly sturdy position of the tribe of Judah from whence he came, these southern tribes were eventually subsumed under the category of, quote, greater Judah. From the narrative in Numbers 13 and 14, we may infer that the Calebites settled into the city of Hebron, and these non-Israelite, non-Israelite people set, settled into the city of Hebron and subjected its quite promising agricultural environments to their advantage. In Joshua 15, 13 through 19, and Judges 1, 11 through 15, which is its parallel, the spotlight falls on the Othnielites. We are told that Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the younger brother of Caleb, took possession of the city of Devir, southwest of Hebron. Though the text is too laconic to be of much help to biblical historians, it does attest that the Othnielites, residing in the hill country directly southwest of Hebron, clustered around Devir. To the southeast of Hebron, the Kenites held sway in the vicinity of Arad, according to Judges 1.16. The precise extent of the territories claimed by the Calebites, the Othniolites, and the Kenites is unknowable. Last you know, section here. Several biblical genealogies denote that the Kenizzites, Calebites, and the Othniolites were closely related tribal groups and that from their tent encampments along the foothills of southern Palestine, all three maintained intimate associations with their eastern Edomite neighbors. Caleb and Othniel are both recognized for their genealogical linkage with Kenaz. In due course, the Kenizzites and other neighboring southern tribal groups became thoroughly absorbed by Judah. That's the end of the Kuntz article, at least what we'll quote from it. So you take all of that, and where you land is the best position seems to be that Caleb is not an Israelite, but that he and his family or his tribal group were absorbed into Israel, becoming part of Judah. Now, I, I, again, as I said at the beginning, I really don't have any idea why this is an interest to Messianic Christians. It's no shock that outsiders became part of Israel in the Old Testament period. Rahab did. Job was from Uz, which is Edomite territory. Othniel is one of the judges. He would have also been an outsider. God uses outsiders and makes them part of his people. If anything, Caleb and these other examples show non-Israelites becoming part of Israel. That's not news. Uh, I hope that this isn't some sort of quirky argument used by Hebrew roots folks. Again, that's a subset of the Messianic uh, the, the messianic, uh, I guess, category. So I hope it's not some argument used by Hebrew roots people to say Gentiles need to become Jews. And the New Testament says the exact opposite. Gentiles are the seed of Abraham. That's a quote from Galatians 3. And heirs according to the promise. Also, point blank from Galatians 3. Not because of circumcision, and not because of other laws, but because of Christ. 
Abraham is the example of faith apart from the law, prior to his circumcision, and prior to the giving of the law at Sinai. So I don't know how much clearer the Bible can be on this sort of stuff, but if you want to make the Bible say what your group prefers, I suppose you're going to find a way. Unfortunately, this has become sort of routine for this little community in Middle Earth, you know, to prefer your pet position on something ahead of the gospel of the kingdom. But again, I'm just guessing on what might be the motive here, and that Hebrew roots is lurking behind this this question, not 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 on the part of the questioner, but this real interest in this or this. I, I don't know if I can even call it a fight since I'm I haven't, you know, I, I don't lurk on uh, Facebook or anywhere else to to find out what Hebrew roots groups are saying. So I'm just guessing here. But if it is some sort of argument that Gentiles have to become Jews, it's a bad one. It's one that, again, just point blank ignores the language of the New Testament. And it ignores the fact that Abraham is, is the you know, he is the litmus test. I mean, he is the point of reference for Paul as the example of faith. It has nothing to do with his circumcision. It has nothing to do with the law. The law didn't even exist, and Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. I mean, God knew his heart, and he believed before he was circumcised. Again, I just don't know how much clearer this can be, but there are some that just kind of don't really care. Uh, so, Maybe Hebrew Roots is behind this, looking for another non-sequitur argument. I don't know. It's just a guess. All right. Sean has our next few questions, and he wants to know, in certain Bible passages, the angel of the Lord sometimes doesn't seem to mean what we say it means in terms of second Yahweh figure. Is the term sometimes used more generally? Also, does Matthew 28, verse 2, run counter to Jesus being the angel entirely? Yeah. In the Old Testament, let me just preface it by saying this. You know, you, you, you can't assume in the New Testament particularly that when it says the angel of the Lord in an English translation that we're talking about the Old Testament figure, it, it gets a little bit confusing because of translation. I'll try to explain that. In the Old Testament, the phrase Malach Yahweh, okay? is definite. When you see that that combination, it's called a construct phrase in Hebrew, Malach Adonai, Malach Yahweh, okay? It is the angel of the Lord by rule of Hebrew grammar. When you have a noun, Malach, messenger, angel, linked to a following noun that is definite, and Yahweh is definite, there's only one of those. Proper names, proper personal names are definite by definition, in, in, in Hebrew grammar. When you have one noun joined to a definite noun, you, it makes the whole chain definite. So it's the angel of Yahweh. So that, that, that's Hebrew grammar. There's no way in Hebrew to just say an angel of the Lord, just, just an angel of the Lord, uh, in terms of the construct phrase. You'd have to have literally something like malach ladonai, that's Malach, it's preposition Lamed, plus the divine name, which never occurs uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible. In fact, you only get Ladonai and Malach in the same verse four times, but they're never in a possessive construction. So you, you really don't have, in, in the Hebrew Bible, a, a way to say, an angel of the Lord. When you have this construct phrase, it's always definite, the angel of the Lord. That is not the case in Greek, and it's not the case in the New Testament. In the New Testament, you can express you can express an angel of the Lord, just an indefinite one, uh, because Greek allows you to do that. It doesn't have the same rules, uh, syntactical, grammatical, syntactical rules as Hebrews. And Matthew twenty eight two is actually an example. There's no definite article, the word the before angel, the angelos in that verse, and the genitive relationship in Greek does not require definiteness. So. You, a good translation is an angel of the Lord. There's no, there's no necessary link back to that figure in the Old Testament. It's just generic. It's just, it's indefinite. Now I'm going to read a little, a little section from a footnote from my forthcoming angels book where I talk about this. So nice little commercial here for the angels book. Um, this is just part of a footnote. I wrote the phrase angel of the Lord occurs 11 times in the New Testament. 
Only once does it occur with the definite article suggesting a translation, the angel of the Lord. That's Matthew one twenty four. It is the angel of the Lord, again, ha angelos kuriu, definite article before angelos. It is the angel of the Lord who tells Joseph to marry his betrothed, Mary, because her conception, which would be Jesus, is from the Holy Spirit. There's no conflict between this occurrence and the idea that Jesus and the angel of the Lord from the Old Testament are the same second person of the Trinity. Trinity. The definite article in Matthew 124 is, it, it's there, the definite article is there, it's used to refer back to the angel who appeared to Joseph, a specific angel, in a dream four verses earlier in Matthew 120, where the phrase lacks the article. So in Matthew 120, you have you have angel of the Lord without the article. And then four verses later, as the story continues, the writer Matthew puts the definite article in front of Angelo, you know, Angelos Kuriu to make sure that you know that, that this angel I'm talking about now is the one that I talked about four verses earlier. That is a function of the definite article in Greek. The article preceding angelos is in grammatical parlance, the grammarians call anaphoric. That is, quote, it denotes previous reference, reminding the reader of who or what was mentioned previously, which is the most common use of the article and the easiest usage to identify. That's a quote from Dan Wallace's book, Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, an Exegetical Syntax of the New Testament. So the presence of the article in Matthew one twenty four is therefore not to be taken as the language that imitates the Old Testament wording. So that's the end of my footnote. So you, no, there's there's not a conflict here, but it's easy to, to you know kind of get a little bit confused because of the way English handles the, the phrases. You've mentioned before that the Trinity view of Genesis three was wrong because, among other reasons. Why would God tell Jesus and the Holy Spirit something he already knew? But doesn't Jesus say that there are things only the Father knows? Right. Well, first, first of all, my comments didn't pertain to Genesis 3, so I think that, that's got to be a typo. Uh, my comment was in reference to the plural exhortation in Genesis 1.26, let us create humankind in our image, saying that's, that's, that's not a conversation between the Trinity, and in part because God doesn't need to announce something to the other members of the Trinity. They're co-eternal and co-omniscient, and they already know. Now, the answer to the question, doesn't Jesus say that there are things only the Father knows, is yeah. Yeah, Jesus doesn't know something that the Father does, like when the Lord's going to come back. But that was spoken when Jesus was incarnate. In the incarnation, the Son surrendered the independent use of his attributes. That doesn't mean he surrendered the attributes, by the way, just you know, the, 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 the use of them. He surrenders the, the, the exercise of them, and that was voluntary. It's limited by the incarnation and or the Father's will. I mean, just think about it. Jesus could also get hungry. He could get tired. He could die. He could get sick. You know, he, he had to learn things. You know, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God, men, Luke 2, 52. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, Jesus having these limitations doesn't mean, you know, he isn't God, but there's something, there's something different going on. He is limited by, by being incarnate, by having a body, by being a man. The other two members of the Trinity aren't men. They are not embodied. They're not humans. The second person becomes human, and that changes the circumstances. It doesn't change his, his divine ontology, but it changes, you know, again, the, the, his, his whole relationship to his attributes in terms of functioning as God in an unfiltered circumstance. And so my comment about Genesis one twenty six is a different context. It's pre-incarnation. The Son, the second person of the Trinity, was not limited. So it's perfectly fine to say, hey, you know, back in Genesis 1.26, all the members of the Trinity would have known the same thing, they're co-eternal, co-omniscient. There, there's no limitation on any of them. It's a different circumstance when Jesus, you know, because of the incarnation, when Jesus is incarnate. And so that's when you get this language of limitation, you know, where, where Jesus doesn't know something that the Father knows. So the circumstances are different. Sean's next question is, if Jesus conquered death and his kingdom is at hand, Mark 9, for instance, 
Then why are principalities still called the rulers of this age? 1 Corinthians 2. He does say they are doomed to pass away. So is this more of the already but not yet phrasing? You know, let me take the first part of that. You know, why are they called rulers of the sage? It, really, it's because that language is based on or derives from the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Uh, they're, they're described as, you know, it, it's true that the rulers, you know, you can have other terms here as well, in the New Testament are described as defeated. But, but such titles, you know, the, these, these sorts of labels are the way to identify uh, who he's talking about in the context of the Old Testament, specifically the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. You know, the fact that they are defeated, you know, moving to the, the, the rest of the question here, the fact that they are defeated and are progressively losing people and losing control is part of the already but not yet matrix of ideas. So I think uh, Sean is, is, is tracking well on this. Uh, as the Great Commission is carried out, you know, they're, they're going to be displaced. They have lost legitimacy of rule. Again, remember that, that these rulers, to use, again, New Testament language, had their position by virtue of Yahweh himself giving it to them at Babel, at the disinheritance of the nations and assigning the nations to the sons of God. But the work of the cross, you know, the plan, God's plan, the plan of the Most High, withdrew that authority or nullified that authority or terminated that authority. Their rule is now illegitimate. It's over. So, you know, because when, when the whole incarnation, the cross event, the Son of the Most High comes again, and, and part of his mission, the effect of his mission, is to reclaim the nations. And so their, their legitimacy is over and done with. Gentiles are authorized, you could put it this way, to return to the family of God. God wants them to return. They are included now in the covenant with Abraham, again, back to Galatians 3. You know, you, if you are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Again, he's speaking to, to the Galatians. He's speaking to a predominantly Gentile audience there. Uh, they're included in the covenant with Abraham, but all of that doesn't mean that the supernatural powers hostile to God are not going to fight back or oppose God's will. I mean, goodness, they've been opposing God's will all along. So why would the cross event be any different? You know, the, the whole point of the language is that their, their authority over the Gentiles, over the nations, is illegitimate now. It has been removed by the, by the Most High who gave it to them. He has withdrawn it and terminated it. But that doesn't mean they're just going to roll over and say, oh, I guess we better be good now. I guess we better not be hostile to God. I guess we better not oppose God anymore. You know, that's what they've been doing the whole time. So you would expect them to resist, and that's what they do. And that's why, you know, Paul says, you know, our, our, our battle's not against, you know, flesh and blood, but against, you know, spiritual wickedness and high places and all that language. Is it merely coincidental that 1 Corinthians 6 begins with Paul mentioning judging angels and later in the verse discusses sexual immorality, which was the sin of the very angels we will judge? You know, I actually, I actually tend to think that it is uh, coincidental here, um, and I'll try to explain why. The reason is because the context, in the context, it's not the only statement. Like, you don't have the judging angels and then only talk of the sexual immorality. You actually don't even have the sexual immorality emphasized in the context. The, 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 the problem when Paul brings up his comment that, that you know, you're going to judge angels is taking each other you know, to court is the lawsuit problem. And then he moves on to sexual immorality and some other things. You know, the, you've got theft, drunkenness, reviling, swindling in, in 1 Corinthians 6.10. Um, so there's a lot going on there. It's not just the judging and then the, the sexual immorality stuff. Now, if you had only the statement of 1 Corinthians 6.3, you will judge angels, and then you know, coupled with the sexual stuff, then if, if that was the pairing, if that was the, the, the two sides of the coin, so to speak, then I think a connection back to the transgression of the watchers might be in view. But since we don't have that sort of exclusivity, uh, I, I tend to think it is coincidental. Sean's last question is maybe counter to the last question. In Genesis 6, God doesn't seem to wipe out the Nephilim for merely being born but for the corrupting of humanity subsequently. Would God have been angry had they not corrupted man? 
Is there a distinction to be made here or am I inferring something that isn't there? Would, does Jude 1, 6 through 7 indicate that the two are not distinguishable? Yeah, well, we we have a problem here with, uh, with conflating two related but different things. Jude 1, 6 and 7 talks about angels who, you know, left their first estate. I think that's King James language. Uh, The angels that sinned is the parallel. You know, in 2 Peter 2, uh, ESV has angels who did not stay within their position of authority but left their proper dwelling. They're the ones who end up in chains. Again, 2 Peter 2, the angels that sinned end up in chains in the abyss. So you have angels who sinned. Okay, the Nephilim are not angels. They're not the angels you got two different things here. It's the watchers. Again, that's the Second Temple Jewish term. The watchers, that's the the Second Temple Jewish, the Enochian term for the angels that sin, for the sons of God of Genesis 6. The Nephilim aren't those guys. The Nephilim are the, the byproduct. So, you know, the Nephilim are only in view in, in the biblical story in terms of there being a lethal threat later on, you know, their, their descendants being a lethal threat to the people of Israel during the conquest. And then they're also important because of the origin of demons. You know, when you, when you killed a Nephilim, then the disembodied spirit, that's what becomes known as a demon. And you get hints of that in like Ezekiel 32, Isaiah 14, when you have the Rephaim, you know, the, the, the disembodied Rephaim in Sheol in the underworld, in the realm of the dead. They're, so there are little vestiges of it in the Old Testament. And it gets more developed in the Second Temple period, the whole idea of where, where demons come from. They're the disembodied spirits of the giant clans, specifically the Nephilim, but the Nephilim are the ones who are the progenitors of the other ones. So we need to keep separate the angels that send or the sons of God you know, who transgress or the watchers. The, the, those are all three terms that refer to these heavenly beings, okay, in Genesis 6. The Nephilim are not those guys. So, you know, I I, I really don't know what else to add. I think that answers the question because the elements of the question sort of presume that the Nephilim are the angels, which is not the case. All right, our first one is from Lance, and his question is, what is the main purpose of the Masoretic, Translation, because of early Christians using the Septuagint and making the Jews who were Orthodox upset that their scriptures had been usurped. Well, just a few preliminary things here. First, the uh, the Masoretic text isn't a translation; it's a text. Uh, and again, this is something that you know, since it's related to discussions about the Septuagint, which is a translation, sometimes the, the terminology gets a little confusing, but the Masoretic text is a Hebrew Bible. It's not a translation. And second, you know, when people hear this question, they could hear it in such a way that they might assume that the Septuagint was around uh, before there was any Hebrew text that we would call the Masoretic text. That's not the case. So I don't think the questioner presumes that, but I, I, there might be somebody out there, you know, who is sort of hearing that in the question when that isn't the case. The the Dead Sea Scrolls provide evidence that at least three editions, three versions of the Hebrew Bible existed after the Old Testament period had closed. So if you think of the end of the Old Testament period, not as the return from exile, roughly, you know, 530s, you know, BC, but the Old Testament period actually closes a little bit after that because the Jews return you know, to their homeland. Then you have other activities, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. So it, it spills into the, you know, into the intertestamental, the Second Temple period. Let's just use as a number 400 BC. That's when the Old Testament period closes. So what the Dead Sea Scrolls show us is that there were, at that time, we'll just, just call it 400 BC or thereabouts, when you hit that mark, there are, there are at least three editions or versions of the Hebrew Bible in existence. Now, those three were what would become known as the Masoretic text, what would become known, you know, or what, what, what the text that would be used uh, to create the Septuagint as a translation, you know, what, what those guys used, you know, as their beginning point, and then the Samaritan Pentateuch. And I say at least because there are 
texts of the Hebrew Bible known from the Dead Sea Scrolls that don't align, don't match those other three. So there could have been more, uh, but there are at least three you know, additions. That's how it's typically how scholars talk about it. Now, all of this stuff is largely the same. You know, the, 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 the texts sort of divide or, or become distinct from each other in places where they disagree, obviously, but they're largely the same. Okay, there was a text, again, that would be nearly identical to what would become known later after 100 AD as the Masoretic text. That precursor Masoretic text is therefore called the Proto-MT, the Proto-Masoretic text. So again, we, you, you got to be thinking about what we're, what we're talking about. When, when you talk about the Masoretic text, that's something that's roughly 100 AD and beyond. That doesn't mean that there was no Hebrew text that would be in the Masoretic tradition ultimately, that would, you know, re- would reflect that Masoretic text that would be created around 100 AD. There were lots of texts, lots of manuscripts that looked basically 99 point whatever percent just like that one uh, that existed earlier, all the way back to 400 BC. So you have this, this, this era of textual or versional plurality and then you have this benchmark date of 100 AD beyond which we get what we know as the Masoretic text. And then that departs in terms of sort of its endorsements, its approval, you know, from what the Christians are using, which would have been a different, you know, Bible, the Septuagint, which is in Greek. And whoever translated that used a Hebrew text that was slightly different from the proto-Masoretic text manuscripts and, of course, the Masoretic text when it emerged later. So that's the situation. As an analogy, think of what would happen if we, you know, there was some, you know, official deliberative body that said, hear ye, hear ye, all these English translations, we're sick of this. We want to come up with one version of the Bible in English. Now, whatever version they came up with, you know, if you compared it against the ones that existed prior to that declaration, it's going to align percentage-wise more with one than the others, okay? And you could, you could call that the, the one that it was closest to, the proto-official English, you know, that, that kind of thing. So that's, that's the set of circumstances we're dealing with, moving from textual plurality in the Hebrew world to one official text that the Jewish community is going to, ter- to going to take. They're going to create it and take it. Again, it's, it's largely identical to stuff that had gone before, but, but this, this one now at this point has official approval. And then they're literally going to hand it over to people that they call the Masoretes. These are families that are going to be tasked within the community with the official duty of copying this text from here on out forever. That's where Masorete comes from. Okay, they're going to be the ones who copy and hand it down you know, from generation to generation. But earlier than that, again, you had a Hebrew Bible that was pretty close to what this one turned out to be. Now, you know, all of that you know, leads up to how I would, would, would approach just the general question. I mean, why, you know, what, what's the motivation you know, for doing this? Why do they do this? Well, there were several motivations. I think probably the, the first two of these that I'll mention are, are really what's, what's steering the bus here. They wanted to produce a text for the mainstream Jewish community, and they wanted a text that they could endorse as the one to be used within that community from here on forever. In other words, they wanted a text that would bear the official stamp of approval of the, of the Jewish community. So the thinking is, if we do that, then the people that are in our community, the leadership, the rabbis, gradually they're going to you know, copy this official text now because we've handed it to the Masoretes, which are the official you know, class, the official families that are going to bear this task. And as they produce copies, the synagogues will adopt this one official text. And that will sort of, by default, lead to the dropping off or the passing away or, or forgetting all of these other texts that had existed to that point within the Jewish community. So that, that's really what, what's, what's floating the boat here or steering the bus. Now, the peripheral <laughs> after effect of that is that 
the Bible of the Christians, which they're reading Greek, okay, and, and their leaders are, are saying things like, well, our Greek translation comes from the Hebrew text. And, and it's a Hebrew text that was slightly different than yours, Mr. Jewish person. And, and this text is better, okay? You know, this was the better text. Well, again, to a scholar living in the 20th and 21st century, that, that, that's, that may or may not be true. But to someone living in this, in this era when this transition happens, the rabbis would say, look, if any Christians pull that on you, telling you that the, that the Hebrew text that they had Okay, it was was superior, and that you ought to be, you know, you know, listening to what the Septuagint has, and when it reflects a different text, you tell them, look, our scholars, our scribes, had to look at all that stuff and decided that this is the best text, and that's why they created the Masoretic text. So, you know, we're just not listening to you anymore. This is the official Hebrew text. In fact, it's still in Hebrew. You guys are reading Greek. We're sticking with the Hebrew text approved by the experts within our community. So that doesn't have to be like like a bunch of rabbis huddled together and say, oh, we better come up with a text so that, you know, that, that we can, you know, poo-poo on the Septuagint, you know, or, in the, you know, have, you know, have a club, you know, to beat those Christians down. That, that, that's, that's a little more sinister kind of a, kind of a silly way, I guess, you know, to look at it. What's really going on is they know what the effect of standardization is going to be in their community. And that's what's really motivating them. Eventually, our people will get used to this Bible that has our official approval and they will trust our scholars in our community to have done the best job they could. And that's just going to end the question. So that, by again, by default, cuts off Christian arguments that are based on a different text. Just, just by default, that's just going to happen. Now, I think, you know, with some who were involved in this, yeah, there, there was a little bit of intentionality here, certainly. There is the two powers thing, you know, look, lurking in the background, you know, where Christians, you know, could refer to the Septuagint, where it was different and where it made, you know, a, a theological point. And they could rightly say, hey, this was based on a Hebrew text. It's just you, you guys just sort of got rid of that. I mean, they, they can say all that. All that's true. All that's legit. But they're, the, the, the people who are creating the Masoretic text, they don't, they don't care about having that debate. What they care about is knowing that the people in their community are going to trust them and adopt this particular text. And eventually, all those other ones are going to fade. They're going to go away. Now, you know, one more note here before we, we move on to the next question. You have to realize that even though there's this, there's this benchmark creation of the Masoretic text, not every rabbi in the Jewish community liked the idea. And they continued to use the version of the Hebrew Bible that they'd been using in their synagogue for years. They just, they just kept doing it. They didn't really care. You know, they might care theologically about, you know, debating with Christians, of course. But, you know, they, they, there's, there's a lot of evidence that it took a long time. It took decades, maybe even centuries, for this specific textual creation to sort of diminish and, and wipe out just, just through the ravages of time all of the other ones that were in use. And I've mentioned this guy before. There was a, a German you know, scholar, rabbinic scholar, Aptowitzer, collected variants within the Masoretic text tradition. You know, during you know, the years of you know, 100 AD and beyond, into the Middle Ages and all that. He collected all that stuff. He has a seven-volume work, again, showing that, well, it, it's not like every synagogue had an identical text, even, even after the, the, the Masoretic decision. That just didn't happen. You know, it just it, it took a long time for for the Jewish psyche to sort of zero in on this text and and sort of end that discussion. Greg has a question. We know Dr. Heiser is affiliated with Lagos. Interestingly, the community note for Psalm eighty two one is in direct opposition to Dr. Heiser's Divine Council worldview. I'd be interested in hearing Mike's rebuttal. Yeah, well, re rebuttal isn't the right word for this. I don't have any control over who posts what in a community note. I think the problem here is not understanding what community notes are. Community notes can be posted by anyone who has Logos from anywhere in the world within any faith life group. They aren't vetted. I mean, no one looks at them to, to say this one's in or out. 
That's why they're called community notes. So it's not like I can just say, hey, take this community note down or fix this community note. It's just somebody in the world posted it, and there it is. You know, that, again, and, and if, if you open the software and you have your community notes turned on, you will see that. And again, it depends in part you know, what, of, of what faith life group or groups you belong to and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's a cloud thing. So there's, there's no systematic vetting or approval process or removal for any of this stuff. Uh, my view of Psalm 82 is by now known in thousands of locations online, and of course, in my books and articles, including the Faith Life Study Bible, and which I did do the notes for Psalm 82. Listeners can also go to the divinecouncil.com. I mean, there, there's, there's literally thousands of places you could go to online for Mike's view of Psalm 82. Uh, community notes are, are just not something I have any control over or really even care about, <laughs> to be honest with you. It's just, uh, it's, it's like a forum, you know, it's like something in the cloud. All right. Lindsay has a question. His question is, the coming of the Son of Man in Daniel 7 is a debated text when it comes to eschatology. Some see the passage as fulfilled in Jesus' ascension, his coming to heaven from earth, while others see it as his second coming, his coming to earth from heaven. If it's fulfilled in his ascension, then it implies that the persecuting horn also occurred in the first century. However, I noticed that Daniel seven thirteen through 14 begins with, quote, I saw in the night visions, end quote, which is similar to the beginning of his vision of the animals, Daniel 7, 2. It makes me wonder if this marks off the vision of the Son of Man as independent from the vision of the four animals. And if this means its fulfillment is detached from the sequence of beasts and thus the horn. Oh, this could go a lot of different directions. Um, well, it, it wouldn't be the ascension because I think it's pretty clear that, you know, the son of man, you know, his kingdom is going to be an earthly kingdom. If you keep reading through, you know, the rest of Daniel seven there, Daniel seven is a council meeting. Again, I think pretty clearly to judge the beasts in the earlier part of the chapter, which are these earthly empires. So I, I don't know that anyone that I've ever run across uh, would say that one part of the chapter doesn't have anything to do with the other part of the chapter. You know, they, they, they're, they're viewed as, as having a direct relationship. Um, and again, the the ascension idea just wouldn't make a whole lot of sense in that life, in that light. But to the to the paradigm of of I think really the eschatological question. I think the answer is is again the uh, again the already but not yet sort of thing going on. Let, let, let me let me try to unpack that. So Daniel seven is of course a judgment scene in regard to the four beasts. Okay, that's pretty obvious as we start the chapter. The fourth beast is, by all accounts, or nearly nearly all, maybe I should say, maybe somebody out there in the world sees it differently. I I. I don't know who, but I'm just leaving the that door open. But overwhelmingly, the fourth beast is thought of as the Roman Empire. And you can compare Daniel 7, 14 with Daniel 2's fourth kingdom. Again, these Daniel 7 and Daniel 2 have a symbiotic relationship with each other. And if that's the case, then that would be the time when the Messiah came the first time. Jesus came during the Roman Empire. That's your already aspect. So, so Jesus' first coming has something to do with Daniel 7. So the question is, is that all it has to do with? <laughs> you know? And again, I don't think we can put all, all our eggs in that basket. Now, those raised in a, let's just say, a dispensational environment, I think they overlook the very obvious fact that the fourth kingdom in Daniel 2, which they'll say is the Roman Empire, corresponds to the fourth kingdom in Daniel 7. And that's when the Son of Man, Jesus, comes. I mean, so, so you have the kingdom sort of get a foothold, you know, take hold. It, the, the kingdom comes during the first coming. But again, the question is, is that all the kingdom is? And again, if you're, if you're really kind of you know, in the dispensational tunnel vision, you never, for some reason, you never quite see that, probably because kingdom is always talked about as the millennium, you know, later on. You know, so I think that that's sort of a, a thing that needs to be grasped and needs to be seen. Now, Again, all that is not to say that the kingdom has been consummated in the first coming. It hasn't come in its fullness. 
We know that because after Jesus leaves, they're still talking about his return and the kingdom. So that's your not yet half. So already, but not yet. I mean, again, this is a paradigm that just operates a lot of places in Scripture with a lot of doctrines. The New Testament Again, it's just as clear about that, you know, the, the, the future aspect as it is to, you know, statements where the kingdom is already present in some way. And we talked a little bit about that in Colossians, specifically with Colossians 1.13. So the, the, if you take Daniel 7.14, you know, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Okay, you can see that that hasn't arrived yet. All people don't worship him. All nations don't. All language, you know, there, there's, there's something that, that's still not here. That's still not a reality. But since it has taken root, nothing is going to cut it off. Nothing's going to stop it from becoming what God intends it to be. Nothing is going to stop the progression of the kingdom of God from reaching its final fulfillment. So, again, it's just, it's just a, a better way, again, to read this kind of language, this already but not yet you know, sort of thing. Now, again, and I, I guess to, just to summarize it, let, let, me, let me just re- try to do it again here. And I will you know, I'll summarize it this way. Maybe this will help me be a little clearer little shorter. So I would say you can best honor the language of Daniel 7 as saying the kingdom rule described has begun. It was inaugurated. So yes, the Son of Man has something to do with you know the, the current set of circumstances and the first coming. Okay. It was put on an inexorable path to full consummation already, but not yet. But there's no need to divorce the vision from the kingdoms. Okay. If it, if it takes hold in the Roman era, the fourth kingdom, good. There's no reason to divorce the kingdom, you know, the kingdom talk in the in the Daniel seven vision from the four kingdoms. The kingdom was inaugurated during the reign of the fourth beast, which died off. The Roman Empire went away. The everlasting kingdom, though, continued, and it will continue until its final consummation. Jacob B has our next question. Attempting to find something on the Book of Enoch, I found one of the many crazy pits that internet theology has. But they were saying that music itself, and in particular, musical instruments, were a device given to man by Satan and the watchers to deceive us and keep us from listening to God's word. Is this just internet theology gone wrong, or does <laughs> this have some basis in the text? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna fall I'm gonna fall on the side that this is bogus internet teaching. Okay. Let me let me just read first Enoch eight. Okay, this is the list of what the watchers get blamed for. Okay, First Enoch 8, beginning in verse 1. And Azazel taught the people the art of making swords and knives and shields and breastplates. And he showed to their chosen ones bracelets, decorations, shadowing of the eye with antimony, ornamentation, the beautifying of the eyelids, all kinds of, of precious stones and all coloring tinctures and alchemy. And there were many wicked ones. And they committed adultery and erred, and all their conduct became corrupt. Amasras taught incantation and the cutting of roots, and Armoros the resolving of incantations, and Barakiel astrology, and Kokarer El the knowledge of the signs, and Tom El taught the seeing of the stars, and Azdarel taught the course of the moon as, as well as the deception of man. And the people cried, and their voice reached unto heaven. Now, that's from Charlesworth's Old Testament pseudepigrapher, so it's a pretty recent translation. It incorporates Ethiopic material as well. I don't see any musical instruments there, probably because there weren't any there. And that's good, since the Old Testament Israelites, who lived well after the Genesis 6 era, used instruments in worship of the temple. So yeah, this is bogus internet teaching. You know, you'd also have to wonder why loyal angels are playing trumpets in scenes in the book of Revelation. I mean, you, you get these positive portrayals of music as the point, even in the worship of God himself. Well, if, if musical instruments were something like that the Watchers you know, had something to do with, that would be really incongruous. And it's not. I, I, you know, again, th- this is not something coming from you know, Enoch and the Watcher story. Now, Maybe, this is just taking a stab in the dark, maybe 
um, whatever source the questioner kind of saw or heard about this, they, they may have been thinking about something. I'm trying to be generous here, but they may have been thinking, thinking about something else other than the book of Enoch. There is something in Ethiopic literature called the Matzkafa Mestira Shamai Vameder, the book of the mysteries of heaven and earth. Now, if you read that Ethiopian source, that does in that adds musical instruments to the list of angelic revelations. And so maybe the internet theology source had that in mind, and either they're not telling their audience or they don't know, they're just parroting something along that the questioner saw and, and it prompted the question. But if you're going to go with, with Enoch and the, and the Watcher tradition, you know, from Second Temple, you know, material, okay, the, the, the instruments aren't there. They're, they're not in the passage. So you're saying the Watchers weren't playing harps? <laughs> <laughs> but we do know they're listening to heavy metal, right? I mean, yeah, they're, they're you playing go. the records that, backwards. Right. And right. That's what they're doing. Yeah. There you go. You heard it here. All right. Christina is studying Ezekiel with the Naked Bible podcast. All right. She had a question about Ezekiel 5 9 that states, quote, And because of all your abominations, I will do with you what I have, I have never yet done, and the like of which I will never do again. End quote. I am questioning the part which says, and will never do again. It seems that God did do this very thing. Famine, sword, fire upon the city, exile, etc. Again through the Romans, and will do much of the same during the day of the Lord. He says that it is because of your detestable idols. Is that why the never again language, because Judah did not return to idols? But that seems weak since God seems to be referring to his acts and not theirs. I would say this is a good instance to point out that you shouldn't isolate the phrase, we'll never do again, from what surrounds it. Let me just read the passage. We'll just jump into it this way. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I, even I, am against you, and I will execute judgments in your midst in the sight of the nations. And because of all your abominations, key line there, because of all your abominations, I will do with you whatever or what I have never yet done and the like of which I will never do again. Therefore, fathers shall eat their sons in your midst, and sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments on you, and any of you who, who survive, I will scatter to all the winds. Okay, it very clearly links the abominations of the people with the judgment that comes. So I think you know, the, the questioner kind of you know, clearly sees that. It seems that they do you know, see clearly that God sends judgment and people are reduced to cannibalism in these horrible circumstances. And of course, you know, later in the book of Ezekiel, what actually happens to the city and the temple and all that. Well, that's what happens when God's people sell themselves to idolatry. That's the end. That's the end of, of that trajectory. The circumstances are a judgment for idolatry. And in fact, Jeremiah 19.9, you know, says the same thing. I'll, I'll just read that. I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and their daughters, and everyone shall eat the flesh of his neighbor in the siege and in the distress with which their enemies and those who seek their life afflict them. I mean, this was, this was something that happened in siege warfare if, if a siege went long enough. Siege warfare is you surround a city, you cut the city off from its water supply and its food supply. They have fields outside the city, you burn them. Okay, they're not eating. <laughs> okay, we're going to sit out here until you surrender. You could do it now, or you could do it six months from now. You know, it's a vacation for us, or a staycation, you know, for the army. We're just going to sit here with your city surrounded, and we're not going anywhere. Nobody's getting in, nobody's getting out, and you're not eating. So that's just how siege warfare was done. Now, what later on, you know, what, what the questioner is alluding to with Rome, when Rome did what it did, that wasn't a judgment because of idolatry. The Jews weren't idolat idolatrous. It, it wasn't the same situation like it was with Babylon. So it actually isn't a repetition of the Judah Babylon judgment. You know, Rome also didn't exile the population. Okay, that they they did different things. You know, with with their captives or their their victims. Or, you know, the defeated people and whatnot. So I, I really don't think that we can look at the passage and then look at Rome and say, well. 
you know, God did the same thing. No, he actually didn't because the, we, we don't have – what happens with Rome is not a punishment for idolatry. So I think we need to keep those two thoughts together because they are in the text together. So how do we view the Roman persecution, destruction of the temple, you know, when they did it? I mean, obviously, you know, to, to somebody living during that time, they're going to see analogies with Babylon because, namely, because the temple was destroyed. Those, you know, the, the, the two temples, those are the, the ones who destroy them, Babylon and then Rome. But the circumstances are quite different. You know, it, frankly, what happens with Rome is in concert with the succession of empires that Daniel prophesied about that would oppose God's people. And, and, and frankly, the fourth kingdom, you know, Rome in this case, was, was worse than all the rest of them. But there's no suggestion that they're in Daniel 7 or Daniel 2, that all the kingdoms were instruments of God because of Israelite or Jewish idolatry. Rather, they were just what they were. They were kingdoms filled with people who were not God's people. They were unredeemed, un, un, unbelievers, however you want to characterize them. They were kingdoms bent on conquest especially Greece and Rome, and they were the tools of their own gods, working their own designs, their own plans for their own purposes, and God's people get in the way. Uh, it was during the Roman time that right under Rome's nose, you could think of it this way, right under Rome's nose, when they're doing all this terrible stuff to the temple and, and, and the Jewish people, that the true king had been born, whose kingdom would and did outlast Rome and overturn it and defeat it. And ultimately, it's still on that trajectory, you know, toward toward the consummation, the kingdom of God, the, the kingdom made without hands, the stone made without hands. It was born out of this this matrix, you know, this 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 awful era. That's when it's born. Now there are those, I think, tragically, because there's there's nothing I think terribly specific in Scripture that it ought to be framed this way. But there would be some who would say, well. Even though it's not for uh, you know a punishment for idolatry, and so you have this disconnect with Ezekiel, they would say, well, the you know the temple got destroyed, and the, and the Jews got overcome, and, and the Jews have been persecuted ever since because they rejected Jesus, the Messiah. You know, like they're forever cursed now. And Scripture does not use this cursing language of the people of God. Paul's very honest and say there's a period of hardening you know, that, that they're in right now. And again, he links that to the, the gospel going to the Gentile, the fullness of the Gentiles idea, and all that sort of thing. But Paul's attitude toward his own country was, was not, well, they're going to get what they deserve. Good. You know, God's just, you know, God's going to punish them from here on, ever, you know, forever, you know, because of this. No, it, it, he doesn't say anything like that. Paul's concern is that they become spiritual seed of Abraham. The physical seed of Abraham is is transformed by belief in the Messiah, by embracing the Messiah. So he, he, what he wanted was their conversion. He wasn't like sitting on the sidelines, you know, clapping or, you know, saying, you know, shrugging his shoulders and saying, well, that's the way it goes because of, but a lot of people in early, in, in you know, late antiquity, early middle ages, this is the stance they adopted. And it really was kind of the recipe, part of the recipe for anti-Semitism. And we're still dealing with that too. So I think that's a, that's a, a bit of an inversion or a perversion of the set of circumstances you know, that, that extended from what happened you know, during the Roman period. But it's not really a good analogy to uh, Ezekiel because we're not dealing with a punishment for idolatry there. Tim from Missouri wants to know, why did God create plants before they were in the earth? Genesis 2.5. All right, so let's read Genesis 2, 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God did not cause it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. Okay, so there's a number of ways, and I'm not going to you know, quibble about this. There are a number of ways you know, to take this. Here, here's the way I would, would do this. Genesis 1 and 2 are two retellings of the creation story. They aren't meant to be read as a linear combined chronology, because they obviously aren't. You'd have to have a fairly inept writer to, you know, or inept editor, if, if that was your intention. Hey, read read chapters one and two as a linear chronology, and then you then you make statements like this, which Genesis two five, you know, there's no bush the field was yet in the land. Well, what about the land stuff that he created back in Genesis one? There goes the chronology. Yes, that, that that's the case. There goes the chronology, and it ought to inform you 
that Genesis 1 and 2 was not meant to be read as a linear sequence of events, one following the other. You know, Genesis 2 you know, is, is something a little bit different. Genesis 2 repeats certain things in Genesis 1, and it also adds details and tells the story from a different perspective for different reasons. Now, they could be the result of different authors as well, okay? each with his own agenda, like the Synoptic Gospels. I've already made the comment that I think Genesis 1 through 11 is substantially composed or edited during the exile in Babylon, because there are Babylonian po- there's a Babylonian polemic running through those 11 chapters almost on every page. Now, you, you could have had an existing creation story in Genesis 2 that gets married to the material that's created in Genesis 1 through 11 in, during the Babylonian exile you know, by, by an editor. That, that's fine. I, I don't have any problem with that. Um, and they're different agendas. They're both included because they're different perspectives. They have different audiences in mind. You know, that, that's likely what you have. It's kind of like the Synoptic Gospels. Why can't we have this in Genesis when we have it in the, in the Synoptic Gospels? You got Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They not only don't always have the same events in their Gospels, even when they do have the same events, sometimes the order is different. And, and again, the, the reason is, is because each writer had a way of presenting the material intentionally to his specific audience for a specific reason. Why? I, I don't know if, boy, I wish I, I knew if this was online somewhere. I actually saw this pop up on Twitter, but I, a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, I was in Salt Lake. And I did a couple sessions on, um, you know, inspiration, inspiration of the Bible. And, and I can't remember what, how the high word, the topic. But one of the things, what, what I tried to do in, in the series of lectures was, was pick out things that I knew would make the audience uncomfortable. Because the way we're, thought, we're taught to think about inspiration is this paranormal event where God zaps people and their minds go blank and out, out comes scripture like it's automatic writing. You know, we treat the Bible like it's a channeled document. And I'm using new age terminology there deliberately. Like it's the Arantia book that ETs or aliens or, or something, some spirit, you know, took over the mind of the writer and the writer doesn't know what he's doing. He just cranks out material then looks at it later and says, oh, I can't wait to read that. No, that is not the way we got scripture. And it, it, it's demonstrably the case. So we look at things like this and think it's a problem because that's the way we're taught to think about the Bible, that, that the mind of God or the Spirit of God just, just took over a person and produced stuff, implanted it in their heads, downloaded them, you know, like, like the Matrix or something like that. That is not the way the Bible was, was, was produced. It just isn't. And there are hundreds and hundreds of things in the Bible itself that tells you that isn't what happened. And this is one of them. So again— to, to you know, finish the rabbit trail here. My view is that we ought to have a view of inspiration that actually conforms to what we find in the Bible. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, that's just a suggestion. You know, let's talk about inspiration in a way that, that, that actually reflects and honors what we actually find in the document that we say is inspired. That would be a good idea. So just like the Synoptic Gospels, they present their material in a, in a deliberate way for a deliberate reason. It, and during that session in Salt Lake, I, I, I used the Gospel of Matthew as an example. The Gospel of Matthew, the whole, the whole document, all 28 chapters, can be put into a huge chiasm. It's, it's a deliberate literary arrangement. And even within each point of the chiasm, if you don't know what a chiasm is, I guess the best thing I can tell you to do is look it up. But it's, it's you order events in a sequence, and they lead to a, a hinge point, and then from that point on, they double back on themselves. They, they mirror what came before, point by point by point by point. Even within each point of the, of the grander chiasm, there are chiasms. I mean, it, it, it's just this fantastic literary thing that's well known to New Testament scholars. Well, Luke isn't like that. Mark's not like that. You know, Matthew does it that way. Again, because you know he has his own reasons for presenting the material that way, so that one thought mirrors the other thought, one thought goes with another thought, and he, he just assumes you know his readers are going to pick up on that sort of stuff. This is what you have in, in Genesis. It's what you have in, in Chronicles and Samuel and Kings. There are the same you know records of the same thing, but they're presented in different ways for different you know reasons, different purposes. So that's again Genesis one and two. Could very well be two, you know, separate accounts, different authors, same author. I don't really care. I'm, I'm not a JEDPer, 
as I've said many times on, on the podcast, I, I'm, I'm used to, I, I am what used to be called a supplementarian. That there's a mosaic core that was added to it and it, it accrued to it to, to reach the final form of the Pentateuch. And so it doesn't bother me in the least, you know, to have something done in Babylon that incorporates earlier material, you know, from a different hand. You know, so what? I mean, it's it's all there. It's just a, the same account from a different perspective. So that that's the way I, I look at stuff like this. This is a literary and theological account. It is not an account of a running chronology between these two chapters. Again, be, because it it, it it can't coherently be read that way. These sorts of things only become problems when we want the text to conform to a context of our own, like modern science or a modern sense of how you should write something. Okay, our context is thousands of years removed from the writer and his original audience. So I would, I would say, let, let's just stick with the Bible as it is. Take, let, the, let the Bible be what it is and go with you know, the, it, the techniques and the agendas of the original you know, author and audience. And, and that's what we have. Maybe we wouldn't do it the same way. Fine doesn't matter this is this is what they did and god was fine with the original product all right tim's next question has the word of the week and that is <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> is genesis 315 wrongfully labeled the proto evangelion oh, okay yeah for for those who you know proto evangelion or proto euangelion you know, depending on how it's spelled this is like it's a word that means sort of the like the the gospel story in seed form so or or this this you know little you know I'm trying to think of a good analogy here but but sort of sort of like a a, a time release capsule <laughs> like is Genesis three fifteen essentially the whole story of the plan of salvation in, in that one verse is, is it like, are all the ingredients sort of in there? And then it's, it's just going to, everything else is going to sprout from this. Uh, I'll read the verse. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this is God cursing the, the Nakash, the serpent. So back to the question is Genesis three fifteen wrongfully labeled the proto evangelion. The short answer is it depends what you're thinking and how you're thinking about the this proto gospel. Okay, it depends what you pack into that. Now, if what you mean by that is the broad idea that there would one day come a man from Eve who would undo the effects of what had happened in Eden, well, that's fine. I mean, you can read Genesis three fifteen as saying that much. Now, that isn't a whole lot. Well, someday there's going to become, you know, one of your descendants, Eve, is going to, you know, undo the effects of what the, the, the serpent, the, the Nakash has caused here, okay? That, that isn't saying a whole lot, but what it is saying is absolutely crucial, you know, to the rest of the story. So if, if that's all you mean by the proto-gospel, the proto-evangelion, okay, sure. You know, go ahead and call it that. Now, I would think that it's mislabeled, though, if somebody is trying to extract all the details of the work of the cross, okay, from that verse. That just goes way too far. But again, if it's broadly stated that there's going to be a man, a descendant from Eve, who's going to undo the effects of the fall that were caused by the serpent's deception, okay, if that's what you're going to say, well, that captures the gist of the messianic accomplishment. At, at least as it relates to the first rebellion, you know, the, the fall. All right, Mike, well, we've got some good questions here from our listeners. So let's jump in with Tim from Missouri. His first question is, is Kathy Burns accurate in her statement that only the late Ethiopic copies of First Enoch 1.9 contain the portion quoted by Jude and not one of the older extant Aramaic and Greek copies? Well, I don't know who Kathy Burns is, and boy, I, I don't want to sound harsher, but if if you're an Enoch scholar, I probably would have come across your name before, so I have to assume she's not. But I do know that her statement is incorrect. Uh, yeah, so she's wrong. This the statement is in Greek. Uh, let me let me just you know read it. It's gonna. You know, this is a. Uh, Really exciting stuff here, but I'm going to I'm going to read the Greek line 
from the Logos edition of the Greek Pseudepigrapha, which I was one of the editors for. First Enoch 1 9, Hati Erkatai Sun Tais Muriasin Autu Kai Tois Hagiois Autu, which is there, you know, he comes, or because he comes, excuse me, because or that he comes with his myriads, you know, his his horde essentially, and his holy ones. So it, it exists in Greek. And if the questioner, Tim or Kathy, Kathy Burns wants to know, that's from the, the Greek is from the Achmen Papyrus of Greek Enoch, also known as Codex Panopolitanus. So it's a real manuscript. Okay, it's Greek. It also survives in part, you know, part of first Enoch one nine survives in Aramaic. And you could, you know, go to well, a couple of sources here. You could consult Nicholsberg's commentary on First Enoch. Again, he's going to have this citation. Uh, Joseph Millick's book on Enoch. You're going to have other text-oriented books and commentaries on Enoch, but specifically the Dead Sea Scroll is 4QEN, so 4Q Enoch, superscript C. So 4Q Enoch C. Column one, line 15, ref, you know, refers to the myriads of his holy ones. So, yeah, she's wrong. So you burn Burns. I don't know if you watch the 70s show, but <laughs> reference no. to the 70s show. No, I've, I've never seen it. So right. that one is just, just went right by me there. All right. All right. Well, Tim's next two questions are about Goliath. So I'm going to combine those two questions, if that's all okay. right with you. Sure. Uh, the first one is, do you believe <clears throat> Goliath? was capable of salvation? And two, do you believe Goliath is the thou enemy of Psalm 9? Well, I'm not sure what Tim means by capable. I don't see any reason Goliath could not have turned from his gods and turned to Yahweh, if that's what he means. Um, I mean, the giants weren't the watchers. You know, they're not like consigned to you know, the abyss and they can't be redeemed and all that sort of stuff. So that we're, we're dealing with two different groups here. So you know, th this is one of these hypothetical questions. You know, what would the world be like if God would have never made it? Somebody else would have made it. You know, it's kind of a pointless, you know, discussion or question. But if if, if the question is, could Goliath have turned from his gods? Well, I suppose so. I mean, we'll never know. But there you go. Do you believe Goliath? What was the other one? Is thou thou enemy of Psalm nine? Um, you get go to Psalm nine. Well, okay. Since we don't get a verse, okay, I, I didn't hear a verse in there. Uh, that would help if I had a verse reference. But as I look at Psalm 9, um, I'm going to guess that it, it, it's a reference to Psalm 9, 6. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities were you rooted out, and the very memory of them has perished. So I'm, I'm guessing the enemy there in ESV is thou enemy that the, the question refers to. If you go scroll back up a little bit, let's just get some context here. Psalm 9, uh, is, is the superscription has a Psalm of David. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Then he starts talking about enemies, his enemies and the nations. God rebukes the nations. He turns his enemies back. So on and so forth. And then we get you know to verse 6, the enemy again, came to an end in everlasting ruins. I don't see any way to restrict the content of Psalm 9 to Goliath. So I'd say, no, I don't, I don't think it refers to Goliath. There's, there's, really, there's really nothing in the text that would make me think that. Do you believe giants are the foes who want to eat up David's flesh in Psalm 27? Oh, so let me just take a quick glance at Psalm 27 here. I'm... Basically, I think I already know, you know, what direction or why, why the, the questioner is asking this. You know, short answer. <laughs> short answer is no. Uh, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that. I'm, I actually am going to open up an article here because there, I know of, of a sort of a point of reference here that we can, again, we can make available to people who subscribe to the newsletter here. I would say no, because I think a literal reading of this is a misreading of the text. You know, I think what the questioner is asking, you know, because you have references in Enoch to the giants, you know, like eating people. And so that later book, you know, First Enoch, 
uh, I don't, I don't want to say is being read back into Psalm 27, but it sort of is being read back into Psalm 27. I, there's nothing in Psalm 27 that would lead me to think that we have literal eating going on here. Let me approach it this way. You know, let's think about the giants in David's day. Okay, as far as scripture makes any comments about any giant person in David's day, there were very few of them. You know, there's no way to sort of exegetically justify limiting the Psalms comments here to a handful of people. Uh, Again, you you could also say that conclusively, the cannibalism tradition from Enoch, again, which is later, is, isn't a biblical one. We don't have any biblical content about the giants you know, eating human flesh and all that sort of thing. So it, like I said earlier, it is being a later tradition is being read back into Psalm 27. And I don't know how you'd limit Psalm 27 to that or even how you would sort of justify reading a later text back into the old one. But let, let's unpack it a little bit. I, I, I said that there were, there were very few giants. Okay, let, let's go back to that point. The passage that I'm basing that on is 2 Samuel 21, uh, 18 through 22. I'll just read that since I have it here. Uh, After this, there was again war with the Philistines at Gob, G-O-B. Then Sibachai the Hushathite struck down Saf, who was one of the descendants of the giants. And there was again war with the Philistines at Gob, and Elhanan, the son of Yaare Regim, the Bethlehemite struck down Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was again war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on one hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in number, and he was also descended from the giants. And when he taunted Israel, Jonathan the son of Shimei, David's brother, struck him down. Then verse 22 says, These four were descended from the giants in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David, by the hand of his servants. Now, if you look at that, you say, well, we're, there are a couple of problems here. I mean, this, this section, this, this passage, actually has a number of text-critical problems in it, and the English translation actually reflects that. First, we don't have David slaying Goliath the Gittite. In verse 19, we have Elhanan, okay, the son of somebody who isn't Jesse. So right up, right, right there, we've got a problem. If you actually count the names, you have Saf, Goliath, and then a man with six fingers in each hand. You only get three. But the verse ends by saying these four were descended from the giants in Gath. If you count the he, he taunted Israel in verse 21 as a separate guy, well, then you got four. So I, I guess you could, could handle that that way. I would say just in general for the textual problems, you know, one or two of them anyway, specifically the one about David. If you Google Bible study magazine, my last name, Heiser and Goliath, you should find the magazine article I did on this for Bible study magazine has nice graphics that illustrate again, what what the text critical problem and the solutions are to this. But at any rate, at most you got four, you got four people, four giants. Again, there's nothing that connects them to Psalm 27. There's nothing that connects Psalm 27 to them or, or to any other giants. And so right away, you have, to, you have to intentionally read one thing into the other without any textual evidence. You also have to read the later book of Enoch with its cannibalistic references back into the Old Testament. And again, without any justification that I can see. Positively stated, and here's this article I'll, I'll refer people to. The idea of eating flesh, again, is likely not literal because you have certain references in the Old Testament. Psalm 14.4, for instance, have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? Is that really a reference to cannibalism or is it it an idiomatic expression? I I, I say it's an idiomatic expression because eating vocabulary, just generally eating vocabulary, is a metaphor in the Old Testament for general military conquest. And a really good source for this is Matthew Goff's article. Goff is G-O-F-F. The title of his article is Monstrous Appetites, colon, you know, scholarly articles, articles always have to have a subtitle. Giants, Cannibalism, and Insatiable Eating in Enochic Literature. That comes from the Journal of Ancient Judaism, Volume 1, Issue 1, 2010, pages 19 through 42. And that is actually accessible 
via Google Scholar. Okay, I've, I've put it in, in the folder for our newsletter subscribers, but you can actually find that on the internet. Uh, if you go to, if you use Google Scholar to do your search, not just Google, but Google Scholar, if you don't know where that is, put Google Scholar into Google and you'll be taken to the link for Google Scholar and put in, put in some of the search terms, golf, appetites, cannibalism, and you're going to find it on academia, A-C-A-D-E-M-I-A dot E-D-U. So you can get the, get this article for free. I'm going to read, well, a good good portion of it, you know, paragraph or two from it, just so that you get the idea. Again, that eating vocabulary, the vocabulary of consumption or eating is a metaphor in the Old Testament, just in general for military conquest. It doesn't require cannibalism at all. So Goff says, there is extensive biblical imagery that depicts military violence as a form of eating. Killing people with swords is commonly referred to in the Bible more than 70 times as slaying, quote, with the edge of the sword, or literally with the mouth of the sword. While this root meaning of the preposition might not necessarily have been alive in the mind of early Jewish authors, they had ample biblical tradition to draw from that construes violence with mouth terminology and metaphors of eating. A double-edged sword is described as having, quote, two mouths. That's Judges 3.16. The image of the mouthed sword appears in Proverbs 5, 4. This is explained by Michael Fox, who just so happened to be my advisor at Wisconsin. And he wrote two commentaries on Proverbs. This is explained by Michael Fox, who writes, quote, The blade of the sword is thought of as a mouth that eats its victims. The Hebrew Bible also contains metaphors that depict military violence as a form of consumption. A clear example is in Daniel 7. The second beast of this chapter is a ferocious bear with large teeth who is told by God, presumably, quote, arise, devour many bodies. That's Daniel 7, 5. As is well known, this was not intended to be understood literally, but rather as a symbolic depiction of the second kingdom in the book's four kingdom sequence. The bear is usually interpreted as a reference to the Median kingdom, capital M, the Medio-Persian kingdom which is urged to conquer Babylon. Its consumption of humans is a metaphor for the military violence carried out by this kingdom. The violence and power of the fourth beast is also conveyed by eating. Quote, it had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking in pieces and stamping what was left with its feet. Unquote. That's Daniel 7, 7. The beast eats with its powerful iron teeth. Zechariah 9 also contains a good example of violence described as consumption. In this text, God is the divine warrior who marches into battle. He sounds the trumpet and appears against the assembled Gentile nations, verses 13 and 14. While he's on the battlefield, his people, quote, shall devour and tread down the slingers. They shall drink their blood like wine and be full like a bowl drenched with the corners of the altar, unquote. Now, let me just stop there for a second. What he's saying here is, hey, the Medes and the Persians, when they conquered Babylon, they didn't eat the people, literally. In Zechariah 9, again, which is the, you know, this, this, it's the sound of the trumpet, folks. This is either a rapture or a second coming, depending on your eschatology. I'm not going to go down that road, you know, that, that rabbit trail. But at the second coming, we'll say, we don't come back with the Lord and eat people. Okay, it's not literal. This is, this is the language of just victory and conquest generally. Okay, back to the quote, just to wrap it up. Goff says, in Daniel and Zechariah, images of eating flesh and drinking blood convey the totality of destruction that is inflicted by an army. And I would say that's the way we need to read Psalm 27, because we have all this scriptural precedent for reading Psalm 27 that way. There's no evidence that we should be thinking of giants here or literal eating or anything like that. Now, just to wrap this question up, I just want to add, you know, we use these same kinds of expressions. If you look up in Webster or or a dictionary on the Internet, um, you know, I I like to use the free dictionary uh, on the Internet. It's usually what comes up in an Internet search. We use phrase like, phrases like to eat your young or to eat one's young, which when we use it in our discourse in you know, our own day, it, re- it refers to neglect 
or harsh treatment of the members of a group or your children. You know, it, it, it refers to something unfavorable, you know, to eat your young is, is again, to just treat somebody just terribly that you should be treating well, especially again, if they're your own family and, and you, you know, metaphorically devour them, you destroy them. You know, we use idioms like to eat alive. Okay, that one team just ate that other team alive. It just means that they just wiped them off the field. They just destroyed them. They, the victory was just so overwhelming. And so I think, again, that's what we have here. And we have plenty of precedent for it in the Old Testament for a metaphorical you know, understanding of eating vocabulary as just general military conquest. I often use military conquest after I eat a dinner to describe my uh, <laughs> eating habits, but – all right, and it, and it, it, it may truly be a conquest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike. Tim's last question here is, do you believe Peter's apparent disapproval of cosmetics is rooted in Enochian material? All right. Well, I have to assume that the verse here is 1 Peter 3, verse 3. Let me just read that. Peter says, do not let your adorning be external the braiding of hair and putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. You know, the verse actually doesn't refer to or mention cosmetics. I, I know it often gets used this way, but it actually doesn't mention cosmetics. Uh, it's the braiding of the hair, certain items of jewelry, clothing. You know, think, think about what the verse actually, you know, actually says. I mean, let, let's just... Let, let, let's just keep reading. I'll, I'll go back and read verse three again. Do not let your, your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. So again, does it really demand that women stop braiding their hair? Is there a command in there to stop braiding your hair or to stop wearing clothing? <laughs> is, Peter, is Peter commanding women to stop wearing clothing or jewelry? No, it, it warns against those things superseding inner beauty. Okay, look at verse 4. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Now, the point is that we shouldn't read verse 3 without reading verse 4. And the other issue, again, besides, you know, or I should say that the, the real issue in, in these two verses, verses three and four, other than, you know, sort of just being a shallow person, shallow woman here, was the idea that, you know, we need to cultivate what's inside versus cultivating what is outside, things that people see. You could say, well, Mike, people see cosmetics too. Well, it's true. They do. It's just, it's not in the verse. You know, I don't. I don't write the New Testament. I just read it. You know, it, it's it's not in the verse, and I don't see a command to stop braiding hair, stop wearing clothing, and stop wearing jewelry. What I do see is Peter's concern that these things should not be the basis of your identity, and your and your you know just not only your identity, but of course you know who you really are, which I guess is another way of saying your identity. But rather, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. Now, when it comes to Enochian stuff, you know, we, we know just because of what else, what, what's actually in the Enoch passage that Enoch condemns, we know that all, the, the list that you get in Enoch is really angling for something that transcends the lists that he actually gives us. For instance, in, in Enoch, the real issue with the jewelry and the cosmetics, you know, Enoch does mention cosmetics, even though the passage in Peter doesn't include that. What's really his, his concern is, you know, seduction. It's immorality. You say, well, how do you know that, Mike? Well, look, look at what else is in the passage. Back to 1 Enoch 8.1. We read this in an earlier episode. Asael taught men to make swords of iron and weapons and shields and breastplates and every instrument of war. Let's just stop right there. In case you hadn't noticed, the Israelites use weapons in their battles. In the conquest under Joshua, they're using swords and shields, okay? They, they wouldn't be doing that with God's blessing if the whole idea of, of, of you know, how the Watchers corrupted humanity was only taken in this sort of rigidly literal way. I mean, if, if, if it was, you know, hey— 
you know, this is what the watchers taught people. So we are never making a sword. We are never making a shield. We are never making a breastplate because if we do that, then we're going along with, with, with what the watchers, you know, wanted in human self-destruction. Okay. The, the larger point is violence. It's warfare. It's shedding of blood unjustly and wantonly. It's killing. It's murder. Because these are the instruments of violence and bloodshed. They're, they're perfectly you know, welcome to create these things and use them in a just manner, in, in a way that God would want them used, in you know, self-defense or, or you know, in this case, you know, the biblical case, taking the land and you know, the whole thing about targeting the Anakim and all, all that. Okay, there's, there's, a, there's a good use and there's an illegitimate bad use. But, but to just look at the items like a grocery list – then if, if you're doing that, the only way to obey them is to eliminate them entirely. No, they have context. There's something that, that, that's being aimed at here. So when First Enoch 8 continues, Asael showed them metals of the earth and how they should work gold to fashion it suitably and concerning silver to fashion it for bracelets and ornaments for women. And he showed them concerning antimony and eye paint and all manner of precious stones and dyes. Again, what's really what he's really going after here, and this is the way that the Second Temple Jewish community interpreted it, you know, really across the board, is that these things lend themselves to potentially, and you know, in the in the lives of many people, being seduced, you know, by by the woman who uses these things. You know, th- this is why you know certain women, you know, of a bad character would do this again to seduce a man. It, it doesn't mean that you can't find ever a legitimate use for this. But here's where Peter comes in. Well, even if you can, this should not be your identity. Your identity should be in these other things that God values, the things that God really cares about. You know, to be honest with you, the only way to really kind of understand the, the mentality here, the approach to this whole watcher you know, teaching idea, is to be familiar with the fact that there, for all of these things, there was a good alternative. There was a, there was a, a good legitimate knowledge of these things as well. And to understand that, all of that is traced to Second Temple traditions about Enoch. Enoch is viewed and cast in, in the wider Enochian literature as the rightful dispenser of divine knowledge over against what the Watchers taught people in the same spheres of knowledge. The easiest example is, is probably the knowledge of the heavens, okay? For Second Temple Jews, Enoch was the astrologer slash astronomer. They didn't really make a distinction between those two terms like we do in the modern era. Broadly speaking, it's the idea that God or illegitimate gods can communicate through the heavens. You know that, that you you would it's it's a it's a form of divination, all right? Where you look at the heavens and then you interpret them. Okay, that's that's astrology. Well, there was a, there was a, a legitimate thing about that that Jews viewed as Enochian. Enoch was the one who went to heaven, was taken to heaven by God. He didn't see death. And if, if you read the Enochian literature, Enoch is like the, the astrologer astronomer par excellence. This is where the Qumran Essenes, again, this, this is why they derive their calendar from you know, Enochian material, because their study of the heavens revealed the mind of God in its perfect order and precision, and they assigned all glory to the single God of the Bible, the God of Enoch. Whereas what the Watcher traditions are doing is, no, all of these celestial objects are in fact you know, divine beings, and you need to follow them, not their creator. You need to, you know, it, it's idolatry. There are two sides to the, to the astronomy, astral theology coin. One is evil and idolatrous. The other one is not. And it's the same thing with all these other technologies. There are two sides to them. You know, for, if, I could go down the, the, the astronomy path a, a lot because I'm still working on this astronomy astral prophecy book. But Abraham in Second Temple tradition was viewed as a master astrologer astronomer. Why? Because he, the, the, again, the teaching was that he inherited his knowledge from Enoch. You know, he, he knows who created the heavens and he knows, you know, what they're trying to communicate. You know, the, 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 the Essenes and other Jewish sects would have viewed, you know, a, a, you know, Abraham as someone able to parse what, what was happening in the heavens correctly. And you, you get this as in heaven, so on earth it, it, and how the stars are worshiping, you know, God up there. That's how we need to worship down here. And God's sort of, you know, 
giving us hints about what he's up to and, 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 and how God is propelling time and human history. All of this derives from astronomy. And in the Jewish second temple tradition, Abraham was a master of this. Now, the Bible never says that. But th this is the idea. Again, there was a good source of heavenly knowledge, of forbidden knowledge, of special knowledge. There's a good source, and that's Enoch. And there's a wicked source. Those are the watchers. So if, if you don't have any frame of reference for both sides of the coin, then when you go back and you read something like First Enoch 8, it's like, well, we should just be not – we should just be throwing all this stuff out. Well, there's a reason why Israelites and Jews didn't, because they did have both sides of the coin in their head. There's a reason to have weapons. Okay? They're, they're, it's okay if our women, you know, braid their hair and, and wear jewelry. But, but wanton violence and sexual seduction are bad. That's the bad side of, those, you know, of the, the, the coin, you know, for those things. So each one of these things, you know, medicinal herbs – what, Israelites you know, for, forbade the use of, of, of using plants for healing? No, there are passages in the Old Testament where they certainly do that. But if they're producing altered states, you know, if, they're, if they're the pharmacopoeia kind of variety, which Paul talks about, that's bad. Okay, it's good and it's bad. They're two sides of the same coin. And we often lose this because we don't get deep enough into the content. Again, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory. Just read the first four verses of Psalm 19. There's like 10 verbs of communication there. This is why Paul quotes Psalm 19.4 in Romans 10.18 in response to well, you know, the, this whole notion that everyone should have known that, that the, the, you know, Jesus had come, that the, the, there was the birth of the divine king. And his proof text for that is Psalm 19.4. You know, the, they, they have their heads in this material, but there are two sides of the coin – and so we need to be careful to, to, to kind of, again, become familiar with that. This is why I say, you know, usually in my talk about should Enoch be in the canon? No. You know, we, who cares what kind of status it has? You should read material that biblical writers read because if you read that material and you understand it, you, know, you, you, you get a certain feel for it, then you're going to be able to be a better reader, a more intelligent reader of your Bible. And it, it's it, – it's kind of that simple, but yet, you know, that requires work. So it's not an easy task. It's a simple task, but not an easy one. So consequently, I would say it's not coherent to say that First Enoch 8 or First Peter forbids all jewelry or cosmetics or colored clothing or dyes, the use of dyeing. You know, we should all wear white, you know. It, no, it doesn't forbid these things. And we'd all be in violation, you know, as would the builders of the tabernacle. They could, they died their fabrics, you know, didn't, didn't they know about the watchers? They sinned. They're following the watcher. No, that's ridiculous. Okay. Just like the Israelite army isn't following the watchers when they're creating swords and shields. Okay. We would all be in violation as would most of everybody else in the old Testament that God, you know, blesses and honors and says nice things about. It's not an all or nothing proposition. There are two sides to this, two sides of the coin. So I think that we need to keep in mind when we're looking at passages like, First Peter 3, and, and, and a few other ones, too. Our next two questions come from Dina, and she would like to better understand Romans 13. In light of what she has learned about the divine council and their role in being appointed over the world, does that mean they have an effect on our governing authorities? Well, I, I would say, I'll answer it this way, just by well, let's start with the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. That might be unfamiliar to some. If it is unfamiliar to a listener, go up to the podcast landing page and up at the top where it says, are you new here? Watch these videos. Those are the videos you need to watch. And one of them is about the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. So the Deuteronomy 32 worldview where the nations were allotted to other gods and gods to the nations as a punishment at Babel. That's what's behind Daniel 10. Prince of Persia, Prince of Greece, all that sort of stuff. You know, they're supernatural beings. And so, generally speaking, Scripture does teach that there are supernatural influences behind geopolitical entities. On another level, there are also people who aren't believers. In other words, people who aren't indwelt by the Holy Spirit and who are going to be, you know, more subject to potentially the influences of supernatural powers of darkness, they're, they're running the nations too. So you've got two problems. You've got a, you've got a, a supernatural problem and you've got a human problem. Uh, I think it's 
I think it's an over-reading of the situation to presume that supernatural forces are behind every political move or geopolitical situation. Because again, you've got two problems. You've got a supernatural intelligence, you know, again, that, that scripture describes as being behind, you know, empire and countries and all that kind of stuff, governments. But you also have humans. You got plenty of humans, you know, in, in the picture too, who are fallen and corrupt and so on and so forth. So we we should not assume that everything we see a government do or say has some sort of demon behind it or you know supernatural supernatural character behind it. That that's an over reading of not only the situation but also the text. You know, scripture is pretty clear that all of us are quite capable of seeking self gratification, power, autonomy, etc., because of our flesh. And that doesn't stop when we hold political office. Okay, it's just it's the most normal thing in the world. You know, Deuteronomy 32, in other words, doesn't take the human factor off the table. They both have to be on the table. So, yeah, supernatural intelligences do have an effect on governments, powers that be, but we have no way of seeing how that works at any given point or in any given circumstances. We, I think we're, we're just better off remembering that we've got a supernatural problem here and also a very human problem. Her second question is, I realize it is out of context, but we have many instances in the Old Testament of disobedience to authority such as Moses and Pharaoh, the Israelite midwives, Daniel, and others. I have heard this passage preached as a blanket endorsement for allowing the government to do as it pleases and that it is all part of the plan, so just suck it up and look the other way. Yeah, the, to me, the key word in the question here is allowing the government to do as it pleases. Um, if you live in it, all governments are not the same. You know, all governments are not created equal, okay? If you live in a government that allows you the mechanism to protest your own government's actions, then you have the government's permission to do so. You're not violating Romans 13 by living out the rights that you have at your government's own creation or permission. So that would be incongruent to say Romans 13 says, don't ever pipe up about the evil that the government is doing. That, that's absurd. Now, a lot of people don't live you know, in, in that situation. They live under a dictatorship or some sort of oligarchy or you know, whatever, banana republic you know, kind of situation. You, I think morally – and I'll get into a little bit, you know, hopefully what, what we get into here a little bit in a few minutes here will explain why I say this. But you're, you're not being asked by God to not expose sin. You're not being asked by God or, or commanded by God to not expose evil. You're supposed to do that. And, and there, there will be contexts where doing that puts you at great personal risk. And some of the examples that the, the questioner alluded to, you know, fit that bill. I think in, in some respects, the, the questioner sort of answered you know, her own question that, you know, the examples that were listed here, you know, the, the midwives and Daniel and, and, and so on and so forth, you know, those examples tell us that there are exceptions to obedience to authority that God honors. The common denominator in those situations would be that the people who are trying to obey God are forced to sin otherwise. You know, and, and in that situation, when, you, when, the, when your government, when the powers that are over you are trying to compel you to do evil, okay, then you ought to disobey because God is the higher authority. And the higher authority does say things to Christians in the New Testament like expose the works of darkness. Okay, resist that which is evil. You know, it, it just depends on our, on our earthly circumstances as to how much potential you know, harm that puts us in when we do those things. So if you are being compelled, and again, the vocabulary here is important. If you're being compelled by your government, by the powers that be, to do evil, then you need to obey the higher authority, which would be God. Now, you got to be willing to take the consequences in, in certain you know, situations. And guess what? The New Testament tells you that's what's going to happen. You know, there, there's all sorts of discussion in the New Testament about suffering for, for righteousness' sake, like Jesus did. Okay, this would be one of those, again, at least potentially. 
Now, disobeying when you're being compelled to sin is different than disobeying a law when you're not being compelled to sin. For example, the government might do evil with your tax money, okay? And trust me, our government does, okay? The government may do evil with your tax money. At the same time, it does not force you to personally participate in that evil. So the government, you know, can be funding evil. And and that's one thing. It's quite another for the government to turn around and say, well, we just took your taxes to do this evil thing. And now we are going to force you to participate in that evil thing. You know, we, we have scriptural precedent for this sort of situation. The Roman Empire, okay, the Roman Empire, these were not like, this wasn't a Christian government, okay? The Roman Empire to whom Jesus endorsed paying taxes, when he said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. And, and, and New Testament writers, you know, Peter and Paul say the same thing, pay your taxes, okay? The Roman Empire to whom Jesus endorsed paying taxes certainly did a lot of ungodly things with that money. But nevertheless, Jesus said, you're supposed to pay your taxes. Your modern example would be our government here in the U.S. uses tax money to subsidize Planned Parenthood. Okay, that, that's evil. But based on the scriptural analogy, yes, we are supposed to pay our taxes, but we, we are not scripturally justified, therefore, to disobey the government by refusing to pay the taxes. Otherwise, what Jesus you know, said in the context of the Roman Empire wouldn't make any sense. Jesus said, pay your taxes. You know, you, the, the Christians, the, the, you know, the, the Jews, whoever, who were paying taxes to Rome, Jesus doesn't turn around and say, well, if you pay that tax, then you're like a participant. No, he doesn't say that. That's the kind of thing preachers say. Okay, just, just to, to guilt people out or to you know, push some agenda or whatever. That is not what Jesus said. There's a difference between what an evil person does with a thing you give him and what you do. And the, and the flip side of that is, is the compulsion issue. If the government would turn around and say, yeah, thanks for the money, now we are going to force you to perform an abortion. That's something different. That's something different. That's being compelled to enact, to do the, the actual evil. And by scriptural example, yes, that should be resisted. And again, you, you, you're willing to, to take the consequences. So you would be justified in disobeying a law that, that compelled you to perform the abortion or, you know, whatever, what the government is, is taking money, you know, to promote some evil cause. So there, there, there are different, different things here. And compulsion is an important element of this. But at the very least, again, look at these examples with Jesus and the examples that the questioner, you know, brought up, uh, it's very clearly incoherent to use Romans 13 and say that you should not expose evil and you should not resist evil. That's just incoherent. You know, the, the, what, what you're, you do what your government allows you to do. If you're being compelled to sin, then you resist that and you may suffer. You may suffer for doing what's right. Our next two questions are from Philip, and his first question is, in the Acts podcast, Dr. Heiser said that idols were thought of as a house or dwelling place for those particular gods they were fashioned after. In Zechariah 11, 17, it says, Woe to the idol shepherd that leaveth the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye, his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. What is the verse trying to say in regard to idol shepherd? With my new understanding of what an idol is, it almost sounds like the idol shepherd will be indwelt by one of the divine council. Yeah, I'm not sure what translation is behind the translation that the the, the questioner Philip is using. But to say the least, it could be better. Uh, it, maybe it's King James in this case, and it's just not helping at all. The word translated idol here, is allele, which in both other Semitic languages and elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible means something like defective or worthless or vain, you know, something like that. Job 13.4, for instance. As for you, you whitewash with lies, worthless physicians are you all. The word worthless there is allele. It doesn't mean, Job isn't saying that his physicians were idols, blocks of stone and wood, or that they were 
fallen supernatural entities. No, it's his doctors. They're not helping him. They're worthless. They're useless. So we, we shouldn't overread this passage as though the speaker has a shepherd over him who's an idol. Or again, Zechariah is, you know, talking about, you know, the people of God, and that's not, that's, that's Yahweh's turf, okay? That's not, that's not territory given, you know, allotted to another you know, supernatural being. So that context, you know, should, should sort of tell you that we don't really have an idol, like a, a figurine here, or, or the entity residing in it in view. Rather, Eliel is best considered, best translated something like worthless or vain or useless, like it is elsewhere. Jeremiah 14.14 14 would be another example. The Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. So again, it's just this idea of vanity, uselessness, worthlessness. It doesn't have to refer to a figurine or some entity. And I, I would say consequently, I don't see anything going on in Zechariah 11:17 that has anything to do with the lesser gods uh, or other other unfallen members of the divine council. All right, the last question from Philip is the study on Leviticus and how the land could become polluted got me thinking about the divine council. I have often wondered what the fallen angels plan is in the last days. A typical explanation is that is that they just want to kill or convert as many Christians as they can, but that really doesn't fit in their time being short and acting in haste, nor does it do anything to save themselves. I think, if anything, they would want to protect their kingdom that is now under siege. Their actions should primarily be about saving themselves, not destroying us humans. Are there any indications from the Bible of things that bolster their reign in defense against our siege? Are there any indications in the Bible of a method or a stalling to temporarily retain the legal rights to their allotted land? Right. Well, they don't, they don't have any legal rights to retain because uh, a few episodes ago in Colossians, we talked about the passages that associate the resurrection with the nullification of the status of the old sons of God over the nations. They're Yes, that status was originally given by the Most High, and the Most High has now nullified it, withdrawn it, and delegitimized it because of the work of Christ and the resurrection and the ascension. So they don't have any, any rights to retain here. However, I, I agree with, with the, the trajectory uh, toward the end of that question, the idea of, a, of stalling. I think that's on target. So I don't, I don't, personally, I don't think that the agenda of the, you know, the gods of the nations, we'll just use that, that terminology, principalities and powers, okay? I don't think the agenda is killing off believers because that's nowadays that's like sending them to heaven. Well, thanks a lot. I don't think the agenda is killing off believers as much as it is as it is forestalling the fullness of the Gentiles, uh, because it's it's the fullness of the Gentiles which I'll use the word delay, which delays the day of the Lord and the return of Jesus. The day of the Lord, the final you know day of the Lord. And the return of Jesus are those two things are married in Scripture in, in biblical eschatology. Day of the Lord again in, in in you know maybe we should do devote a whole episode to the Day of the Lord uh, because this this seems to keep coming up a lot. But that is the time viewed by the prophets when the righteous are vindicated, the wicked are punished, the nations are it, it's it's a reset button. The nations are brought back into the family, into relationship with the true God. You know, there there is no more rebellion. You know, it, it's it's a reset button, and it's both judgment and reward. And and the you know it, it's 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 married in the Old Testament to to the concept of Messiah as as the you know par excellence the Son of David and all that. And in the wake of the New Testament events, New Testament theology, it's therefore married to the second coming of Christ. Those things, day of the Lord and the second coming, therefore, both of those things are in holding pattern, Scripture says, because God is looking for the fullness of the Gentiles to be brought in, the Gentiles being brought into the family of God. And Paul says in Romans 9 through 11 in a couple places, he connects that idea with the yeah, you know, this is a Mike word. This isn't a Pauline word. With with Jews sort of coming to their senses and reconsidering the Messiah, he 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 
you know, the, when you know, the Jew, the Jewish nation, okay, the those who are sons of you know Abraham, you know, sons of the patriarchs by by flesh, physically, there is a partial hardening, you know, on them. Paul uses the word hardening there, so that the Gentiles can be brought into the family. Okay, this is the fulfillment of, of the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis twelve three, that all through through the seed of Abraham, who is Christ, Paul says in Galatians, all of the nations will be blessed. And they're, they're being brought back in. When that happens, whenever God decides, okay, we have enough of them now, then presumably Israel, okay, physical Israel, I would, I would assume, has some sort of awakening or some sort of other you know, revival or whatever to again come to their senses and embrace the Messiah. Now, we, we know from Romans 9, but that's not going to be everybody. Okay, it's not going to be all the Jews. Uh, Roman Romans nine is very clear about that. But those two things: this fullness of the Gentiles, the you know the revival, you know of, of the ethnic you know people of, of Abraham. Those two things are precursors to the day of the Lord and the second coming. Now, it would be in the best interest. <laughs> okay. If you were, if you were again one of the principalities and powers, the thing that you don't want to see happen is the salvation of the nations. Okay, is is the salvation of people all over the world? Okay, this fullness of the Gentiles idea. That's what you want to forestall. That's what you want to stop. That's what you want to slow down. Again, you you, you know you're not you're not bigger than God. You know that, that a punishment has been decreed upon you, Psalm 82. This is why the Psalm 82 ends with, rise up, O God, take back the nations, okay? You know that as long as you can put that off, you're going to retain your position, even though it's delegitimized, even though you don't have any legal claim here anymore to these nations, because God is now seeking them to come back into the family. You want to forestall this as long as possible. It, it, it's, it's life extension, okay? So I, I don't know if, if it was on a Q&A podcast or what context it was. I, somebody asked a question, I think, one time about um, do, the, do the principalities and powers think they can win? And my answer was it depends how you define victory, <laughs> okay? Do they think they're, they're bigger than God and can defeat God? No, they're not idiots, okay? But if victory is keeping the ball rolling, you know, the whole guerrilla warfare thing, always have an army in the field, never go away. You know, that, okay, if, if that's the way you define victory, well, then, yeah, we can see something of a plan emerge, you know, from, from certain things you know, said in Scripture. And, and my argument would be that it's, this, this is linked. All of this is linked to the fullness of the Gentiles idea. You know, the reference to the devil, you know, some people will say, well, the devil knows that his time is short. Well, yeah. If you actually go look up where that's said, it's Revelation twelve twelve. And again, this I, this I talk about in Unseen Realms. Since I read, let me just read Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. This is the war in heaven thing that erupts after the birth of the Messiah, and so on and so forth. So this war has been going on. Okay, and he said, the devil knows his time is short. Well, he knows it's definite. Since I read Luke 10, 17, Okay, the, the whole thing, uh, Luke 10, it's not, not, not just verse 17, but other verses in Luke 10 about Satan being, you know, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. To me, that is the end of, his, of the legitimacy of his accusing believers before God in his counsel. That's over with, because now the Messiah has come, and, and God is going to have his way. Jesus is going to go to the cross. He is going to die for the, the, you know, the redemption of humanity, and so on and so forth. So he's a prosecutor without a case. Anyone who is a member of Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of God, the, you know, the devil has no claim over them anymore. What's the claim of the devil? It's death. It's permanent estrangement from God. That's over with, because the Messiah is going to die, and he's going to rise again. And all those who are united to him will rise with him. Okay, he has no case anymore. He has nothing to say. So be, get out of here. Be gone. You know, go, go you know, bring your accusations somewhere else. You know, it, it, you know, he doesn't have an audience anymore. God isn't listening. So since I, I, I look at Luke chapter 10 there, Revelation 12, 12 is sort of signifying the same sort of thing. The short time means the clock has been ticking since Jesus launched the kingdom of God during his incarnation. So it's been 2,000 years since now. 
are we any closer to the fullness of the Gentiles, you know, being you know brought into the kingdom now than we were then? I mean, I can't answer those questions because I'm not God. My point is that the end of the present circumstances comes, you know, whenever God decides, okay, that that's what I had in mind, you know, the fullness of the Gentiles has been brought in. Now my people Israel, you know, have a chance to believe in me again, you know, all this, or, or they, something happens where they're going to turn to the Messiah again, however that works. And we're not, we're not really given a full description of that in the New Testament. But all of that, again, that comes in connection with precursor to the day of the Lord, which is an event or series of events that is the reset button. You know, all those, all those things are connected in in the New Testament, and that it, it's the end of the salvation plan. From there, you know, we get the new heaven, the new earth. We get the final judgment, both of unbelievers and also the beast and, you know, you know the false prophet, all the bad guys, you know, the, the, the watchers in the abyss, you know, all this kind of stuff. They're, all that's done away with. But again, those ideas are, are interconnected, and we have this precursor thing called the fullness of the Gentiles that's still in operation. So if I wanted to stall the program, if I wanted to extend my influence, my, my life, really, that's what I would do. You keep people from entering the kingdom. You don't need to you know, kill them off. I mean, you, you keep people from entering the kingdom, you know, because that's, that's the greater concern here. So I do think that the questioner's instincts in that regard are, you know, are on target. I think that's the trajectory that you would want to follow in answering that question. First one's going to be from Philip, and he was reading Eusebius. It came across this quote from Book 5, Chapter 2, quote, Thus then, at length, the terrestrial demons and the world rulers that haunt the air and the spiritual host of wickedness, and the leader of them all in malice, were regarded among all men as the greatest of gods. The memory also of those long dead came to be thought worthy of greater worship, end quote. It lists mm-hmm. three types of beings that were worshipped as gods, Nephilim, spirits, watchers, and spiritual host of wickedness. What are these spiritual hosts of wickedness? Were they human kings? I think they may also be mentioned in 1 Timothy 4.1. If these are human kings, might Isaiah 14.9 be viewed as the Raphaim specifically, rather than the dead? Well, it's hard to know sort of what direction to take here. Um you know, I, I, I look at this a quote like this and similar sources for the same time period. But on one hand, it does show a little bit that this notion of, you know, connecting the powers of darkness to the concept of gods, you know, ha- has not been entirely beaten down uh, in, in early church thinking. In other words, it, it has survived. The, the Old Testament worldview, you know, it still, you know, leaks into it. Um, and part of the, the reason why you, know, you get this survival, and I would also say, and the confusion uh, um, that is sort of arising from the question, not necessarily the question itself, but just that arises from it, uh, has to do with the Septuagint. So I, I don't think any of these that are mentioned here are human kings, um, because you'll see all of this kind of terminology, you know, world rulers. This is that's going to be a term that goes back into Paul's vocabulary of cosmic geography, which you know is consistent with the Old Testament worldview that you know these are that, you know, some of these are, are the gods, other these uh, others of these are you know disembodied spirits, you know, of the giant clans and all that stuff. All of them would have been referred to in in Old Testament thinking as Elohim. You know, again, Elohim is just a, a word you would use, an umbrella term you would use for a spiritual being. The, the, the confusion results, and well, actually the connection and the confusion results from what happens when we transition out of a Semitic, you know, an Israelite, an otherwise Semitic worldview, into the Hellenistic period, you know, when Greek takes over. Because the Greek vocabulary is a bit different. Now, for those of you who either were at or saw the last, you know, the first, you know, Naked Bible Conference, my, my presentation there had to do with the Septuagint, in part, the vo- this vocabulary of divine beings. And you'll also find this in the, in the angels book, and you'll also, when the, the demons book comes out, you'll see more of it there. But in a nutshell, you know, I, I don't see specifically Nephilim spirits here in Eusebius's quote. They could be there if you're taking terrestrial demons 
as the demons of the Gospels. That might be a, con- a connection, but at, at the end of the day, we're not sure. We're not certain what Eusebius is exactly thinking because his quotation illustrates, again, the problem of terminology. And that is the Greek word daimon, or its related daimonion, becomes the generic word for supernatural being of any type. Just like Elohim is in the Hebrew Bible, you would use Elohim if you're describing, you know, a, a resident of the spiritual world, whether it's a, you know, a, a deity figure like Baal or the disembodied human dead, for Samuel twenty-eight thirteen. You know, one of the the sons of God put over the nations that you know becomes a there's a rebellious relationship there that develops, a la Psalm eighty-two. I mean, all of these would have been Elohim. And Elohim as a term itself does not differentiate. Those things have to be differentiated uh, in hierarchy or, you know, in some other way by virtue of other things that are said about them. You don't get the differentiation arise from a term like Elohim. And the exact same thing is true in in the Hellenistic world with daimon and daimonion. Those terms become generic. You could call anything in the spiritual world a daimon, good or evil divine or, or disembodied human dead. I mean, it, they're all daimon, okay? So you don't get the differentiation arising from the term. So it's not clear when we're reading a, a writer, you know, that has this term, you know, lurking around in the background, church fathers, for instance. It, it's hard to know how precise they're being or how imprecise they're being. It, it may not be possible to really figure that out. Now, the, the major source for this, if people want um this information, and I can put this in the protected folder, is uh, J.E. Rexine, that's R-E-X-I-N-E. And this may be available just generally on the internet. I'm not sure anymore. It's been a while since I've, I've read this article. But the article is entitled Daimon in Classical Greek Literature. And it's from the Greek Orthodox Theological Review, volume 30, number 3, 1985. Uh, three, pages 335 to 361. So it's a lengthy article. And I mean, this essentially deals with this issue, how daimon is a very elastic term. It's an umbrella term. It it can be a neutral term. It can be something precise or just sort of imprecise, just general. It's it's hard to know, you know, what writers, a given writer is is thinking just by virtue of their use of this term. So I'm going to read a little bit uh, about this from my Angels book. Again, this, this question sort of prompts, if I'm going to bring this up, I might as well share an excerpt here. I wrote this, ontological language, for example, spirits, is frequently employed and qualified with adjectives like evil spirits, there's your adjective evil plus spirits, to describe demons, a term that is itself ontological. Demon, you know, our word in English, demon, is actually a transliteration of the Greek daimon or the related daimonion which in classical Greek literature describes any supernatural being without regard to its disposition. It could be good or evil. A daimon can be a god or a goddess, a lesser supernatural being, or even disembodied, the disembodied spirit of a human. Consequently, daimon is semantically akin to Hebrew Elohim. Gospel writers use daimon in combination with descriptive phrases like evil or unclean spirits. And so daimon, daimonion in the New Testament, nearly always points to a disembodied entity hostile to God. I have a footnote here in Angels. There's one exception to this. The one exception is Acts 17, 18, where Gentiles, Greeks, listening to Paul opine, quote, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, foreign daimonion, unquote. Now, the New Testament is silent itself on the origin of demons, and so we and we don't really necessarily know, um, you know, what the Greeks exactly were thinking here, but they're not thinking that Paul's preaching about demons. He's thinking about, or he's preaching about some foreign deity. And so there you would have daimon or daimonion, you know, used in a neutral or positive sense, not necessarily a negative sense. So again, that, that's the only exception to the, the fact that when you get the New Testament, you can have daimon or daimonion, and it's typically used with an adjective, evil or unclean, or something like that. And so in the New Testament, daimon or daimonion becomes the word of choice for any entity hostile to God. And so if you're using the Septuagint as a New Testament writer, 
you're going to see daimon and daimonion used in the Septuagint translation for you know the, the range of things that Elohim in Hebrew would have covered. You can use the you, you'll see the term used of you know the gods of the nations. You'll see the term used of you know the the inhabitants of Sheol, the disembodied human dead. So again, it's really hard on the sort of on the other side when we get into the Hellenistic period and beyond when, when people are using this kind of terminology. It's hard to know if they're trying to be precise or not, or if they care, or if they're even aware of it. Um, and then that's certainly possible that they're they're just not aware of the nuancing that a Semitic worldview, you know, the 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 Hebrew Bible would have would have given, you know, would, that that would be contained in its pages. I'm going to quote a little bit here from the uh, from the as yet published, yet to be published Demons book. Uh, I have a little section: that the Septuagint use of Greek daimonion in Hebrew Bible translation. So I wrote here, the most significant observation with respect to Septuagint translation decisions is the use of daimonion. The lemma occurs 17 times, nine of which are found in the apocryphal or deuterocanonical books of Tobit and Baruch. The related daimon uh, is used once. Septuagint use of this lemma is an important factor in understanding how the demons of the Gospels were conflated, they get, they get mixed with the gods, Elim or Elohim, or B'nai Elim, B'nai Elohim, uh, allotted to the nations at Babel, Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9. So for Hellenistic writers, they are using the same term for you know, all of these things. And so therefore, the nuancing that you get in the Hebrew Bible is lost eventually. Back to my excerpt here. Later chapters uh, will explain why Old Testament and later Jewish theology would distinguish between these two groups of divine beings. So again, there, there is a distinction both in the Old Testament and later you know, Jewish thinking. But when you get to the Hellenistic literature, the Hellenistic period, when Greek becomes dominant, that starts to fade. It starts to become blurry. Let's see. Septuagint translators use daimonion in certain passages that speak of the sons of God allotted to the nations. And later New Testament authors use the same term for spirit entities that harm people. Consequently, two groups of sinister divine beings that have completely different origins in Old Testament and Second Temple Jewish thought get lumped together. While this conflation is unfortunate, the vocabulary, daimonion, is still quite serviceable. Greek daimon and daimonion broadly refer to a divine being, good or evil. It can also be used of divine beings at different places in the divine hierarchy of supernatural, of supernatural pecking order. And here I quote from the Rexine article I just referenced. So just this will give you a flavor of what's going on here. The word daimon reflects the dynamism of the Greek vocabulary operating throughout the various periods of Greek literature. There is, of course, no single English equivalent. It is a word of tremendous range and significance. It is a word more generalized and less personalized than theos, that would be God you know, in, in Greek. An investigation of classical Greek literature would lead to the discovery of the following meanings for daimon. Number one, the use of the word to signify a god or goddess or individual gods and goddesses. This would be a rare use of the term. Number two, more frequently, we would find it used of the divine power. The Latin equivalent would be numen. This would signify a superhuman force, impersonal in itself, but regularly belonging to a person, a god of some kind. Number three, the power controlling the destiny of individuals and then one's fortune or lot it could be a daimon. Number four, it could be further specialized as the good or evil genius of a person or family, like the spirit of a family. Number five, a more special use would reveal the daimones as titular deities, the souls of the men of the golden age of Hesiod. That would be your sort of sons of God, giants, turf. Number six, general, spiritual, or semi-divine creatures who are less than gods, but intermediate between gods and men. Number seven, finally, devil and bad spirit in the Christianized sense. Of course, this last is not classical usage. So that's the end of the Rexine quote. So what we have again is a conflation here. And so if you go back to the question about Eusebius, you know, who's what, what's who, how can I align this with any particular Old Testament passage? Good luck with that. Uh, again, because the terminology that, that's involved here is by nature broad and elastic. So there's really no way to determine exactly what Eusebius was thinking. Mike, can you just keep reading your demons book since it won't be out for a while? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, see, we, we could have opened the podcast with that because 
the reason why the demons book keeps getting pushed back is now public but i'm guessing most of our audience doesn't know it anyway so maybe we should just skip that <laughs> but uh okay. you know all right there's another book coming out that's pushing demons at, into 2020 let's just leave it at that for now all right our next question is from lance how sure are we that the average Jewish person at the time of Jesus and shortly afterwards would be able to make the connections to the Tanakh and Second Temple literature that underlie both Jesus' and the Apostles' teaching? In other words, how educated was the average Jew? Was there a difference between men and women in terms of educational level and exposure to text? Is it reasonable to assume that the average person had this context in their heads? Surely most people didn't go to any type of school with only a few entering rabbinical schools, and most people only mm-hmm. heard occasional readings of parts of the Tanakh without any exegesis thereof. Well, you know, the, just a, a general statement here. Yeah, there would have been a, a distinction between men and women in this regard. You know, women would have had culturally less access to formal education. That's going to change you know, in the Hellenistic and the Roman periods, you know, so they you know, that that circumstance at least would change a little bit. I mean, who knows, you know, how much they're going to be taking advantage of it, you know, speaking of women now, but it's it, it does change. But I, I would say more particularly here, someone didn't have to go to school to have learned the content of the Tanakh. Now, granted, if you were a scribe or a highly literate person, um, someone who maybe knew a scribe or had access to scrolls in some other way or whatever, um, which is usually going to be a wealthier person that doesn't have to spend most of their day out in the fields working and all that stuff. Well, yeah, then you're going to have access to reading material. You're going to be more literate. It also is partly dependent on on your synagogue if you're Jewish. I mean, we assume, again, that all that's going on there is reading. Okay, that, That's not necessarily a, a coherent assumption. I mean, the, 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 the content of the Tanakh and the synagogues, you will get it. There will be discussion. There will be interpretation. There will be, you know, conversation and debate and whatnot. You know, the, the rabbis aren't just going to go home and never talk to their congregants again. You know, people are going to have questions. They're going to ask. The rabbis will get into discussions. You'll have them over for a meal or something like that. I mean, there, it, it's not as cloistered and static as as you might suppose. Uh, the targums are going to be available as well. You know, when you go to the synagogue, you'd, you'd probably hear, you know either both Hebrew and a Targum, and maybe the Targums. Again, it just depends on what the rabbis, the teachers in the place are using. Uh, you know, nothing, is, there's no mass printing of anything. So when the Targums are out there, they'd have to be circulated. Well, who has to be engaged in that process? The answer is your spiritual leadership. And that's probably going to vary, you know, in terms of what you're exposed to. When you have, when you bring the Septuagint into the picture, again, that's going to have, you know, contribute to having a bit wider of, of an exposure to content and how people are talking about the Tanakh and, and its content and you know what's in it. So I would say the situation is, in some respects, kind of similar to today, even though we have this knowledge explosion where you can go you know, to any store or any bookstore in any town and get a Bible, granted. But just having access to the material doesn't mean people are, are taking the opportunity. So I think in, in many respects, we have a lot of people who may have a lot of Bible facts in their head, but they don't know how to connect dots. The ones that do know how to connect dots are going to get there either because they, they their pastor models connecting dots for them. Maybe they listen to this podcast, they they you know read one of my books or something like that. But they, and that that those are things that they do on their own. They have to take the initiative and have the you know have the the motivation to do so. But you and I both know that it's true that the average Christian today is not going to know a lot of this stuff, and it isn't because of literacy. It's really because of motivation. So I, I, why do I bring that up? Well, I, I bring that up because even if you don't have a lot of people either taking advantage of the access they do have or the access for some reason is limited, even though that's true, the connections are still legit. The connections are still the connections. What the New Testament writers are doing with the Old Testament is still what they're doing. That is another way of saying that even if people aren't learning it, doesn't make it untrue. Uh, I, I think we need we need to establish that that fact. You know, there is a a disconnect today, even even if Christians you know are trying to you know do Bible study. There's quite a disconnect today between the way you know we'll, we'll call them the literate people, the academics, the scholars, look at Scripture, and the way that the 
person in the in the pew in the average church does. The fact that there's more people in the in the pew, there's there's exponentially more of them than there are scholars, does not make the less literate, less academic perspective about scripture correct. Doesn't make it correct at all. So I, I don't think we should be connecting. I'm not, I'm not saying that the questioner did this, but I, I think it's worth bringing up. We don't. We should not be connecting majority opinion or majority way of thinking or not thinking with correctness or accuracy. That would be a non sequitur conclusion to draw. Now, let me, let's go back to a little bit back in the Colossians series. You might recall, again, if you've listened to the podcast for a, a good amount of time, we did an episode on Paul's signature at the end of Colossians. And I read some excerpts from a, a book and an article. Uh, you know, see that I what I've written with my own hand here. You recall from that episode that writing was the real sort of litmus test of the highly educated. Not so much reading, but writing. More people could read in Paul's day than could actually compose. And again, if you've ever, you know, taken a, a language like Greek or Hebrew, French, German, whatever, it is easier to read than it is to compose. I mean, it, it's a different level of, of knowledge. Uh, about the the language you're trying to acquire, so we need to keep that in mind. You know, just because you know, we we might you know presume that the literate class was was small, the, the the class that could actually read and and maybe maybe write real simple things, that's going to be wider. It, it's it's still a wider net. So I think that needs to be factored in here too. Now there is a there is a book called Ancient Literacy. If you're into this topic, you know, you might want to avail yourself of it. That I discovered, you know, f- by virtue of an article, I'm going to reference both the book. The book is Ancient Literacy by William V. Harris. It's a Harvard University Press title, 1989. And the article, uh, that an article that I had that uh, referenced this is by Roger McFarlane, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin, subtitle, The Languages of, the New, Te- of New Testament Judea. This is from Brigham Young University Studies, volume 36, 1996. So it's an article about ancient literacy. So McFarlane, the author of the article, quotes Harris, and he says this, the other documents that survive from the period of the Masada siege, and these are very simple letters, you know, names and stuff, do not necessarily require extensive literacy on the part of their users, as most of these texts are brief and restricted to a single name or phrase in, or alphabetic character. General literacy was probably no higher in Palestine or at Masada than in Hellenized the cities of the Roman Empire, some of which may have achieved 20 to 30 percent literacy rates. Now, by our standards, that's a low literacy rate, 20 to 30 percent, but it, it's still a significant number, you know, of the population, uh, even for uh, you know a class that has very uh, very defined socioeconomic levels. Let's put it that way. And again, less formal education. So, given the circumstances, that's a pretty decent rate, you know, of literacy with, within the the overall population. But again, even if you're not literate, even if you're a slave or something like that, and you're in, you're in a church or you're in a synagogue or whatever the circumstances that makes you not be literate, there's no way of knowing how much effort your spiritual leaders, your rabbis, for instance, are really putting forth to get you either to listen to them as they connect dots. Or refer you to maybe you can't read Hebrew, but you could read Aramaic, you know, to refer you to a Targum or a Septuagint or something like that. So a lot of it, a lot of this is dependent on your spiritual leadership. And within a family group, if you do have one person who is a reader, does that other person read to other people? There, there's just there's really no way to quantify that. So you know, it's a difficult question, but I don't. Again, I don't think we're wise at all to connect the two things in, in terms of. Um, well, most people wouldn't have been thinking this, so it can't be right. Again, that, that is a non sequitur conclusion to draw. Our next question is from Becky from Massachusetts. The ESV reading of Deuteronomy 32.17 is, They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. What is the significance of the phrase, new gods that had come recently? especially the recently part? Okay. Well, I will focus on this in, you know, to answer the question, but, but it, it behooves me to say that the ESV is, is messed up as a translation at Deuteronomy 32.17. Uh, 
This is why you will never see me quoted in any public presentation of my content. It's also why I got a published journal article just on this verse in a journal called Bible Translator. <laughs> okay. And I believe that article is in the protected folder as well. But basically, they sacrificed two demons that were no gods, two gods they had never known. That is a self-contradiction within the verse. They can't be no gods and gods at the same time. The ESV messes this up, probably because the translator, you know, maybe was afraid to potential polytheism or something like something silly like that. The phrase no gods there is it's not Elohim. They sacrifice to demons, literally not to Eloah. That's a singular noun. It is always singular. And so in the Hebrew, there is no contradiction. They sacrifice to demons, not God. To gods, they sacrifice that they had never known, to new gods that had come along recently. So ESV messes this up. Other translations get it right. ESV, this is sort of an anomaly within the translation. Anyway, let's move on to the actual question. Um, the significance of the phrase new gods that had come recently. The reference here is to the Israelites' adoption of foreign gods subsequent to their covenantal relationship with Yahweh, which began with the patriarchs you know, a few hundred years prior and which was certified at Sinai. So the comment, if you think about it, is yet another retrospective assessment on the part of the writer of Deuteronomy and is therefore likely not mosaic. Think about it. When did, when did the Israelites start going after other gods besides Yahweh? Well, that was after the era of Moses. It was after the conquest, you know, not too far after the conquest, because we learn from the book of Judges that they start to let the people live in the land, they start to intermarry, you know, all this kind of stuff. So that, that's when the problems begin, and we see the evidence of that in the book of Judges, but that's still post-Mosaic. So this is a retrospective comment that refers to gods that the Israelites, to sound like a prophet here, went a-whoring after, uh, subsequent to the God's covenantal relationship, Yahweh's covenantal relationship with the Israelites through the patriarchs and then during the time of Moses. So any gods the Israelites decided to follow subsequent to Yahweh, the God of their fathers, was a newbie. Um, and that's what it's pointing to. Our next question is from Eric from Pelican Rapids, Minnesota. I've enjoyed reading N.T. Wright, but one thing I can't wrap my head around is his discussions of the sacraments. I came from an American evangelical background, viewing them as ordinances, but I don't see anything in the New Testament that makes them more sacramental. Am I missing something and or is there some Second Temple Hebrew or ancient Near Eastern context that makes the way other faith traditions talk about them coherent? Is Wright slipping into his own faith tradition here and not really sticking to the text? Well, I, I would say, yeah, he is slipping into his own faith tradition, but he would say, you know, that that he's interpreting the text, you know, correctly in in a sacramental fashion. But, you know, to to be honest with you, you know, I, I I'm in I'm in agreement, you know, with you. I don't I don't see anything sacramental about baptism or the Lord's Supper, if, or I should say, depending on what is meant. So a lot of evangelicals who are outside of sacramental contexts will only be hearing the word sacrament and thinking one sort of definitional way uh, about that term. When there, it, There's actually more than one thing that could be meant by a term like sacrament. Um, for example, you know, somebody might use the term sacrament and mean a ritual act, like you know, baptism or the Lord's Supper, that contributes in some way to salvation. In other words, the this ritual I'm doing is a sacrament in the sense that it contributes grace, saving grace to me or to the recipient. Okay, that, that's one way that, that sacramental terminology is used. And if you're outside, again, lit liturgical churches, the tendency is to make everything sound that way, like Roman Catholic or something like that. You know, some, some, some sort of other form of Christianity that, that you've been distanced from. And, and may have had conversations about, and this kind of thing will leak out in the conversation, or, or maybe you read, you know, Catholic theology or whatever theology. So this is one way that sacrament is used, but it's not the only way. Someone else might use the term to speak of a ritual act, or really any spiritual practice 
that assists us in sanctification. In other words, it's not about salvation. It's about sanctification. It's about growth as a Christian. And I'll use an example here from my own life. When, we, when I was in graduate school, and again, I, up until this point, I have been you know, completely out of the uh, you know, out of church contexts um, that had any liturgy, you know, any, anything like this, any, you know, really anything like this. So we, we uh, you know, attended a number of churches you know, once we moved you know, to Madison, and uh, we wound up going to a Christian Reformed church uh, that, that appealed to us for a bunch of different reasons. Um, the, the gospel was clear there, but they used the sacramental language, okay? And, and so I would often ask questions. Now, the, the, the pastor at the church at the time, you know, told me, look, you know, we're not, you know, I don't use the word sacrament and nobody else around here is going to use the word sacrament to say that if you do this thing, then that's going to contribute to your salvation or result in your salvation. He, he you know, I, mean, I just remember a conversation at one point. He said, you know, the Lord's Supper is a sacrament like reading your Bible, or praying is a sacrament. It's a thing that you do that helps in your growth as a Christian. It helps you become more of what you should be just as a believer. It, it, it's something God can use to assist you to become you know, a better believer, think more Christianly, you know, however you want to put it. So it had nothing to do with you know, salvation. So I, I want to use that as an illustration to say that it's kind of hard to know what any what anyone really means by the term sacrament unless you sit down and have a conversation with them and ask them to what do you affirm by the term and what do you deny by the term. And I don't know exactly how Wright is using it. I, I don't think he would be using it in a in a soteriological sense. Uh, but but I don't actually know that. So I, I don't really know exactly what he means. I personally avoid the term because for too many too many people out there. It smacks of earning merit in terms of salvation, even if that's not what's meant. And so I think the term is confusing. I think the term is, is potentially uh, has, has, a, has a great potential to, to misdirect people or, or, or leave them in a misguided position, you know, intellectually, theologically, just in the way they're thinking. So I just avoid it. All right. Nathan has a question. In Unseen Realm... Mike makes the point that the Hebrew of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 doesn't necessitate marriage, wives, but could just be an illicit sexual relationship, women. The Greek in the Septuagint appears to be a literal translation of the Hebrew going into women. But in Matthew 24, 37 through 38, Jesus clarifies this by saying, quote, marrying and giving in marriage, end quote. Where is Matthew getting this from? Enoch? Yeah. I I, I decided to take this question. You know, some some people are already thinking. Well, the answer to this question is on Mike's website, and it is. But I decided to take this one anyway because you know there's going to be a lot of people in the podcast audience that haven't looked at the website or don't search the website. So the the premise of the question is flawed, and that's what's exposing this tension in the question. Matthew 24 has nothing to do with Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Matthew does not use the Septuagint of Genesis 6. He does not use the vocabulary that you'll find in Genesis 6. So it doesn't matter how, you know, literally, I mean, and it's a straightforward translation by the Septuagint translator, but that isn't the question. That doesn't matter. What matters is the question is, does Matthew use the vocabulary of Genesis 6? And he doesn't, which ought to tell us that he's not thinking of Genesis 6. He's also not thinking of Enoch. Um, again, you can go up and get more details on this from, from my homepage, you know, DRMS, just drmsh.com, put in Matthew 24, Genesis 6, and you're going to find this. But I'm going to read a little bit uh, from that, that, uh, that post. So from my homepage, there's another issue that goes along with this assumption. The other significant problem is that saying Matthew 24, 37, 38 is about a repeat of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, then that requires you to ignore parts of what Matthew describes or deliberately not to see the disconnections with Genesis 6, 1 through 4. So not only does Matthew not use the Septuagint of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, Matthew actually, in what he does say, there are things in what he does say that are not in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And you can't just ignore that or not see it. So here's the full list of what Matthew says will be going on when Jesus returns that was going on in the days of Noah. Here's the list. Eating and drinking. Marrying and giving in marriage, 
and not watching or you know, otherwise being unaware. Okay. Only one of those conceivably, but incorrectly could be associated with Genesis six, one through four. And that is the marrying and giving in marriage phrase. The others have no association whatsoever with the supernaturalist aspects of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, or even any of the content of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. So why impose the supernatural character of Genesis 6 onto what Matthew says? It's an arbitrary decision, and one made, I would say, incoherent and unsustainable by the lack of any direct connection to the Septuagint of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. So what I mean by that is, look, if Matthew was really thinking about Genesis 6, 1 through 4, A, he would use the vocabulary of the Septuagint for the marrying and giving a marriage, but he doesn't. These are different terms in Matthew than they are in the Septuagint of Genesis 6. Okay, so that would be the first thing Matthew would do. He would dip into the vocabulary to telegraph to his readers of what, you know, some Old Testament passage that he's thinking of, but, but that isn't there. So he would do that. And the second thing he would do, again, if if, if I'm Matthew, this is what I would do. I would connect my, my vocabulary to what's in Genesis 6, 1 through 4 in Greek, and I would not, in my writing, list things that are not in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. So when Matthew starts adding things, that is, is another thing that tells you he's really not thinking about Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Rather, what he's thinking about is more general. He's thinking about people going about their normal lives. Okay, they're eating and drinking. They're marrying and giving in marriage. Guess what? People do that. They have babies. They have grandkids. You know, they, they, they perpetuate the species, all right? This is the normal course of life. And, and, and when you're absorbed with the normal day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day, you know, subsistence, whatever, you're not watching for it all to end. I mean, this is his point. So for Matthew to really, you know, to really make a good exegetical case that Matthew is thinking about Genesis 6, 1 through 4, you would think he would use the vocabulary that's there, but he doesn't. And he wouldn't muddy the picture by inserting other details. So there, there's really no clear connection between the two passages. It's one that we sort of read into it because of the marrying and giving in marriage language. But again, that is, he's using vocabulary there that is not found in the Septuagint. In Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Neil has our last question. Today in my devotional, I read about Jesus and Barabbas being like the two goats from the Day of Atonement. Jesus was sacrificed for the sins of the people, and Barabbas was let go. The point was that the two goats had to be the same. Barabbas means son of father, and Messiah means son of God or son of father. I notice in my NIV Bible calls Barabbas Jesus Barabbas which makes sense in the context. Pilate asked if he should release Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Messiah. My question is, why is the NIV the only version that calls him Jesus Barabbas and all the others just say Barabbas? All right, this will be like the earlier question. I, I will get to the question, but I need to make a couple comments prior to this. Um, Barabbas really is not, well, how can I say this? The wording of the first part of the question doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. How could the different goats, which had different destinies, quote unquote, have to be the same? I, I don't understand the wording of the question in, in that regard. You know, I, boy, if that's what your devotional says, then I think there's a problem with the devotional. <laughs> uh, Barabbas is not really a good analogy to the goat that is sent away either, because the goat that is sent away either was sent away to its, to its doom. It's sent away to the realm of Satan. I mean, Barabbas really wasn't sent to the realm of Satan. He doesn't carry the sins of the people away. I mean, it, the, 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 the whole first part of the question to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense as it, as it derives from this devotional. But again, having said that, I just I felt like I had to say something there. But let's go to the actual question now. Why, you know, why the NIV you know, has Jesus, Barabbas, and the other ones don't? Well, the inclusion or not, of Jesus with Barabbas is a text-critical issue. What the NIV is doing here is it's adopting a variant, a textual variant, a reading of a manuscript where other translations don't adopt that reading. Now, I, I'm going to, this will get into the weeds a little bit, but I think people will find it interesting. So, in approaching a question like this, I, I always, I, I have a Metzger's textual commentary open here, because that, that's sort of the quickest place to go. 
If you're not familiar with Metzger's textual commentary, if you know a little bit of Greek, if you've had a year of Greek, let's just say, um, one of the Greek New Testaments that used that is used widely in seminary classes is the United Bible Society Greek New Testament, the UBS. But when that was, I think it was the third, I think it was the third edition, when that came out, uh, Bruce Metzger, who was one of the editors of that edition, also produced a commentary on that edition of the Greek New Testament. Because in that edition of the Greek New Testament, when there's a uh, a difference of opinion or, or an important variant reading from a manuscript, the editors adopted a lettering system, A, B, C, D, you know, to, to tell the reader you know, what level of certainty they had when including or excluding something. And so if you go to Matthew 27, 16, in Metzger's textual commentary, the Jesus part, that, that part of a manuscript, Jesus Barabbas, the Jesus part, is given a letter C. And here's what I'm just going to read from Metzger as to what that sort of means to them. He, he gives you the thinking of the committee you know, on this. He says, the reading preserved today in several Greek manuscripts and early versions was known to Origen. So Origen, again, is a third century, you know, second, third century uh, early you know, church father. And he knew, Origen knew of manuscripts that actually included Jesus, Jesus Barabbas. Okay, so it's known to Origen, back to Metzger, who declares in his commentary, Origen wrote a commentary on, on Matthew, quote, in many copies, it is not stated that Barabbas was also called Jesus. And perhaps the omission is right, unquote. Now, Origen discloses in what follows his reason for disapproving of the reading, Jesus Barabbas. He says that it cannot be right, he implies, because, quote, in the whole range of the scriptures, we know that no one who is a sinner is ever called Jesus, unquote. So that's kind of a pastoral homiletical thing on Origen's part. But the important part of the, of the quotation is that Origen knew there were some manuscripts, just you know, a handful, that actually had Jesus Barabbas in them. Uh, he, again, didn't, didn't prefer those. Metzger says, in a 10th century unseal manuscript, uh, and in about 20 minuscule manuscripts, a marginal comment states, and this is actually a comment that a scribe would have put in the margin, quote, in many ancient copies which I have met with, I found Barabbas himself likewise called Jesus. That is the question of Pilate stood there as follows, you know, and then he, he quotes the portion about Jesus Barabbas. For apparently the paternal name of the robber was Barabbas, which is interpreted son of the teacher, unquote. Now this comment, which is usually assigned to the manuscripts either in the manuscripts, either to Anastasius, Bishop of Antioch, who lived perhaps the latter part of the sixth century, or to Chrysostom is in one manuscript attributed to Origen, who may indeed be its ultimate source. That's the end of the Metzger, that part of the quote. I'm going to skip to Metzger's conclusion here. He says, a majority of the committee was of the opinion that the original text of Matthew had the double name in both verses, 16 and 17, and that Yesun, Jesus, Jesus, was deliberately suppressed in most textual witnesses for reverential considerations. In view of the relatively slender external support for Jesus in this reading, however, it was deemed fitting to enclose the word within square brackets. And that's what you actually see if you use the UBS, you know, Greek New Testament here. They'll put Jesus in brackets. And so a translator, like someone working on the NIV, would look at that and say, okay, it's in brackets, which means the committee, you know, probably had a disagreement here. They, they don't really feel... They don't, they don't feel good enough about the authenticity of Jesus to let it stand and just on its own in the text. And so, you know, what should I do? What should I do? You know, should I include this as part of the translation or not? And so the NIV translator decided to do it. He probably looked into the issue and said, well, you know, it's in a number of early manuscripts. And, you know, Metzger says that it, it, it might be original. You know, could be original. I mean, you can build a good case for that. But, you know, scribes later took it out because it just— felt icky to put the word, you know, to give Barabbas the name of Jesus. And so we could see them doing that, you know, to, to quote unquote, protect, you know, the name of Jesus. So the NIV translator would think, yeah, you know, I'll go with that. That sounds reasonable. So I'll put it in. But then you have other translators of English Bibles that would say, look, it, unless I have a high degree of certainty, along with the editors of the Greek New Testament that we're using here for this translation, I'm not putting it in. So that, that's why one has it and the other doesn't. It's, it's literally a text-critical uh, discussion and decision. Now, 
I want to say something about the term Barabbas itself, because again, I think people will be interested in this. And uh, my favorite commentary on Matthew is the one by R.T. France in the NIC series. I just like France's work. But he writes this, Barabbas, uh, which is a com- quote unquote, a common name, according to BDAG, which is the standard Greek lexicon for the New Testament, is an Aramaic patronymic, an Aramaic personal name, probably meaning son of Abba, capital A. Abba is found in rabbinic literature both as a name and as a title, meaning father, or it perhaps means son of a teacher, Rabban. Like, Rabban would be like uh, rabbi, you know, okay? It's a term that it could actually mean teacher. So the, the devotional you know, comment about uh, that it, Barabbas means son of father or son of the father, well, maybe, uh, but it could mean two other things just as legitimately. It could mean son of Abba, some, some guy named Abba. It could also mean son of a teacher. Now, France references um, you know, a, a pretty exhaustive source on this, Raymond Brown, Father Brown, who is a, a Catholic New Testament scholar. He's, he's no longer living, but he devoted his scholarly, scholarly career to the life and times of Jesus. Uh, and he ha- he's produced some massive works on this. The one I'm going to quote from here is his book, The Death of the Messiah, which is a, it's a, it, this is a, overall it's a multi-volume work, but it's, it's just this massive work. It's Yale University Press. And this is going to be from pages 798 through 800, um, where he comments on Barabbas. He says, Barabbas is a patronymic, in other words, a father's name used to make a distinction among men who bear the same personal names. For instance, among the many men named Jesus in first century AD Palestine, Josephus actually mentions about a dozen people named Jesus. The one of most interest to us would be distinguished as Jesus of or from Nazareth. And if there were several men named Jesus at Nazareth, he would be further identified as Jesus bar Yosef, the son of Joseph. Not infrequently, only the patronymic is used in a description. For example, an 8th century BC Bar Rechuv inscription, and the New Testament Bartholomew and Bartimaeus. More usual is the combination of a personal name with the patronymic. So you have Simon, there's the personal name, and here's the patronymic Bar Yonah, Simon, son of Jonah, okay? Or Joseph Barnabas, Acts 4 36. You have Johns and James, quote, sons of Zebedee, Mark 119. So that's he, what Brown is saying. That's the typical pattern. You'll have a personal name and then some, some patronymic qualifier, you know, further identification. So then he asks, what was Barabbas's personal name? Lesser textual witnesses to Matthew read in verse 16 or verse 17 or in both, Jesus Barabbas. Is the name Jesus the original reading in either, math, either of these Matthew verses? Those who answer no, formerly the majority opinion, point to the tendency of later generations to supply names for those left nameless by the New Testament. The scribes did that. Moreover, the neat pattern in verse 17, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called Messiah, could reflect a copyist's dramatic touch to heighten the parallelism of the two figures whom Pilate faced. Those who answer yes, though, point out that over against Mark, names are sometimes added or changed in Matthew. For instance, in uh, Mark 9, 9 verses, uh, Mark 9, 9, you have Matthew uh, 26, 3 and 57 in in Matthew, you have Caiaphas. I mean, they're they're different names interchanged and they could be the patronymic, they could be the personal name. Sometimes we just don't know. So Brown continues, yet if the name Jesus did appear in the original text of Matthew, why would later scribes have omitted it so that it is absent from many important manuscripts? Okay, so he he raises the question. Uh, Let's see here. He quotes an origin. Okay, origin argued defensively, quote, in many copies it is not stated that Barabbas was also called Jesus, unquote. He insisted that it is not proper that the name Jesus be given to an iniquitous person. And since no sinner has ever given the name Jesus elsewhere in scriptures, Origen thought the name might have been added to the Matthean text by heretics. Origen's authority and attitude make it unlikely that Christian scribes of later centuries would have added Jesus to Barabbas' name in Matthew manuscripts that lacked it. 
Indeed, they would have been encouraged to delete it as an impiety where it already appeared. Yet probably most scholars now argue for the originality of the Jesus Barabbas reading in Matthew. And indeed, many go beyond the textual issue to assert that this represents historical tradition lacking in Mark. Now, he, again, he goes on one more paragraph here, a more plausible interpretation of, of the name. Now, he, he's, he's not dealing here with you know, how we got it or is it, or is it authentic or not or, or original or not. Now he's talking about the interpretation, the meaning. A more plausible interpretation relates Barabbas to Bar Abba, son of a person named Abba. Abba appears as a personal name with frequency in the Gemara section of the Talmud, which is circa 200 to 400 AD. Uh, in, then he starts quoting Talmud passages. In one passage, I am looking for Abba. They said to him, There are many Abbas here. He said, I want Abba bar Abba, you know, and so on and so forth. So he, cite, he gives some citations from people named Abba, again, in, in literature of 200 to 400 AD, the Talmudic period anyway. And he writes, as he wraps up here, of course, Aramaic Abba means father, as New Testament authors were aware, because of the usage associated with Jesus. For example, Mark 14, 36. Accordingly, some scholars think Barabbas did not contain a proper name, but meant son of the father. So that, we'll, we'll wrap that up as far as Brown goes. So I, I thought, again, that's a point of curiosity you know, to end our Q&A here, but it's not a given. It's, it's far from a certainty that Barabbas means son of the father. It could just be a, a guy named Abba, or again, son of the teacher. And you'd have to you know, go into, you know, dive into some serious commentaries and probably some journal articles to, you know, to ferret out what difference does it make? I, referring back to France, and I actually made, I can't remember what, um, I have this talk I do on inspiration. And one of, one of the, uh, the talks I gave on We Need a Better View of Inspiration actually gets into this issue where, you know, whether it's authentic or not, whether it was added by a scribe or not, if you have Jesus Barabbas in the text, it does create some really interesting parallelisms. And, and, and it actually becomes part of chiastic structures in Matthew, which Matthew is famous for. The whole book is not only filled with chiasms, it is a chiasm, one huge chiasm. And, and the, you know, the, the, the inclusion of Jesus' name in this passage actually becomes a part of one of those chiasms. So it, it, it's kind of interesting. I, I think it, it's very coherent to argue that um, you know, Matthew did this. I mean, that it is original and it is part of a, a literary presentation to you know, heighten the tension here, as, as France said, between the, these two Jesuses now in front of Pilate, uh, that, it, that Matthew included the name deliberately just to, again, make it that much more dramatic uh, in, in the scene. But anyway, you know, the inclusion or, or exclusion in, a, in an English translation is really, it's basically a text-critical decision. Our first question is um, from the other side of the world, Duncan in Australia. And his question is, given that from a divine council viewpoint, the whole Bible is a description of spiritual warfare and faith is about defining loyalty. Where does the atheism movement fit in within this model? In ancient times, there were very few atheists and the existence of other gods was intuitively obvious and the nations worship these other gods was overt. How do these gods exert power now? Why did the way they exert power change? And where does the loyalty of the atheist lie? Well, I, honestly, I don't see how the atheist approach is coherent or matters in any of this. Uh, the atheist isn't loyal to any deity because he or she doesn't think any of them are real. So I, you know, to me, they're not even on the playing playing board. Um, I think the more interesting part of the question, you know, is the sort of exertion of power here. Uh, now, you know, I've, I've actually gotten this question a lot in other Q and A's, you know, when I'm out speaking and what, uh, you know, how just, you know, just this last part of the question, how do they exert power and all that sort of stuff? So I'm I'm not going I'm going to try not to repeat a lot of that but I I'll try to give an abbreviated version of of my thoughts on this. So the short version is that you know all we have in scripture described to us is, are, are spheres of influence 
and types of influence. And we also have a, you know, if you can sort of recognize the patterning, we have a, a, uh, an evil, a dark mimicking of what the true God actually wants. So what I mean by that is we have, you know, passages like Daniel 10, Psalm 82, where you have supernatural beings, you know, the princes or the gods, you know, this is part of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview uh, over geopolitical nations, you know, states, empires, and whatnot. So that is, is pretty clear. It's very transparent, but we aren't given a playbook. Okay, there's no playbook here, so I'm not going to invent one. Uh, we, we do have, you know, again, common patterns of how the gods, you know, how divine beings who are in, re- in rebellion, who are adversarial to what God wants, what the Most High, Yahweh, wants. And, and you know, you, again, if you can see the patterning, you can see where s- some of this kind of stuff emerges. You know, they want to have their own imagers. They want to mu- move humans to image them rather than the true God. They want their own uh, agenda pushed forward. And their agenda, of course, was to resist you know, the authority of the Most High. So, you know, what, what, how would that work out? Again, how does it work out in Scripture? How does it work out today? Well, you know, there, there's a tendency in, in like temptation narratives where, you know, one of the powers of darkness will want to define good and evil on their own terms, okay, terms other than, than the true God's terms. You know, they, they, there's a tendency to seek autonomy, in other words, to reject the authority of the Most High rather than submission. Okay, that, again, that, this is a pattern. You know, what does this look like? Well, they're, they're going to, if you, if you think about, you know, again, a supernatural being who, who's going to rebel against the Most High, they're pursuing their own divinity, not in the sense that they aren't divine already, because they are, if we're talking about supernatural beings. But for the gods, that means they rebel against the authority of the Most High. For humanity, the urge is the same, but it's facilitated by supernatural intelligence. And, uh, you know, so the, the Nakash, the serpent, you know, goes to Adam and Eve. Hey, do you want to you want to be part of the divine family? Like, really, you want to you want to be as God? Well, here's how. And then you know they'll they'll get through through deception. It's you know redefining what good and evil is, redefining you know what God wants, you know, the, the, you know, prodding, you know, the urge to autonomy, to reject, you know, higher authority, to pursue their own divinity on their own terms, to, to be more than human, to, to basically get them to pursue a thing that God, the Most High, you know, did want Adam and Eve to be part of his family. But now, the, you know, the Nakash is getting them to pursue this, to, to, to be like God like the gods, the other members, you know, Genesis 3.22 is plural, you know, in a different way, in a, in a way that God has not outlined. And so this reflects, again, the desire to be more than human, the desire to throw off authority. Again, these are different, you know, talking different ways because you have supernatural beings and human beings here. Uh, the pursuit of, you know, autonomy. The other one, another one would be the pursuit of utopia. This is seeking to reverse the judgment of Babel you know, on their own terms and on our own terms, or only human terms. It means rejection of God's own device for restoration of Babel, that would be Israel, and her Messiah. So there's this impetus to seek to rebuild, you know, the united, a a union of humanity, you know, a one-world population, you know, on on purely human terms, and then justify it as part of the pursuit of our, our own divinity. You know, we will be like the Most High. We will restore Eden the way we want it to be. We'll create our own imagers, people who follow us lockstep to our agenda, our beliefs, our objects of worship, so on and so forth. Now, it, you know, it's idolatry. Now, all this is, is as old as dirt. Now, our modern world has technologized it. It's, it's technologized all of it through new modern means. You know, we have things like transhumanism. We have this pursuit of artificial intelligence. We have synthetic biology. We want to make life forms that, that never existed before, and they'll be better. We want to recreate Eden. Okay, we want to be more than human. We're not satisfied with our status, the way God has made us. We're not satisfied with the trajectory that God has provided for us to be like him, you know, just to be gods, you know, small g, okay? We're not satisfied with that. We're going to do it on, on our own terms. We're going to be more than we are. We're going to assert our own authority in doing this, and we're going to restore what was lost in the rebellion at Babel. And nothing's changed here. The only thing that's changed are the means to pursue these ends. 
and of course the means to in, in our world the means to to market the vision this vision uh, and that's you know just media technology so the agenda has never changed the means to the agenda i would say has and so and since the bible is an old you know ancient book you know we don't we don't get you know this this sort of techno technologizing talk in it but we do get these consistent patterns again pursuit of utopia uh, creating our own imagers, you know, wanting to be, you know, more than than what God has made us to be, throwing off authority, the the, the hunger for autonomy, to be as gods, all that sort of stuff is how I I would answer that. This is how it works. This is the agenda, the means to all that, the manipulation means to all that by supernatural intelligences is what is different. Okay, our next question is from Heath. He's studying the biblical Unitarian movement and why they reject the Trinity. I read a few articles today where they talk about the angel of the Lord appearances in the Old Testament and how this angel is indeed referred to as Yahweh, but that just means he's Yahweh's agent, not that he possesses the same essence or is ontologically the same as Yahweh. They say this has to be the case because First John says no one has ever seen God at any time as well as that God is spirit. Hence, our senses can't detect him. And as a follow-up to the biblical Unitarian's arguments, I don't understand why they don't apply the same logic to regular angelic manifestations in the Old Testament. Given that because angels are spirits just like Yahweh, we can't detect them with our senses either unless they physically manifest. I found zero resources from this movement saying that we should also understand physical manifestations of angels in scripture to mean that it was only an agent of the angel and not really the angel himself itself. Is this sound thinking on my part? Well, first of all, I have to say that biblical Unitarian is an oxymoron. Uh, there's nothing biblical about Unitarianism. Uh, and I don't, I don't, that, that, that doesn't mean that. You know, it's just like the Aryans. You know, it doesn't mean that they're not believers. I mean, they could be believers. They they could recognize Jesus as the only exclusive means of salvation and embrace that. They could still understand the gospel, but get other points of theology wrong. Um, I mean, there there's that possibility. I'll hold that out for them. So I'm I'm not going to go over, be too pejorative here. But I do think biblical Unitarian is an oxymoron. You know, what about passages where we're not talking about the angel? What about Jeremiah 1? The word of the Lord is identified as Yahweh Elohim. Okay, and he touches Jeremiah. This is anthropomorphic language. What about 1 Samuel 3, where the word of the Lord, same word of the Lord, Jeremiah, stands before Samuel as a man? Okay, Samuel's seeing this. It, it, the, the, the account says it's a vision. It uses words like reveal. And you can't use anthropomorphic language of something that's invisible. How would you know it's standing? If you're not seeing anything, you can't use those descriptive words. Now, this happens over and over again. So it's, it's a false, you know, it's, it's a false dichotomy. First of all, they're setting up. What about all these other passages? And, and even what they say about the angel isn't the case, because some of that word of the Lord stuff will leak into angel passages. Again, you can't isolate these things from one another. This is a matrix of ideas. And in Genesis 48, the angel doesn't say anything. He's not representing God. This is Jacob's assessment of the events of his own life. Genesis 48, 15, and 16, the three stands of prayer. May the God who did this, may the God who did that, may the angel, may he, singular verb form, bless the boys. You go back in Jacob's life, who is the one who did these things? It's Yahweh. But somehow Jacob feels quite free to put the angel in the mix, and then a singular verb is there. So it's not may they bless the boys, it's may he. Well, which one? Is it God or the angel? The answer is yes. The biblical writer makes no effort to distinguish them. So why are the biblical Unitarians making that effort? You know, I think that's a good question. I think it's a fair question. It's not just representation. Genesis 48, there's no representation going on. This is Jacob's assessment of the events of his own life under inspiration in the text of Scripture. So if the Unitarians really want to claim to be biblical, they might want to pay attention to the text. Just saying. Now, I don't really understand why 
you know, part of the question is why they approach things the way they do. Okay. Because I'm not a Unitarian. I, I think it's likely because they feel that, that what they can't understand can't be correct. And I, I, I really think that's the case with a lot of this kind of stuff. The text can't mean what it says or what it suggests many times over, because if it did, I'd be able to know how everything works. That's just not an honest approach, to be blunt. You know, I don't understand quantum physics. I don't even understand the physics and chemistry of how a car works. But that doesn't invalidate the science. You know, I, I, you know by analogy, I think their whole position is, is dramatically underexposed to ancient Near Eastern thinking, for one thing. You know, God of the gods, you know, as more than one person, isn't just a biblical idea. It's older than that. I mean, again, this isn't a, a post-Christian invention, a post-first century invention. It's really, really old. And it's not unique to the Bible. Now, what is unique is the element of the incarnation, but the idea of God as more than one person or a God as more than one person at the same time, simultaneously in, in different places, that is ancient Near Eastern stuff. This is why I recommend Summer's book, Benjamin Summer, The Bodies of God. Again, he's, he's Jewish. He's a Jew who point blank just bluntly says, hey, the idea of eternity, of eternity is perfectly compatible with the Hebrew Bible. Now, I recommend Summer because he goes back into the ancient Near Eastern material. Specifically, he spends a lot of time on, on the Akkadian and Assyrian material. And, and you know, look, he's going to sound like a modalist when you read him because he's a Jew. He's not a Christian. He's not sensitive to how we would, you know, articulate certain things. And, but take take the data for what it is or what they are. You know, the, uh, Summer's book is is really, really worthwhile. Uh, because he ferrets out a lot of this kind of thing. I think the biblical Unitarians are also radically underexposed when it comes to things like how the New Testament authors repurpose Yahweh texts from the Old Testament to talk about Jesus and show that they view Jesus as Yahweh incarnate. They just do that. So I think these quote-unquote biblical Unitarians spend a lot of time proof-texting or you know, focusing on the problems, and they and they and they don't you know what what they think is a problem anyway. But for an ancient person, they give, just give you a blank stare, like what's the problem? All right, again, the, they become the measure of truth to themselves. If I if I can't if I can't see how everything works, then it can't be I can't be really reading what I'm reading. I, I just don't think that's a legitimate method. I, I think it's dishonest. You know, just again to be blunt. The New Testament writers will repurpose Yahweh texts, texts that don't have an angel or some other character, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, the four consonants, and they will, they will make Jesus the character or the speaker of those texts. You don't do that as a Jew if you don't believe that Jesus is Yahweh. Now, I've, you know, we, we interviewed David Capes, you know, last year at SBL. He has, he's done a lot of work in this area, Yahweh text, you know, uh, with Jesus. Uh, he had, you know, we, we had him on the, the podcast at SBL because a lot of his work has been now put into, um, you know, sort of popular reading form. I think it's called the Divine Christ or something like that. But David Capes, C-A-P-E-S, put him into Amazon, put Jesus in there. You're going to find the books, okay? So don't, you know, if you can handle, you know, scholarly discussion, then you can get the expensive one. But again, if you get the, the, the popular one, you're going to get the, the gist of the data, you know. Um, so I think biblical Unitarians, I think this is why it's an oxymoron. They're just dramatically underexposed to this kind of thing. You know, they, they again, just to throw in another two cents, they, they just seem to follow the thinking that Trinitarianism is a post first century invention by some theologians. And that just is not the case. It's an idea put forth in the biblical text. Earlier religions have similar conceptions. I think biblical Unitarianism or any Unitarianism puts deity in a box as well. I have a hard time understanding how a Unitarian can affirm the reality of God. Okay, they, they accept there's God and then deny God the ability to be more than one person. Again, because that's too hard to comprehend. Sorry, but deity in and, in and of itself can't be successfully and completely comprehended. So when you start denying attributes to a deity that are put forth by a source you claim to honor, i.e. the Bible, and you admit that you're not a deity yourself, your approach is inconsistent. Okay, It, it just is. It's just inconsistent. I think in the, in the last part of the question, there was something about whether his strategy is a good one. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit lost, I'm a little bit confused by the wording of the question, because 
you know, Heath is talking about their strategy and then asking me of his thinking is, I, I don't know where one ends and the other begins. So I, I, I can't really comment on the end of that. But again, that's just, that's what I'd say about the Unitarian thing. Samuel in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, has a question about an answer you gave in our episode 70. What happens to the Holy Spirit if someone turns their back on God? Does the Holy Spirit leave? The answer is the Holy Spirit keeps doing what he does. He keeps drawing and working in an effort to keep someone believing. You know, salvation cannot be lost, but it can be rejected. And sadly, it is rejected all the time, you know, a lot. The Spirit's role you know, along with God's providence working with and through other people in somebody's life is to draw people to salvation and prompt people to faith, to believe. All God asks is that we believe the gospel. He won't force us to believe, neither will the Spirit force us to believe. Faith isn't faith if it is coerced. Okay, the, you know, God's offer of salvation can be rejected and often is. You know, you can't say you believe and then turn to belief in no God or to another God. There are no Baal worshipers in heaven, as I've said many times. There are no rejectors of the gospel in heaven either. Okay, you must believe and keep believing, stay in the faith, quote unquote, the obedience of faith and all that sort of stuff. It has nothing to do with works. It has nothing to do with performance. It has nothing to do with merit. It has everything to do with believing that God will do what he said he will do because of what Jesus did on the cross. You know, so, so, you know, that doesn't mean that you never have questions or doubts. You know, we all do. You know, we're weak and human, and God knows it. God doesn't expect perfect belief. There's never a doubt that creeps in, never a question. You know, God doesn't expect perfect belief. He expects believing loyalty. That means you believe even when you do have doubts. You throw yourself on the mercy of God's plan in the gospel. And in the midst of these kinds of struggles, instead of rejecting it or trying something else, okay? God expects believing loyalty. It's all he asks. He will not force faith. That would, that would be non-faith. Faith isn't faith if it is coerced. So what the Spirit does is the Spirit's ministry to us, both to the lost and to people who have embraced the gospel, is to bring about faith. It's to, it's to help people believe. And, and the Spirit never stops doing that. So if you or somebody you know, you know, is, like, is struggling, you know, you know, with the gospel, do I believe it or not? Or I, I don't know where I'm at. The, 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 again, you got to reduce the question to the simplest element. Do you believe the gospel or don't you? Don't worry about, you know, oh, well, there was this time back when I was three or when I was 20 or 50. You know, it doesn't matter. The question is, do you believe right now? Or do you reject the gospel in favor of no God at all or some other gospel, something else? Even, even if you're struggling, even if, you're, if you're, you know, you're, you're uncertain, I have questions, you know, I can't wrap my mind around. You know, why does God do this? You know, okay, all of that's normal. And God knows it. God doesn't expect you to be super normal. He knows what you are and who you are. But what he does expect is belief and believing loyalty. Stay with him. Trust him. Hey, throw yourself on his mercy. That's what God wants. Sean in Belton, Texas, was listening to a Bible study on the book of James, and the priest stated that he thought it was written by James, the brother of Jesus. I know there are a few other possible authors as well, and wanted to know who Dr. Heiser thought wrote it. Yeah, you know, I've never really cared to look at the, this question in depth. I mean, I, you know, I've always heard and read you know, that it was the Lord's brother. You know, honestly, I really don't think the question has any importance, which is probably why I never pursued it. Um, So I, yeah, I've never really cared. (laughs) I don't know how else to say it. You know, what what you need is the author needs to certainly be a Jew and and, and a literate Jew, you know, very conversant with their their theology and Judaism. And, And I think the author also needed to have a strong acquaintance with the teachings of Jesus. And both of those conditions are, are met with the Lord's brother. It could be met by somebody else. But again, uh, you know, I, I don't think that the question ultimately really affects uh, how we would read uh, the book of James or not. Jay in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, 
as our next question. And in Romans chapter two, after showing that everyone will be judged by God and are sinners who need mercy, Paul talks directly to the Jews who are still trusting in their heritage or the law in Romans 2.17 saying, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God. And then in verse 21, he begins challenging their claim of righteousness by asking them, do you still, do you commit adultery? Do you rob temples? Why does he bring up robbing temples? Why did he think that yeah. was going on to help drive home his point? Were there a lot of Jews robbing temples in those days? Some, <laughs> <laughs> those those Jew robbing templers or some commentaries want to make this about sacrilege or disrespect in the temple, but Paul references temples plural, not the one temple in Jerusalem. What is Paul's intention when he raises the issue of robbing temples? Well, you know, I'm going to, you know, have BDAG open here, um, you know, because I, BDAG and Moulton and Milligan, you know, these, these sources, uh, you know, are sort of, you know, go-to resources for this, you know, kind of thing. Uh, the first, first thing to establish is that the word temples isn't in the Greek. The noun temples is not there. So the fact that an English translation has plural temples has nothing to do, you know, with, with the issue. Um, you have a verb here. The Greek lemma, Greek verb, hero suleo, can be translated to commit sacrilege or to rob temples. You know, other scholars, you know, different scholars take it different ways. And and really, the, the, the different ways derive from the usage of the verb in other sources. You know, so Paul could very easily be asking, hey, do you commit sacrilege? You know, which is, you know, quite wide. I mean, that, that opens the door to lots of different things, but basically dishonoring God. To commit sacrilege is to, to dishonor God. And this, you know, I would say is Paul's, you know, real point. I mean, you, you could even put something like, do you reject the Messiah in something that broad? Because that would dishonor God because the Messiah is God's son, you know, Jesus or the whole thing. Now, the, the word itself is pretty obscure. The verb occurs only here in the New Testament. Again, we don't have a verb with a noun, an object noun, temples, plural. The word temple is not even in the verse. So you only get this verb here. The noun form, there is a noun form that exists, and you'll see it in in the Septuagint, for instance, really only in 2 Maccabees 13.6, where in in that text, in 2 Maccabees 13.6, it actually does describe the action of of robbing a temple. And that's probably why the verb gets translated this way by some translators some you know, in English Bibles, the creation of English Bibles, uh, because somebody would, would go back, hey, you know, where is this used in the Septuagint? I mean, that's, that's sort of your first, you know, your, 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 other than how is the word used in context in this source, i.e. the New Testament? Oh, we got one. Well, that doesn't much help. It's the one I'm trying to figure out. Well, the next thing you do is you go look at the Septuagint, and, and there you don't get much help either. You get this one occurrence, and oh, it's it's robbing a temple there. So that's how I'm going to translate it. <laughs> Look, I'm putting a human face on how English translations are corrected. Uh, if you think that translators take every verse and look up every word exhaustively in context and sit there and noodle every reference before they create a translation, you're wrong. Yeah, they don't have that much time. I mean, let's just let's just be bluntly honest about it. Now, B Dag, uh, this is you know Bauer. Aren't Donker and Gingrich that lexicon? You know the standard lexicon for New Testament studies. The BDAG cites Josephus for an instance of a wider meaning, and let me just hover over that and look it up. This is from Wars of the Jews, uh, one you know, Roman numeral one dot six five four. So at this, the king was in much. It was in such an extravagant passion that he overcame his disease for the time. And he went out and spoke to the people, wherein he made a terrible accusation against those men as being guilty of sacrilege. Again, if you look in the context, excuse me, if you look in the context, we don't have temple robbing there. It's just wider than that. It's, it's more general. And so guilty of sacrilege uh, you know, is, is a legitimate translation there. So we, you know, he accuses the men of being guilty of sacrilege and as making greater attempts under pretense of their law, and he thought they deserved to be punished as impious persons. So impiety, sacrilege, dishonoring God, so on and so forth. Now, the other source, I think, is a little bit better. I have Moulton and Milligan open here. And Moulton and Milligan cites a few other instances of a broader meaning. If you have Moulton and Milligan, uh, this is page 301. If you don't have it, I recommend you know getting it. Uh, it, it is used in the, the 
you know, in, in some passages for robbing temples, but they cite a, a passage in Pseudo Heraclitus. That's EP 7, page 64, Bernays translation. Uh, it is per probable, however, that the word w- which is used in that passage, in, in, that, in that place, they say is probably what's going on, you know, in, in the New Testament, Romans, you know, chapter 2, where, you know, we see something like, uh, again, just being impious, you know, doing sacrilege, that sort of thing. Let me just quote a little bit from Moulton Milligan. The wider sense which we have seen, uh, which we have seen the corresponding verb has in Romans 2.22. Again, they've already told you they think it's you know, committing sacrilege. Also attaches to the noun in Acts 19.37, and then they give a cross-reference to 2 Maccabees 4.42. For you have, Acts 19.37 says this, For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. Uh, again, there's no reference to temple robbing specifically in the context of 19, Acts 19, and so it, it's just a wider you know, breadth of doing something that dishonors a deity, that sort of thing, being you know, guilty of, of doing something there. Uh, they quote Lightfoot, again, who, who takes the same view, again, sacrilege, impiety, so on and so forth. So if you have BDAG, Moulton and Milligan especially, uh, you could look up some of the primary sources on uh, the, like the Perseus website, you get English translations for all these. It's all free uh, online. And you'll see, again, the short answer to the question is, Paul doesn't accuse them of robbing temples because A, the word temples isn't in the passage, and B, the verb that's actually used can have a wider meaning of just, again, being impious or you know dishonoring God or something like that. Uh, it, it can just cast a wider net into which you can throw, you know, all sorts of things. All right. Steve has two questions. And the first question is about the end of Genesis 4, 26, where it says, at that time, people began to worship the Lord. And that's from the Net Bible. And his question is, I understand correctly, if I understand correctly, that Dr. Heiser was a primary translator for Genesis in this translation, which, well, were you? Yeah, no, I I wasn't. So the the que- <laughs> we don't have a good beginning. <laughs> uh, no, I I wasn't a participant in any way in the Net Bible translation. I I, I did translate. You know, I even hate to use you know, uh, boy. You know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to have to go into a history of the LEB. I I did the first layer translation for the LEB, which was produced by Lexham Press. Uh, that has since been touched by several hands. So I, I don't know that I can you know claim much even for the LEB uh, Genesis, but I at least did the, the first layer of translation for the LEB, but I didn't do anything for the Net Bible. All right, there you go. So I'm going to move on to the rest of his question. And he's thinking that um, that rendering is what you would agree with, but he's heard some rabbis believe it meant at that time people began to profane the name of the Lord. The trajectory for people from Adam to Noah seems to be a decline into evil, which makes the profane wording seem logically to work better. Is Rabbi's story a myth? Grammatically, can it mean profane? What we have here, I think the the, the easy path here is that you're going to get different translations here, English translations, and they arise because some translations don't realize that there is a homograph issue here. Now, a homograph, Hebrew has homographs just like English. A homograph is a, a word, or more than one word, a couple words, that are spelled exactly the same way, but they're entirely different words. They do not derive from each other. They are entirely different words. So if I use the word board, B-O-R-E-D, that can describe a condition you know, of mental lethargy, I guess, or drilling a hole. Okay, they have no relationship to each other. It's a homograph issue. The the, the human mouth can only make a a finite number of sounds, and so every language has homographs, words that are entirely different, that do not derive from one another, but they are spelled the same way. Okay? Now, that's what we have going on in Genesis 4 here. So 
the easy path here is to go to Google and put in drmsh.com. That's my homepage, drmsh.com. And put in something like allegorical interpretation of the names in Genesis 5. Uh, I blogged about this years ago. Uh, it has it, this particular post had something to do with uh, uh, it was it was a Chuck Missler thing about he, him having some allegorical interpretation of the names in Genesis five. Well, you know, you you get into this issue in Genesis five. Gen, there, there's something in Genesis five that overlaps with Genesis four twenty six, where you get you know this particular issue, and I have it visually uh, mapped out as to why. There is a problem here. So there's a homograph issue, a homonym. You know, you might that may be the, the term you're familiar with uh, from English grammar. When I grew up, they, they used the word homonym. Um, that's what's going on here. So I would recommend googling that, and then reading through that, going down to where you hit Genesis 4:26. Uh, it's it's under the name Enosh. If you want more direction, and I'll just I'll just read a little bit here. Uh, I just brought it up. So there's no scripture citation that in the days of Enosh, people began defiling God's name. I'm guessing, you know, that he's, he's saying that Enosh means this, this kind of idea. I'm guessing that he, Missler, means Genesis 4.26, which most Bibles have as at that time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, Missler thinks it's a mistranslation, but it isn't. So, you know, the, the, it should say at that time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. The homograph issue, the homonym issue, is halal in Hebrew. There is a halal that means to begin, and there is a halal that means to defile. They are two entirely different words. You have that verb in Genesis 4.26 followed by an infinitive. Okay, to and then a verb. That's what an infinitive is, to do something. Okay, to call in this case. It makes no sense to say men began to defile to call. On the name of the Lord. Very obviously, the wording, the second, you know, verbal form, the infinitive, tells you that the first one, the kalal, means to begin, to begin to call. So the defilement is not in this passage at all. What you have is a homograph issue. But again, go up to Google, Google drmsh.com, put in something like allegorical interpretation names Genesis five, and you're going to find uh, a description there with with an illustration. The second question is about Ephesians 2, where Paul is talking about the Gentiles who were alienated from Israel, Deuteronomy 32, have now been brought near Christ. Verse 19 in the ESV says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Who do you think is in view here being called saints, holy ones, and members of the household of God? Are both terms referring to Israel because there is a parallelism back to the term strangers and aliens? Or is there a distinction between Holy One and members of the household of God? Yeah, stranger and aliens would, of course, apply to Gentiles. That's you know, pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, I, I don't see a distinction between the Gentile identifications there and the saints or the household of God. I see saints and household of God as describing the same group into which the Gentiles belong, which is one family of God. Now, so what that means is I'd be in the group of commentators that would take the chi in Ephesians 2.19. Okay, chi is a Greek word. It's the conjunction that, you know, if you looked it up in Strong's, it would probably say and. It would get glossed with the English word and or maybe, you know, but or all. No, no well, not but. And or also. Uh, it can also be translated even, or that is. So here's Ephesians 2.19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens. You Gentiles are fellow citizens with the saints, chi, members of the household of God, saints and the members of the household of God. I think it should be translated with the saints, that is, the members of the household of God, the holy ones, you know, or the saints, even the members of the household of God. The saints and members of the household of God are the same thing. Uh, Kai, again, has a semantic range. And it's going to be, again, determined, you know, by context. You know, Paul in Ephesians and Galatians, basically everything Paul writes, he is going to stress the unity 
you know, of the body of Christ. There is one body of Christ. There is one family of God, okay, into which both Jew and Gentile alike are included by faith. Okay, the gospel is for the, you know, Jew and the Gentile. We don't have different gospels for different people groups. We have one family of God, one body of Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, you know, the whole, the whole thing. I mean, how many times does Paul have to say one or convey that idea, you know, until we, we sort of get it? So we don't have distinct peoples of God. Uh, we have a circumcision neutral thing called the body of Christ, the church, that is the people of God. And that goes all the way back. The Gentile inclusion into the family of God goes all the way back to even before we even had these distinctions, before we even had a seed of Abraham. You know, because it actually begins there. You know, when, at the judgment at Babel, God calls Abraham, says it's going to be through your seed that all these other nations are going to be blessed, they're going to be brought back into the family. You know, that at that point we have the distinction so that the, 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 what, what, what God's goal is is to reverse that judgment. Not keep it intact by having two separate peoples of God. Okay, God's goal is to reverse what he had to do at the Babel event to create, you know, to dis- dispense with the nations, disperse them, assign them to the, you know, again, the sons of God, all that stuff that we talk about a lot here, and of course, in Unseen Realm. And then go off and create a new people, Israel, you know, through this guy, Abraham. The, the, the plan was, you know, the original plan was not to have any of that in the, in the picture at all. But that happened because of rebellion. And so God's goal is to go back to Eden when these distinctions weren't in existence, not to maintain the distinctions. So uh, again, I, I'm not going to speculate on, on, I don't think the questioner is you know, angling for any of this, but, but there, are, there are unfortunate you know, th- biblical, you know, not biblical, but theological, religious you know, reasons why people like to have two peoples of God. It, it helps them prop up some, some point of their theology. That's not what God wants. It's not what he's going to end with. God will get his way. The original Edenic vision will be brought to pass, and it doesn't include these distinctions. And, and Paul is very consistent with that. So, I, again, I'm in the group that, that takes the chi here as ascensive. That's the, one of the grammatical terms for it, translated as even or, or like a parenthetical. That is, in other words, you know, the members of the saints, in other words, the members of the household of God. And into that single body, the Gentiles have been put. That's the mystery that Paul talks about later in the letter, in the very next chapter of Ephesians, the mystery that the Gentiles are included. So again, this isn't unique to me. You could, you could look up this kind of talk in more biblical commentary with Andrew Lincoln or Marcus Bart, Anchor Yale, uh, Thielman. I can't remember what his first name is in the, in the Baker exegetical commentary. Um, this is, this is very normative, you know, what I just described to you in terms of how scholars do exegesis in this passage. Our last question is from Dustin, and he has a question about our Naked Bible podcast, episode 162, The Evil Eye, and he wants to well, know— It's ancient history, man. <laughs> I know. We're coming up on 300. It's pretty historic. All right. Uh, He wants to know, Uh, is there a connection between that along with the garden incident, Satan, tree of knowledge of good and evil, and Genesis 3, 3 through 6? Yeah, this is probably angling on the uh, saw that it was, you know, good to look upon, you know, the the, the gaze and all that kind of stuff. I don't don't think there's a textual connection uh, in that passage to, I mean, people are going to have to go back and listen to the evil eye episode. Naked Bible Podcast 162. It, it actually covers things like uh, desiring that something bad happened to someone. You know, you, you look at that person, and you're, you're thinking bad thoughts. You know, it's it's part of this idea, uh, and hoping for their demise or covetousness. You know, is an element here. There, it, it actually, the idea of the evil eye. Um, it's it's not really a, a talisman kind of thing in the biblical world. It's more or less. Those two kinds of things, wishing ill upon someone or, or this, this, you know, I want that kind of thing. So I, I don't think there's any direct textual connection between that stuff that we talked about in the episode and Genesis 3. However, I, I do think that there is something of a conceptual connection uh, because of the covetousness element. So that's where I would, would, would sort of land on this. 
I think that you know someone who's familiar with the evil eye stuff and and understands the the, the covetous element to it could go back and look at Genesis three and go, oh, yeah, she wanted that. You know, I mean, in other words, there is a conceptual, you know, a, a thematic connection between the two, but I don't see any any direct textual connection. All right, well, let's get to our first question. And Lena, uh, she would uh, love to know when your third book of the Facade series will ever come out. And so would Brenda, because her husband, and she loves listening to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, It had definitely helped deepen our understanding of the Bible and shed light on difficult passages. Thank you. And uh, Brenda says she's addicted to the podcast, but wants to know when the sequel to the Facade Important is coming out. I'm hoping it's shipping by the end of 2020, so a year from now. Okay. That's that's my that's the the dedicated writing project for 2020 to finish that. So, okay, somebody else had uh, uh, a question. I didn't. We didn't put it down here. Uh, couldn't get to all of them. But uh, somebody mentioned about the uh, your astral prophecy book that you have mentioned through some of the several podcasts. Any de- development on that or? Uh, well. One chapter. It's 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 hard. Honestly, it's hard to stay interested in it. It's probably because it has the word prophecy in the title. I, I'm, I'm like poisoning myself, but uh, I repurposed a little bit of it in the uh, Enoch commentary. So you know, it, it, the issue is the content. So whether whether the content takes that form or not, you know, it'll. I think a good bit of it'll eventually get out there. Josiah has a question. Are the disciples that Paul found in Acts 19.1 disciples of John the Baptist? And if they already believed in Jesus, why does it show them receiving the Holy Spirit as a separate account from initial salvation? Absolutely love the podcast. Keep on keeping on. Well, since this is the rapid fire uh, episode, I'm going to say to Josiah, go listen to the Acts series, specifically the episode on Acts 19. I think that the the episode is Acts 18 and 19. Uh, just look here, episode 54. So that'll that'll be a better answer. George has a comment and a question here. The podcast and Dr. Heiser's work has been instrumental to me in both my faith and to develop the religious story of a video game I'm developing. Good luck on that. Hope to share it with Dr. Cool. Heiser when it's yeah. complete. As a question, I would love to know if there's anything supernatural going on for Judas. Love what you guys do. Thanks so much for all 300 episodes, all of which I've listened to. Well, I, I think the answer, the short answer is yes. You know, the scripture says the devil entered into him. So you might be dealing with some kind of possession issue there. So I think that much is pretty apparent. Josh can remember the day he came across Dr. Heiser's book, Scrolling Through Amazon. That then led to the podcast. So many questions have been answered and so many new questions have been raised. The podcast has helped me connect so many dots in my faith journey. I am thankful for Dr. Heiser, Trey, and the podcast. Appreciate that, Josh. Scott would like to hear your comments on the prodigal son parable in Luke 15. Maybe some historical, contextual, and literal contextual goodies. Uh, in short form, I think the best way to understand that parable is to read the parable that comes, the parables that go with it. So that would be literary and contextual. So, I mean, if you think about it, what what are the other two parables that go with it? There's the parable of the lost sheep, and there's the parable about the woman, you know, trying to find the coin, the lost coin. And then you have the quote unquote prodigal son. So if you read all three, what do all three have in common? They have someone seeking something. And so the point of the parable of the so-called parable of the prodigal son isn't the son. So it's really been unfortunately named. Uh, The point of the parable, like the other two, is the father. So the lost sheep, you know, you're supposed to think of Jesus as, or God, as the shepherd who seeks the one lost sheep. And you're supposed to think of him as the woman who seeks the one lost coin. And in the parable of the prodigal son, you're supposed to think about that in terms of what is the father like? What is God like? He seeks what's lost. So again, it's far too much attention paid on the on the son and you know, his self-destructive behavior and, and not enough attention focused where it belongs, you know, on the one seeking 
that which is lost. So I think that makes all the difference when you're when you're preaching it and trying to understand it. David, he loves listening to the podcast. Thanks, David. Thank you guys so much for putting this material out there for all of us. Real quick, if you had to choose from just one book of the Bible to read for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? May the Lord bless you both. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Um, yeah, I know. See, see now, I'm, now, just to be a smart aleck, I'm tempted to say something like Jude, you know, because it's the shortest one, but that's right, not right. true. Is, is it funny um, that I thought that same thing? <laughs> that's right. Oh, I think, um, boy, you know, Genesis doesn't sound like a, a, a real answer, but I think so. It, it probably is, you know. It's either Genesis or Romans, so I'd probably flip a coin. Yeah, I, I, th- I think you'd have to go to New Testament. Acts, maybe. Yeah, Genesis or Romans. Or Revelation. I know you won't like that, but that way you can just sit there. No. That, that's just, I can easily take that one off the table. When's end time going to happen? When's end time going to happen? When's end time right going to happen? Right next to First Chronicles. You know, I, don't, I don't need nine chapters of yeah. genealogies. Yeah. All right, Gary. Well, maybe I can interpret Revelation by the genealogies. There, there we go. You know, everybody else makes something up. I could make something up too. So, you should you should do that. And at the last page of the book, say, "Psych, not really." Gotcha. <laughs> Made you read it. No. Okay. There you go, folks. No, Another I think example people, of people, people would skip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! All right. Uh, Carrie, I'm making you suffer, Trey. I, I trust me, I'm <laughs> I'm hurting right now. People, it's hopefully it's coming across uh, on the uh, air. All right, where 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 do I got here? All right, Carrie, really appreciate you guys. Doctor Mike has helped me reconcile the entire story of the Bible and the world into a cohesive whole. Also, I now appreciate the true glory of the pug. Oh my gosh, Carrie. There you go. Oh. See, so I'm sure that hurt for you to read that, Trey. But you know, no, I like pugs. I like dogs. Pugs, pugs are awesome. Yeah, pugs are awesome. I got no problem with pugs. No problems. Only Th- those who follow me on ones. Twitter yesterday saw a good picture of Norman. You know, Norman when we had the the table set, Norman hopped up in the in the chair at the head of the table and just sat there. He didn't try to like jump on the table. He just sat there, like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Nice. All right. Howard has a question, and his question is, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, such as referenced in John 16, seems as if it would be an important topic, unless you have already addressed it in a previous podcast. And if you have, please tell me which one. I am what you would call a layperson, and I learn so much from the podcast. They tend to draw me closer to the Word of God. That's good. And no, I, I haven't uh, spent any time on that. So I think the best best answer for that is, yeah, we'll put it down uh, as a, on a, on my list of topics. That's it's, it'd be a good topic. All right. Cameron's question is: How do you think the supernatural world worldview plays into or provides a better understanding for world and church history? Well, I think just generally, you know, you got the Daniel ten is. You read Daniel 10, it's hard to take it seriously and not come away with the notion that there are supernatural intelligences behind empires. So it would stand to reason that there are supernatural intelligences behind, you know, what empires do, you know, what power structures do uh, in the world. And specifically, I world and church history, I don't think you can separate those uh, into, into two separate buckets. I think they're, they're always entwined. So I would I would say just generally that uh, Daniel ten you know in- instructs us to be mindful that behind the things that do happen there is you know, again a, a greater intelligence behind those things working a plan and the plan is always to forestall the fullness of the Gentiles and do as much damage you know to the church in the process of forestalling that as possible. So beyond that, I mean this I, I understand you know why people will will try to look at the events of of history and, you know, try to discern something, you know, in them. But, you know, the, the truth is that everything that we might come up with, you know, most of what we might come up with, I think would be pretty speculative. 
I think that I would put most weight on things that change the way uh, people think, you know, and mass, you know, moving herds, that all that whole idea. But at the end of the day, you know, we're just we're left to wonder. But we know again from from scripture that there is something going on behind the things we see. Scott has a comment here, real quick. Thank you for you're introducing me to the divine council worldview. It has opened my eyes to an important mm-hmm. aspect of the Bible as much as another overlooked topic has, that of the Old Testament manifestations of the embodied and multi-plural Yahweh, which happens to be how I came across your work, your talks on the Trinity in the Old Testament leading to your talks, and then books on the Divine Council. So Scott says thank you. David's I understand, believe me. (laughs) David's question is, can you compare contrast differences, if any, between Mike's method of interpretation of the Bible text and that put forth in the Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 1. Well, I don't see any particular method outlined in the Westminster Confession, you know, method of Bible study. It does, I mean, you're not going to read it and uh, do this, don't do that, you know, follow this trajectory. You're not, you're not going to do that. Um, it does, as other creeds do, you know, hint at the big idea of comparing Scripture with Scripture, um, and and that I think is quite consistent with what we do here. Uh, it's very consistent. You know, intertextuality is the term academics use for this, and I'm, you know, on the podcast we're constantly beating that drum. Uh, when your old when your New Testament references the Old Testament, it's a good idea to go back there and, and look. Um, you know what's going on, and today's modern Bibles will make that easy for you to discern when the New Testament is doing that. So intertextuality is a big deal, comparing Scripture with Scripture, but the the confession doesn't do anything to really help you or move you toward the notion that we ought to be reading the Bible uh, in light of its own ancient original context. So, you know, and and I'm not picking on it, it's just none of the confessions do that. But at at least, you know, they're comparing, you know, trying to say something about comparing Scripture with Scripture. You know, I'm going to throw something in here because— a couple times just in conversation, you know, in Q&As and what I get questions about, and this is sort of a Reformed thing that I think in part derives from the Westminster Confession, again, maybe some other ones, but uh, the perspicuity of Scripture. Like, people, people ask me this question to, to make it sound, I think, to themselves, you know, so they can have it ringing around in their heads, or the minds of people listening to the question that, well— you know, what Mike's suggesting here about reading the Bible in light of its own context, you know, its own ancient context, that that's not compatible with the perspicuity of Scripture. Perspicuity is a word that means clarity. Like, like you know, like what anyone does, like what the Reformers do or Calvin does at any given point, you know, like that's just self-evident. It's not. So this is a bogus claim. And if you're asking the question, if someone's asking about perspicuity for that reason, it's a bogus, you know, question as well. You know, and if you actually looked at the Westminster Confession, it will say that the things that the things that are clear in Scripture are the core ideas; those things, you know, to be known for the for salvation, and the other stuff isn't. So, can we just stop with the perspicuity question? You know, re- reformed person out there in the audience that might be a little offended that I'm not. We don't say on this podcast that you should interpret the Bible, you know, through the lens and through the filter of, of a particular creed or confession. We don't do that because those things are all post-biblical contexts. I would suggest to you instead that you go back and read the Westminster Confession and get, get perspicuity, get clarity on the fact that the confession itself says that there's a lot of things in Scripture that aren't self-evident. And the solution to that is not to try to find them in the confession, or if you don't find them in the confession or any other creed, you just dump them and forget about them and ignore them. That's not the answer. Scripture is supposed to make sense, and it can. If you read it for what it is, an ancient document written by ancient people to ancient people, you try to get them living in your head, there are a lot of things that will become clear at least clearer, and will connect to each other. The, the, it will inform your knowledge of, of Scripture and God's plan. So there's a lot, you know, a lot to be said for the the notion that we propound here that, you know, serious study of Scripture goes beyond creeds and confessions. It's not dependent on them. Nor will the, nor will those things produce a method for you to do that. 
So now that I now that I've just offended the last three people listening to this episode, Trey, let's move on. <laughs> mm. okay. uh, what was that word again? Purse what? what per, pers, perspicuity. Perspicuity. The perspicuity of perspicuity. Can you spell of that? Can you spell that? That's P E R S P E C U I T Y. Perspicuity. Wow. Was that all? I, think, I, I think it's that all? yeah. It's the, either it's either I C U I T Y or E C U. Impressive. E C U I T Y. Yeah, right. one of those two. See, we uh, we've managed to turn this into a spelling bee. I mean, that, that's even. You, you you thought it you thought it the, the chit chat couldn't get any worse. Trust me, Trey. I've I've, I've got a whole lot of techniques here to avoid <laughs> chit chat. <laughs> me too, Mike. Me too. All right, here we go. All right, Trey in Louisiana. He's got a couple questions and then a comment. And his first question is, we often hear Mike speak of the supernatural worldview or the divine counsel worldview of the biblical authors and thereby their context and keeping it in the forefront of sound biblical interpretation. Are we to understand from the text that this was the understanding of or worldview of the authors was and what they simply perceive to be reality, or are we to understand from the text that spiritual beings are ontologically real? In other words, does Mike believe personally, after studying the text in depth, that the unseen realm is an ontologically intimate reality that today interacts with and or against us in more ways than bad thinking? If yes, how so? Mm-hmm. Well, this, this is easy. You know, the answer is yes. I'm a little surprised to even be getting the question. I mean, I don't know how many, you know, this ought to be clear. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not just saying this is something the biblical writers believed and we're safe to ignore it. I don't know how anyone would, would draw that conclusion uh, listening to the podcast or reading Unseen Realm. So that that's easy. And if yes, how? Well, I'm not omniscient, so there's there's no way I would know that. And besides, this is the rapid fire episode, so you know how how do how do spiritual beings interact with people today? I'd say a whole lot of ways. But again, you know, I, I'm I can't sit here and comment. I can't even I can't even tell you specifically when episodes of my own life involve this. I might be able to tell you when I suspected it, but that's about the best I can do. So. I'm not going to be able to do that for anybody else either. All right. Trey uh, also has a comment. I am beyond thankful for the Naked Bible podcast and all of the content and materials that come from team associated with Mike. The work that everyone does is a blessing for me individually and corporately. I am a completely different person, father and follower of Jesus because of everything Naked Bible. I am all the more excited and eager for the future of this ministry and its impact for the kingdom of God. So thanks, Trey. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Luke has a question. I just finished That All Shall Be Saved by David Bentley Hart. I'm curious about Dr. Mike's take on hell not being eternal, but instead a temporary refining period to get us all back to God eventually. Temporary meaning Hitler will probably do more time than your atheist grandma or something. God bless you all. Yeah, I, I think it's nonsense. I mean, I. You know, and, and I'm not trying to be harsh there because I have friends who are universalists, like you know, David. I think do I want to use the the name the guy who wrote the Evangelical Universalist? So I don't know if I'm, I need to use his real Robin Perry is his real name. I think he has published that. Um, so I mean, you know, we, we've we've interviewed him. I, we interviewed him once, one of these SBL years. You know, so I, I have friends who are universalists, but I'm just not buying it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, it's funny how universalist talk doesn't include the Old Testament, for one thing. So we've got, you know, the, the Kerem Wars, you know, the wars against the giant clans, and those those individuals are still called people, even though they're, you know, they're they have the the, the bloodline, you know, back to before the flood and all that. You know, you have Baal worshippers. You know, I mean, re- rejecting, you know, God in the Old Testament. You know, there was a heavy price to pay, and there's no talk. I don't, and I would say there's no seeding talk of universalist, you know, outcomes. So, you know, it's funny to me how universalists don't include the Old Testament, and then they want to affirm, though, on the other side, that we have the same God of the Old Testament as in the New. Well, you can't have both. You can't have that cake and eat it, too. Uh, If we have the same God and the same trajectories for salvation history, 
then I think you're seeing something on the other end that it really is not at all evident uh, elsewhere. And I, and I think it's, I think that there has some real weaknesses, you know, in the New Testament too. You know, why why is the writer of Hebrews worried about unbelief and falling away? Oh, he's just worried about them spending extra time in hell. Well, then why doesn't why doesn't he say that? You know, why give the Great Commission? Everybody's going to get there anyway. I mean, why write John three eighteen or John three thirty six? You know, John three eighteen. This is the two verses after John three sixteen, with the Universalist, of course, is going to want to affirm. You know, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. In John three thirty six. Let me just click out to that so I don't get it wrong. John three thirty six says this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. Oops. But the wrath of God remains on him. That's not a very good universalist verse. You know, shall not see life, and the wrath of God remains on him. So universalism just, I mean, I'm just, these are just, you know, isolated verses because we got to do this quickly. But the, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. So I realize you can do, you know, lots of logical argumentation and say this or that, and it all looks beautiful, except, you know, again, when you probe it. So it's just, universalism to me is like a soteriological system, kind of like people come up with eschatological systems. They're all beautiful, but they all cheat somewhere and, you know, relegate data that are, are problematic, you know, to, you know, some place where people can't see those data. Or they will put, you know, some kind of spin on them to make them not say what they seem to plainly say. Just like John 3.36. So anyway, I'm not buying it. Nolan wants to know what's holding back the biblical study scholars who aren't Christians. This has always bugged me. Well, I think there's lots of answers to this, you know, because people are, people are different. I guess, I guess we'd have to know what holding back means. Um, does that mean taking the text seriously, like believing what it says? Does it mean becoming a Christian? I don't really know. I mean, if it's the latter, you know, then I guess, you know, you could say, well, scholars who are Jewish, you know, they're just, you know, they're, they're committed to Judaism or they don't, you know, they've been sort of trained or taught or embraced, you know, a different way of, of looking at uh, Jesus, you know, himself. And so they're, they're just like anybody, you know someone in that community, you know, they have to, they have to be, you know, challenged and, and hopefully um, brought through, you know, some of the things that are preventing them from considering, you know, the New Testament as, as having equal weight to the old. But, you know, then there are others, you know, who are raised, you know, in Christian traditions or whatever. And, you know, some of the, like I said, everybody's different. Some of them just don't want to believe it because there's an issue of accountability. Um, some see scripture. I think this is probably more predominant. They they see scripture as the product only of human hands, and and I think this is like kind of an either or fallacy that works a lot in scholarship. And and honestly, I think those who 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 take a high view of scripture you know, that would be the evangelical world. I think the evangelicals need to own their failure here, and that is that we we've, we've taught people again this X Files view of the text, X Files view of inspiration, that it dropped from heaven and God's whispering every word in somebody's ear. And then when you see, you know, when you when you're exposed to that, either as a, a young person or an adult, and then you actually get into scripture and you see how that can't work. Okay, what a lot of people do is they just dump the whole proposition that God is behind this, and it becomes the product merely of human hands. And so then holding back biblical scholars, you know, for, from from believing the truth propositions here, that that that's that in large part contributes to it. You know, and and the, and the failure there is is how we again uh, those of us with a high view of scripture, how we think about what the Bible is and how it came to be, and do a poor job of that and create an indefensible view that just makes it harder for people who get into the text to believe it. You know, what we really need is to rethink the whole idea. And and again, the, the short version solution to this is we need to understand inspiration not as an event or a series of events, but as the result of a long providential process that involved many hands, involved editing, involved some, you know, and, and, and honoring God's decisions to pick the people, to prompt the people, to prepare the people providentially who would produce scripture to do the job 
he picked them when they lived, you know, certain time, certain place, certain culture, certain context, worldview, all this stuff. And then God lets them do their job. You know, they, they, they are free, you know, to use genres, you know, of, of their own times and patterns and formats, you know, and God is free, you know, to bring someone else along and, and, and arrange material in such a way, you know, do, do editorial work on, on something. You know, it's, it's a long process that God is involved in all the time because multiple hands are contributing to what we have here. And God has his own reasons for doing it this way, as opposed to the X-Files view of inspiration. So I think if we just were able to articulate a better view of inspiration, uh, my my optimistic, maybe naive, you know, hope would be that more or fewer people would look at it only as the product of, of human hands. I think that has a large uh, there's there's a large element of that here to the to being the answer to the question. Joshua wants to know what Old Testament scholars do you find yourself agreeing with more than not? Oh, I don't know. I, I, it's not like I've kept a tabulation of this. Um, I mean, I tend to agree with points that, you know, I wouldn't even use words like agree or disagree. I mean, I, I read people not to, to ask myself, do I agree with them or disagree with them? I read people to try to discern some, some contributing point, you know, some data point that is significant. Again, I, I, I don't sit down and intentionally even do that, but that's more descriptive of, of, of how I, I think and, and, and what I do. I am a dot connector. I'm a sifter and a dot connector. And if you do that long enough, you come across things and it's like, yep, that has the ring of truth because I can see how it informs five or six other things. That doesn't mean I accept it out of the gate. That means this goes on my list of things to think about. Does it work? And when I say does it work, I don't mean does it work in the passage that the guy or, or, the, or the woman is talking about. When I say does it work, I mean does it work everywhere that this passage informs. And by the way, this is, this is the fundamental difference between me and somebody like a John Walton or some you know, Old Testament scholars that I, I enjoy promoting their work and, 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 and really enjoy them as people. But a lot of, a lot of good scholars, you know, like John or somebody else, you know, in Old or New Testament, they're, they're content with, I've come up with a, a way to understand this that works here, that makes sense in the passage. And, and there are lots of those. There are lots of interpretations that make sense in a particular passage. In other words, they're workable. They, they, you know, they, they can do the job there. I don't ask that question. I don't stop there. I want to know if this works here, and I know that there's you know, five or six or ten other passages that this passage is part of a bigger matrix of, I want to know, does it work in all of them? Okay, that I... Again, I'm not saying I'm smarter. Okay, I'm I'm not. You know, I depend on the work of scholars. You know, what what I am saying is that's just how my mind works. For it to be satisfactory, it needs to work everywhere. Because if it doesn't, I don't like outliers. There shouldn't be outliers. It should make sense across the board, in every way. That's what I want. That's what I want to see. So you might have a good interpretation here, or at least a workable one, that satisfies you. It doesn't satisfy me for that reason. Um, so I, I tend to read material this way. Again, if you do this long enough, you come across things where, where now I just have a sensibility where it's like, okay, I, I think they're on to something. Because I look at it here, it makes sense. And I know that this thing connects to this other thing. Uh, that seems like it might. You know, and this one, and, and over here. And, you know, I, I can't help it. That's just the way my mind works. So I don't, I, it's not a method I can teach. I, I guess I can demonstrate it or illustrate it. I think that's what I'm, Unseen Realm tries to do that. You know, uh, I think unconsciously, I, it, people read it and they just sort of see that. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a verbal, a written illustration of, of the way Mike's mind works. Um, so that, that's just how it goes, you know, so I, I could say I agree with, you know, hundreds of you know, scholars and disagree with those same scholars at some other point. Well, again, those aren't really the right words. It's not that I'm necessarily thinking that they're 
you know, is, is the word wrong? I, I think in some cases, in some cases, yeah, I think they're wrong. I think they're, you know, I just, no, this just isn't it. But the basis for it is that this isn't wrong because I know this isn't going to work, you know, in these five or other six places. It's going to be like 0 for 5. It's just, it's just dead on arrival. In other cases, you know, I may, uh, I may not favor what they do because it's not complete. Okay, when I, when I go for, for understanding and interpretation, I don't want outliers. I want complete coherence. And when I don't get it, then it, you just have to keep thinking about it and, and you have to keep looking for more data uh, to help that work, to help it come together. All right, Catherine has a comment. The Naked Bible Podcast probably saved me. Finally, someone who speaks to me about religion and the Bible as if I have intelligence. Dr. Heiser also <laughs> tackles the entire Bible. It made me want to really read the Bible and Savior it after reading it at light speed in one year program in 2018. Dr. Heiser's commentary mm-hmm. ties the Bible together for me as the living, relevant to the present word that it is. I'm listening to all the episodes for the second time and encouraging ideas that somehow escaped me the first time around. Praying for Dr. Heiser's success and his exciting new endeavor. Well, thank you. That's that's a good comment, too, because, again, it, it illustrates the idea of connectivity, how things relate to one another. That's If we really believe that, that one mind ultimately steered the circumstances, you know, to produce this thing, it ought to make sense. You know, and, and, and again, the best interpretations aren't the most supernatural. The best interpretations aren't the one that takes that take care of our concerns or make us feel comfortable. The best interpretations of any given passage are the ones that work there and everywhere else. Okay, it, it creates the matrix uh, that that doesn't leave you without liars. So that that's what we're shooting for here. Travis has a question. Jesus is from the line of David according to the Bible, as the Bible in Matthew and Luke shows his genealogy. However, the genealogy leads to Joseph, not Mary, in who Jesus was conceived. How can it still count for Jesus to be descendant of David when he has no blood connection to David through Joseph? Is it enough that Joseph was married to Mary even though Jesus didn't come from Joseph's body? Yeah, in in their time it was because of the way they viewed uh, things like adoption. So it, you know, for the, the leadership of, of the time, you know, when when the, you know, Jesus becomes the son of Joseph, you know, through either adoption or whatever, you know, or, or that they at least looked on it that way. I mean, that was, that probably had a, a higher or a different uh, significance psychologically, I guess. Maybe that's the right word than, than it does for us. So that that's one part of this. I mean, you know, scholars have, have looked at the genealogies and how they establish you know, sonship back to David, you know, through Joseph. And the only way that works for them, uh, and, and honestly, that, those, that's where it counts because they're the ones that, that uh, you know, have to accept you know, the, the, the claim on the basis of inheritance, you know, how they looked at inheritance. And it works for them. Uh, but the, this question is, is biological. And, you know, the, again, that, that wasn't so much the issue in, in terms of these genealogical relationships, but you know, having said that, there are a handful of scholars that suspect. There's no way you can prove it conclusively. I mean, you can you can build an argument for it, and and a few scholars have that um, at least one of the one of the genealogies is actually Mary's. You know, it, it, it's difficult to do that, but again, there there are people who have tried to to prove that, even though uh, again the you know the, the phrasing of whom was born Jesus, you know that that sort of thing. You know, some people have tried to play off that and, and kind of reinterpret, you know, the, the genealogies and whatnot. But here, here's how, you, again, in, in a very short form way, here's how you would, would approach the problem just generally. If Mary, and I think this is establishable, again, at least, at least the likelihood of it, again, it, it's going to fall short of the kind of thing that, that the questioner might want or other people might want. But if it can be established that Mary is a blood relative of anyone, Anyone, not just you know the the immediate ancestry of Joseph or, or something like that, but but anyone in a lineage that includes Joseph, and since Joseph's line does go back to David, there you have your Davidic you know connection. 
And so this is what what uh, you know scholars have tried to do to to add this element, you know, this biological element. But uh, again, there's only been a handful that have really you know tackled that. So for for everybody else, the the, the sort of you know legal descent, you know that um, you know people of his day, you know, would have would have accepted and embraced, you know, has been sufficient. Joanne wants to know if the concept of a cardinal Christian is biblical. Oh, yeah. Well, it depends how you define carnal Christian. Uh, really, I mean, that, that's the short answer. It depends how you define this. If you define it, if you define carnal Christian as someone who struggles with sin, well, then certainly you can have, quote-unquote, carnal Christians. Uh, I'd also say you can have believers who are quite ignorant about something that is sin. They might they might have been taught their whole lives that it's not. You know, uh, it's not like every point of biblical morality is intuitive. Uh, if someone has been taught all their life that a behavior, you know, is fine or normal, and the Bible says it isn't, then that person has to be exposed to what the Bible says, and they're, they're going to struggle with it. I mean, it, it's something new. They have to, you know, they have to incorporate that into into how they think, you know, and that's not just going to be this thing you flip on and flip off, you know, they're, they aren't going to just know it. They may struggle with submitting, you know, to, to a particular point of teaching. So those sorts of struggles are not antithetical to being a Christian. You know, Paul wrote two letters to the Corinthian church that illustrates everything I've just said to this point. You know, most of the believers in the church were pagans who had been taught certain ways are not taught at all, not taught anything about various points of morality. And he still, Paul still calls them brothers and sisters, okay, in, in the Lord. You know, that's the point of the letters. You know, he's trying to instruct them and get them to not do these things you know, in, in life. Now, on the other hand, though, if you define carnal Christian as someone who claims to be a Christian and could care less about what Scripture says, who willfully chooses their own autonomy over what they know, Scripture teaches, you know, as far as being a, a true disciple of Jesus. Well, then I think that person's testimony of faith should be questioned or challenged. You know, it just depends how you how you define this. All right, John has a comment. As a result of the Naked Bible podcast of the Unseen Realm, I was motivated to enter grad school for biblical studies. Dr. Heiser's ministry has answered so many questions that I had in regards to the Bible and the supernatural realm, and I hope to pay it forward in academia and working with others. Awesome. Good luck, John. Good. Yeah, that, yep, yep, that's, that's pretty cool. And, Josh, and I would say anybody, let me, let me just you know, add this to that. Um, you don't have to go to grad school or seminary to pay it forward. I think everybody in this audience, everybody in this audience can pay it forward to somebody else. And honestly, that's the way... You know, we we love when the podcast grows. That's wonderful. But I'm more interested in the content. I want the content to infect the world, okay? That let, let's just be blunt about it. You know, Unseen Realm has done amazingly well. Uh it you know, we we've, we've it's sold 100,000 units. I don't call that a success. I know it's a success, but I don't call it that. I call it a good start. That's really what it is. Uh, and, and so everybody in this audience, every reader of Unseen Realm, ought to get a book or two and hand it to somebody else or, or Supernatural and have them read it or, or invite them somebody else to listen to the podcast. That's paying it forward, too. You know, if, if you want to devote yourself, you know, to scholarship, I mean, that, that's, that's going to have a tremendous ripple effect uh, if you remain, you know, faithful to the task of paying it forward that way. Um, because you're going to write books, you're going to you're going to produce content that will will get out there. That's awesome, but I don't I don't want anyone to to get the impression that they can't pay the content forward in some way. Of course you can, and I hope you do. Well, Joshua, he listened to the Naked Bible podcast has encouraged uh, him to go back to Bible college as well. Yeah, I was wondering how the podcast wow. has affected Mike and Trey's life. What has been the most encouraging thing, and what has been the biggest struggle? And what they have learned about God. So Joshua, going back to Bible college too. So obviously the podcast is, uh, like you said, uh, prompting a lot of people to go back. Well, Trey, you were included in this question. Do you want to? Uh, mm. You want to chime in most, first, or do you want yeah, me? To yeah, yeah, I'll chime in. The most encouraging thing is obviously uh, how far 
uh, and wide the reach is of the show. So, I mean, I get emails from people from all over the world, people in the middle of Africa to uh, South America to all over. So to me, that I love that. I love the fact that, you know, I use this as a way to serve. And so, you know, the fact that it reaches so many people, you know, for me, because it's a lot of work. And, you know, a lot of time sacrifice for me personally, and I'm more than happy to do it because I know how important this content is. And so just being able to help produce something that has such Mm -hmm. a far and wide reach, like I said, is everything to me, you know? Yeah, I I would, I would say the, uh, you know, the the positive part, you know, what, what's the biggest, you know, encouragement. Is that, I mean, it's knowing that basically I'm producing content that's useful to lots of people. I mean, I say that a lot, you know, I, I'm glad to be useful and, and I actually mean it to, you know, for, for me, it's, it's just that simple. You know, I, I've never been one that, you know, I could get absorbed, you know, in, in content and just, you know, enjoy it. I mean, that that's perfectly within the, uh, you know, in my makeup, you know, to do that. But you know, I know, again, having, I, as a believer, I've always sort of been this way that, you know, what what we're doing here ought, ought, to, ought to be practical. You know, it, it ought to be helpful and not just something that we sit here by ourselves and enjoy. You know, that, that's that's how what became Unseen Realm was born, just that, that realization one day in, in, in Madison, Wisconsin, that, you know, 99% of the people in church are never going to have the experience of enjoying this. And that just, that's just not right. So for me, that that's the biggest thing. Uh, he asked about what what the biggest struggle is. I think, uh, you know, well, you know, the, the, I think the biggest struggle and frustration is is engagement because the 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 bigger this thing grows, the less able, you know, I am to, you know, answer people's questions, to engage them, and you know, email or anything on you know social media. That, that's very frustrating because that that. I, I now refer to email as my daily opportunity, you know, to not feel useful or to, you know, <laughs> or to just, uh, you know, be depressed or something, you know, because it, you know, that's what it is. You know, you get so much of the of this stuff, and you know, you can't get to it. So that's 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 irritating. It just, you know, that's a downer. I, I guess we'll say. So that that those are the the two poles for me. Um, but you know, it is what it is, and we just you know trust that the Lord will will use it. And basically make make what we do um, useful, really, in spite of our limitations, I guess. So we just have to believe he'll do that. All right. I hope I don't mispronounce the next person's name too bad, but Roshanda. That's my guess, Michael. You want to take a guess at that? Spell it. R-W-A-S-A-N-D-A. Okay, yeah. Oh, that's Ru- yeah. How would you pronounce that? I'm going Ru- with like that. like Rwanda or like Ru- Rwasanda or something like that. Ru- Rwasanda. Ru- it's hard to do the R and the W really quickly together. Rwasanda or maybe the R Rwasanda. Side. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I yeah maybe maybe it is. A- they want to know where did Cain get a wife from? Was Noah's flood universal, and is human marriage divine or not? <laughs> Yeah, this is the this is really easy in the short form. Uh, you know, actually, it, it pops into my head here that that it is. Um, we did a fringe pop three two one episode on um, the question of were there other humans. I, I can't remember the title of it, but if you go to YouTube, fringe pop three two one, and look through the uh, episode videos, there's going to be something about other Adamic races or something like that. So I bring that up because of this whole issue of where Cain get his wife from. You know, there's there's two answers, two possible answers. One is that there were other human beings around at the time, and there are things in Genesis four that would make you think that the, this whole thing about Cain having a wife is just one of three things in Genesis four that sort of suggest that, or have suggested that, you know, to other people. And the other one is that, you know, he gets a wife from those of his own relation, you know, his own extended family, you know, from Adam and Eve. And and the reason why it's not clear cut, you know, you might look at, at Genesis four and oh, there are these things in here, you know, that, that make it sound like there were other people out there besides, you know, Adam, Eve, and Cain, you know, after after Cain kills Abel. 
you know, like Cain goes and he moves, and then he builds a city. Well, did he do that all by himself? You know, and it, well, it sounds like there are other people, or he's afraid that somebody's going to kill him. Well, they're, supposedly they're the only ones there. So, like, who's out there that's going to kill him? You know, so there are these things that hint that there are other people. But the problem is that these narratives in Genesis don't give you any scope of time. In other words, they don't they don't put a number of years between uh, the the birth of Cain and Abel uh, and when Cain and Abel, you know Cain kills Abel. They don't tell you how much time elapsed, you know, from the time Cain Cain kills Abel to the time when he you know leaves you know the home and moves somewhere else. So in theory, it could be you know a couple hundred years. You know, well in that time, yeah, they're going to still have children because Adam and Eve are going to be obedient to the, the initial command: be fruitful and multiply. And so you know, Cain can easily have a wife, you know, from his own extended family. I mean, it, it it can work just as fine as the other one, and and maybe even I would say even more so, you know, based upon what we're told here. So you know, that, that's how you approach that. But again, you could you could look at the, the video and get a little bit more on that. Uh, the, the flood, was the flood universal? I would say go up to my website or, or Google drmsh.com and put in the words uh, local regional flood. And you're going to find the post I did on how you could articulate, how you could, you could uh, demonstrate that the flood is local from the text of scripture. Doesn't mean it was, you know, you could you know, take the the language is universal, and many do. Um, I, you know, I, again, I, I don't necessarily. I'm not. I'm not bothered by either. You know, choice. I think there are things, other things that that probably make a little more sense if the flood was local or regional, regional especially. Um, but again, you could you could go see the post on that just for how you would do that. My point is that either view can derive from the text. A local or regional view is not science dependent, or 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 a view that, that arises because we're, you know, we're afraid of science. Okay, you, you can quite easily do this from the text of Scripture, which is why I did the post. Is marriage divine or not? I don't even really know what that means. Um, marriage is two people, so I don't know what it is. marriage divine or not. I, I, I'm not really following what the point of that question is, so I'm just going to, I'll just say that and let's move on. <laughs> I'll say yes, just to make my wife you know, happy. Well, I mean, if yeah. if the question is, if, if the question is, is the union of male and female, man and woman, okay, is that God's definition of marriage? Well, that's pretty obvious, yeah. Um, but I don't know that that's what the question is angling for, so I don't really know what to do with it. Well, unless your husband or wife nags you, then it's not that divine, but... <laughs> Yeah. All right, Jacqueline. Has, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not in that situation, Trey. So I'm. Me either, I'm happy. So that's why I said it's divine. I'm not either. I see other people. I'm like, yeah. mm, not so divine. But uh, all right, <laughs> Jacqueline has uh, wants to know if Yahweh is a spirit. What is the necessity of a throne throne room when he is meeting with the sons, as in Job? Is he in some form with them? Yeah, I think the key word here is necessity. There is no necessity. Uh, the the scripture writers are writing about God the way they do because they can't help it. Uh, we are embodied beings. The scripture writers were humans. They're embodied beings. The a, a world of non embodiment where where our physical limitations are no longer in the picture. And when we have maybe different kinds of bodies or different kinds of corporeality, it's, it, that's just not in the picture because none of them have ever experienced that. And so what, what's true of descriptions of the afterlife, descriptions of the throne room of God and God himself, at least you know, when he's not on earth, because then we kind of know that why God would appear as a man, because now he's decipherable. Uh, we, we know we're talking to somebody now. And you know, again, the glory is veiled, and all that, st- you know, all that stuff. You know, we've talked about that at length in the podcast, and of course, in unseen realm. But when we have these these visions of of you know God's house, as it were, somewhere in the in the spiritual world on the spiritual plane, how else are humans going to talk about those things than to use the language of embodiment? And that's what's going on here. This is this is metaphor. You know, we. we the, the biblical writers are going to strike analogies. They're going to use the language of hierarchy, for instance. They're going to use the language of, of the royal court because God is king. How else would you talk about God if, if God is king? 
You're going to you're going to talk about kingly things like a throne and a throne room and attendants and bodyguards and you know all this kind of stuff. So the the language is again used by the writers and of course God is you know not objecting to any of this, you know God is behind the scenes. He's the unseen hand prompting all these things as it were and approving them. So this this gives us an idea that God is organized that the heavens are orderly, there is a hierarchy. It would make sense that an intelligent being would like an ordered existence. I mean, we're intelligent beings, and we don't like chaos. We, we prefer order over chaos, at least if we're in our right minds. So, you know, God is, is going to be a, you know, we're a reflection of that. God is going to be like that. And so he's, he's discussed in these terms that that, uh, again, denote kingship and order and rank and hierarchy, you know, and who's in charge and who, who takes, who gives commands and who doesn't, you know, where God lives, you know, this is the language of embodiment. And so there's no other way for human beings to talk about God than to use this kind of language. There's no other way to talk about the spiritual world than to use the language of the embodied world so that people have some way to express what it is they're seeing or, you know, what, it, what they're being prompted to write, you know, all these, these sorts of things, you know, when it comes to Scripture. So this is a necessity. It's a, there, there's no other way to do it, you know, for a, a human to be the instrument of God, to write about God. God knows that this is what human authors are going to be locked into. And he also knows that that's a good thing because it communicates well. It will get the ideas that God wants humans to know about him across. It will communicate. So that, that's what we have. All right, Brian just has a big thank you for increasing my knowledge and helping me shed a lot of bad theology that comes with denominational traditions. So there you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. All right, Mike, our 300th episode is so good that it's, uh, we're going to have to split it up into two parts. So we're going to stop it there and we'll finish up next week because we're so good. 300, we're going to stretch it to two episodes. <laughs> we're going to keep the celebration going. See, you, see you, you, you thought this would be a torture, you know, and, and maybe it still is, but the audience carried it. That's true. I, yeah. Um, if we didn't have it's them, all true. <laughs> if we didn't have them, we would be in trouble. If it was just me and you, we would be in trouble. That's right. If, if we didn't It'd have be the serious Bible, trouble. Yeah. It would, yep. it would be about. 17 minutes of fantasy talk and then followed by seven minutes of awkward silence followed by, right. I don't know, but getting something to eat. Yeah. <laughs> something about pugs, <laughs> you know, yeah, there baseball. You go. I'd take a quick nap during that and then uh, we'd wrap it up. All right. <laughs> right. Well, congratulations. This is 300. That's a big milestone. Yeah. Joy. Uh, wants to know, has your research prompted you to delve into the incarnation? What do you think the Holy Spirit's role was? How can Christ be like us in all ways when he actually has no human father? I've always believed he is 100% God, 100% human, but biologically, how can that be? Would his parentage be similar to Adam's, the breath of God? This is a bit like asking how... Jesus can be like us in every way, having never sinned. You know, in other words, the Jesus' experience and, and these things about him, we don't have to have a 100% to 100% alignment. Okay, so, so the, 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 the similarity is, is not about you know, matching every you know, every chromosome, okay, to, to what we are. I mean, it's just being human. And he is human, again, by virtue of the way God created him. I mean, it, what we, we should ask ourselves, how, how can Adam be like us? Well, it's because that's the way God made him. He's human, we're human, okay? I mean, so, so I, think, I think that the problem with the, you know, the, what's creating the, 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 maybe the confusion or the, or the, uh, the question itself is this notion that we have to have this, you know, microscopic 100%, you know, alignment, you know, to, to Jesus. Well, Jesus never sinned and, and we do, so he can't be just like, a, well, no, that really isn't the point. You know, the, the point is not, again, that 
there has to be this utter totality of all aspects, you know, down to the to the chromosome or gene or something like that. You know, what what scripture is trying to communicate is that, you know, he was human. We're human. He's human. And as a human being, we we talked about this in the episode, in the series in, in Hebrews. Jesus does know what it's like to be tempted. He does know what it's like to be hungry and to have other physical urges, and, and he knows what it's like to be to live as an embodied being, because he's human. So that's the point. The, the point of the author is not that Jesus had, you know, again this this exhaustive totality. And like I said, we you know we we can always come up with exceptions, you know, to to ask how he's not like us or how he could be like us, and we could also do the same thing, you know, with with Adam and. You know, frankly, you know, if there's any omission of experience or even biology between, you know, you and somebody walking down the street, do you really know what it's like to be them? Well, the, the, the coherent answer is, yeah, we're both humans. You know, the, the, the point of the question, do you know what it's like to be, you know, to be this other person you see walking down the street? Well, how can you if you don't have the genetic, you know, flaw that he has in his genome? Well, again, th- those kind of details are not the point, you know, of the analogy that that, that Scripture is trying to communicate. They're re- and they're really not the point of, of our identification with our, our fellow human beings now. We don't need this 100% microscopic, exhaustive totality in order to be able to say, yeah, you know, we, we, are, we are like each other. You know, we understand. We understand what it means to be human. And that, that's really the point, that he was human. He's genuinely human. You know, he's the second Adam. I think that this is a good, a good place for that analogy because, you know, Adam didn't have a father either, so I guess he wasn't human. You know, it, you know that, that sort of thing. Um, that really isn't the point of what the Scripture writers are trying to say. TJ says, thanks, Mike Trey, for making scholarly content accessible to everyday people. The Divine Council worldview has helped to clarify so much that I suspected was there in the text but couldn't articulate. His question is, we are said to be redeemed by the blood of Christ. Is the principle of blood as the requirement for atonement connected in any way to the idea of blood used in the creation of man according to Babylonian creation narratives? The short answer to this, I think, is no. I I don't know of any scriptural thread, you know, to tug on here that would make those connections or that connection. Zarek has a question. I've started reading the book Without Form and Void by Arthur C. Custance. Are you familiar with it? And if so, what's your opinion? Is it legit? So far, the arguments on how the Hebrew words are used in other verses seem to make sense, but I'm very ignorant in biblical Hebrew. Uh, Yeah, I am familiar with it. No, it's not legit. I mean, the, the Custance articulated the gap theory. Uh, that, that's what this particular book, you know, is, is articulated. I mean, Custance, Custance by training was an anthropologist, a uh, bit of a polymath. You know, he he, he dipped into lots of different subjects. Um, so it, it's still valuable to read Custance, even though the books are old and he's not. The fact that he's not a biblical scholar is going to show in places. He's still worth reading because he he's an outside the box thinker, which is is always welcome. Um, but there, there's the, the gap theory just has no exegetical merit. If you go to my website, drmsh.com, and you go under, I believe it's resources for videos, or you, you could just Google this too, drmsh.com, uh, gap theory, or Genesis 1, 1 through 3, you know, you're, you're going to find a video presentation of that I did on this. Um, the issue is not Hebrew words. And again, Custance can't take you beyond vocabulary. The issue is the Hebrew grammar and the syntax, the sentence, you know, the, the way the sentence, sentences, the clauses, you know, relate to each other in the first three verses. There is no linear sequence in verses one through three. The Hebrew grammar forbids it, and the gap theory absolutely depends on there being a linear sequence, because that's going to dictate how it translates. Like it's gonna, like he's going to try to argue that the, verse two, that the earth became formless and empty. Well, the word became, it, it requires a linear sequence, you know, events preceding and events following. I'm sorry, but the grammar and the syntax do not give you a linear sequence. The gap theory is dead on arrival if you care about Hebrew grammar. It just is. I mean, I, 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 there's really not much I can add to it. 
But again, I made a video trying to illustrate this in English first and then talking about how you know Hebrew does what it does. And this is this is really the Achilles heel or the you know the kill shot to the gap theory. It's a, it's about the grammar. It's not about Hebrew words, you know, and, and like vocabulary itself. Nikki has a quick comment and um I am very grateful for these podcasts and books. What I really appreciate is the references on content. So thanks. Scott mm-hmm. yep. has a question and Scott's question is, I've always wondered how can anyone be a descendant of the Nephilim after the flood? I mean, by what mechanism, not saying that it is impossible. A mm-hmm. global flood would have wiped out all the Nephilim. A local flood would be targeted at where the Nephilim lived or else it'd be kind of pointless. In either case, if Noah's family was chosen to continue the human race, it would be counterproductive if he himself had Nephilim lineage. Is the mechanism of inheritance spiritual rather than genetic? Is it merely a vocational sonship? The giants in Canaan adopting the title of the Nephilim and Rephaim due to their coincidental similarity in size or behavior, or perhaps influenced by Mm -hmm. the whisperers of the Rephaim locked away in Sheol through some sort of possession, medium, or necromancy. Well, the, the the fact that the that a third option is excluded from Scott's description leads me to wonder if he has read Unseen Realm, because in Unseen Realm I go through the the various options of how this is approached. So that's the first element to my response. You know, go either go back and read Unseen Realm or, or, or read Unseen Realm. I think for this particular question, it'd be somewhere in chapters twenty three through twenty five, thereabouts, um, discussing the giant clans and whatnot. The, the way the question is worded also presupposes some things, uh, saying that, you know, again, as, assuming a global flood, okay, sure. Well, you can have a local or regional flood, but then he says, well, that's directed at the Nephilim anyway. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're losing the, the factor of the sea peoples uh, in this, which are part of the Nephilim heritage or inheritance um, and, and migrations and whatnot from other parts of, of the Aegean. So if if the if the flood again this is all this is all spitballing here because you know we don't know but if if the flood was regional in the sense that it's Mesopotamia you know and Canaan okay let's let's just you know widen it, widen it and all up into Asia Minor well you still have the Sea Peoples in the Aegean I mean they 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 do pretty well with water you know they they know how to build ships I mean it may not even reach that long I mean you, this is all speculative but you can you can see how and why people have opted for a local flood as part of a way to handle this. Of course, there's another view uh, for this that uh, Scott didn't mention, and I'm not going to mention it here because I mentioned it a lot before. And if you don't know what it is, please get on Scene Realm and read it. But, you know, you there there are ways to sort of approach this and, you know, come out, you know, on, on the other side of it. This is, it, it's an old question. Again, there are there are gaps in the way this question is asked that that provide again, trajectories for how to answer the question. So I, I think, again, for the sake of this podcast, I'll just, I'll just leave it there. I don't think it was just some sort of spiritual or, you know, possession or anything like that. Um, I think we'd, we'd see that described. If it was that, then everybody missed it. Everybody in the second temple period didn't get it. New Testament writers didn't get it. So I think that's probably not the best way to approach it. But again, one of these other things. Uh, let, let me well, let me just throw one more thing in. The, the bringing up Noah it also misses a, a detail. What about Noah's family? I mean, they're already there. You know, it, it, it is possible to read Noah, you know, as quote unquote carrying, you know, the gene or something like that. I mean, you don't you don't have to you don't have to read the passage like Noah is pristine or one of one of you know his the wives of one of his sons or you know something like that. I mean, there, there's always a way to get somebody in there. You know, to, to do it that way, you know, to argue the case that way. But I, I don't think for a minute that they're thinking, you know, genetics and biology, you know, like, like we think of it. I mean, they are thinking about, you know, lineal inheritance and, and genealogy in that respect. But I don't think we should be spending one second, you know, worrying about or wondering about or caring about this whole Genesis 6 question when it comes to people today. Because the scripture has these lines cut off in the time of David, period. I also think that that's the reason why it's useless and, and I think wrong to talk about Nephilim, you know, coming back in the end times and all that sort of stuff. Now, having said that, 
again, there there is a way to to justify at least the kernel idea uh, from Genesis six four. Again, that's it's a grammatical argument. You can read Unseen Realm for that. But I think if Matthew wanted us to think that, he actually would have quoted. Isn't this a novel idea? If Matthew wanted us to think of the Nephilim of Genesis 6 in Matthew 24, it probably would have been a good idea for him to quote the passage. He doesn't. You compare the the Greek of Matthew with the Greek of of the Septuagint in Genesis 6, they do not match. Okay, he, does, he is not quoting the marrying and giving in marriage language of Matthew is not drawn in Greek from Genesis 6. That would have been a really good opportunity for Matthew to do that if that's what he was really thinking. But he doesn't, and so I would say that isn't what he's thinking. I mean, there are other reasons to not go down that road as well as far as what Matthew was thinking and not thinking. But we'll just leave it there again. We're trying to uh, abbreviate here. Yvonne has a question. I am a homeschooling mom and would like to know if you can recommend any biblical curriculum, books, or other resources that would help me teach an uh, elementary level kid the divine counsel biblical worldview, or should I just hope to teach him Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek someday? <laughs> well, r- regardless, yes, you should teach him Hebrew and <laughs> Greek. No, you don't you don't have to learn, you know, the ancient languages to get the a grasp of the divine counsel worldview. I mean I, I would say you know, I, I would hope, you know, you could start with something like What Does God Want? And it's a very basic book and then graduate to Supernatural when he's a little older and then Unseen Realm when, you know, he's a little older than that. Uh, again, you don't have to be able to read Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic to read those books and, and grasp the worldview. But anyway, uh, the, the worldview is not synonymous with exegetical details and skills. I mean, uh, you can... You know, most of the people who've read Unseen Realm, I would I would venture to guess, are are not proficient in the biblical languages, but it's it's all there. You can get it. Um, for the little kids, we have one big family. You know, we we've sort of started down this road of 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 having you know books you know for little kids. Uh, there are a couple more things you know that are, are going to be become part of that picture in the future. You know, Lord willing, uh, that we've that we've had presented to us. So. Things for kids, you know, young people like youth groups. We even have, we've had someone since the conference uh, submit uh, an Advent book, taking un- the content of Unseen Realm and creating an Advent book, which I, I'm actually pretty excited about, you know, for next year. So there are things, you know, that, that we will help bring into reality, you know, for, for uh, listeners and people who you know, have read the other stuff, you know, who follow the content. So we'll, we'll help you a little bit with that. But as far as, transmitting the divine council worldview, I would say just generally, you know, focus on big concepts like imaging God. That's a big deal. Analogies between God's heavenly and earthly families, analogies between, you know, the heavenly host and how they partner with God and how we partner with God, the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. You don't, you don't need, the, you don't need to, to do the languages, you know, for that or even really, you know, extra books. I mean, you get a, you get the help when you can get it, but, um, Hopefully, you know, there's a, there's enough in those in the three that I mentioned. What does God want? Supernatural and unseen realm. They're they're deliberately tiered. One thing leads to the uh, to the other to the next, and so um, we're we're trying to make that possible. But hopefully, you will see other things you know that that we can put out to the audience that will make that even more helpful. But don't get discouraged. Just do what you can and keep repeating the process. Angel has a comment. It has made a great whole lot impact. Thanks for what you do, guys. We are confident that the Lord is behind all of this. Hashtag the Naked Nation. There you go, Naked Nation. (laughs) Uh, I need to get on those shirts about Naked Nations, the old stuff uh, that we used to talk about. So uh, we need to do that. All right. Freaky has, I hope I say that right. Um, Is there any correlation or connection between Gideon and his 300 men versus King Leonidas and his brave 300. Same question on Samson and Hercules. And if the events are connected in some way, are the pagan versions manipulated copies, or are the biblical events reversals on the pagan versions? Yeah, I don't think there's a connection between Gideon and, and uh, Leonidas. I mean, the, the events of you know Sparta at, at Thermopylae are, are going to post-date the the Gideon events and the Gideon story, even if the story's written later, the 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 Greek stuff's going to come after that. 
I, I think the question is a little different when it comes to Samson and Hercules. I think there are some some elements of of older Greek material that do have touch points uh, with Samson, and basically, I you know this isn't an episode where we can get into it. We actually need an episode on that, so I'll put that on on my list. I think that that is a little bit different. Um, as far as the connections, a, a lot of this, I mean, you got to there there are whole books. West's book, the, the East Face of the Helicon, is is the monster book for this. Um, that show that the Greek, you know, mythological stories, the the origin stories, you know, of, of civilization, you know, in ancient Greece, uh, the way they tell that, a lot of those elements are actually drawn from the ancient Near East. And, and, and since the biblical material is so closely related to the ancient Near East, you're going to get this conceptual overlap. And in that sense. You're going to have a mixed bag when it comes to the, the chicken or egg question. You know, some of the biblical material is going to be before the Greek materials, and sometimes it's going to work the other direction. So, it it when it comes to the to the Greek stuff, you, you can't have you're not going to be able to have always this neat chronology. And even even if it was, I mean, they're they're telling origin stories. They're telling you know how you know how the world came to be. They they might have a memory of a flood, and and again, you know, just religious elements, you know, theological elements, you know, to, to how they look at the world and different people groups and whatnot. So since you have this cross-fertilization, we'll call it, uh, or, or this, this developmental path from the ancient Near East, and, and, the, and the Bible is, is mixed in with that, it should not surprise us that there are going to be similarities, probably for different reasons, because the, the Bible, you know, biblical writers are doing polemic with the the literature and the ideas, whether they're just verbal or, or written, of their own day, to to do theology, you know, to to teach people, you know, about these these sorts of things. So we we shouldn't we shouldn't be surprised that occasionally you're going to actually get an overlap with ancient Greek material and an Old Testament material. Of course, New Testament, you know, that that's a little more uh, obvious, you know, as to how that would work chronologically. But it's going to happen a little bit, you know, in the Old Testament as well. Uh, for for those reasons, so uh, again, biblical material is largely uh, polemic. You know, some of it is just you know worldview stuff, uh, but it's largely polemic. The, the chronology is not always neat, so you can't say you, you can't sort of make a blanket statement about you know how this would work. But as far as the specifics of the Leonidas thing, now I I really don't think there's much going on there. But again, the Samson Hercules question is a little bit different. So you know, Lord willing, in the future we'll devote an episode to that. Did you see the movie 300? I have not seen it. Oh I've gosh, seen Mike. This is spot clips off. of it. Uh, oh, yeah, I know. I've, 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 I've heard that line. Yeah, and I've, I've seen the line? t-shirt, too. <laughs> this is Yeah, you know, spot where, where, remember when we were in Greece, you know, in yeah. Athens, they had those shirts all over the place, you know. Oh, so, yeah, true. I knew where it was from. There you go. All right. Well, Freaky also has a comment real quick. He got a spiritual hunger about four years back. And it was referred to episode 86 of the podcast, which is the head covering episode. Uh, I was hooked and have listened to every episode, and in most cases, more than once. I have also bought and read most of Mike's books and deepened my understanding of the Bible to a place where I have a need to teach. Big was my surprise when I realized a lot of people are as hungry as I mm -hmm. was. So good. Yep. All right. Good. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's exactly what I want to see happen. That, you know, the whole paying it forward thing. That's what you that's that's the only way this works, you know. You can have podcasts, you can have YouTube channels and all that sort of stuff, but it takes the audience. You know, it doesn't really grow in a, in a in a meaningful way, you know, beyond just numbers. It doesn't really it doesn't spread, let's put it that way, without the audience. People have to get engaged and and want to want to help somebody out that they know. You know, it's just to understand Scripture better. That's just, that's the way it is. Josiah cannot find many scholars who agree with your view on the image of God. Is this view controversial in academia? No, it's not. It's not at all controversial. So I don't. I don't know where Josiah is looking. <laughs> I'd say how many have you? How many scholars have you looked at? Um, there are a good number who who take this position and in, included in commentary discussion. Um, so it's no, it's not controversial at all. You know, the idea of representation is actually very common. 
All right, Mike wants to say a quick thank you for your efforts in making the heavy scholarship material accessible, comprehensible, and practical for all of us who are called to be teachers, mentors, disciples, and pastors. It has helped me not be ashamed of my drive for content, and I am grateful for it. So, awesome. Good. Yeah. All right, Lynn. Absolutely. Wants to know, what other books do you recommend for the non-scholar but deep Christian who understands the spiritual worldview you communicate? Yeah, this is actually a, a difficult question because the real answer is this is why I write the books. Um, I, I spend my time writing, or not writing, but I spend my time reading scholarly material. I, I don't I don't read really any any popular books on angels or demons. They're just they're just not worth the time. Um, because they don't engage the text. So what what I spend my time doing is I read peer reviewed material. I read journal articles, you know, I read, you know, the, the high end stuff. And then I try to transmit that to the person who doesn't have, have access, you know, to like scholarly journals and all that kind of stuff. So this this is what we do. This is just fundamentally what we do. And for that reason, it's really hard for me to recommend a book that you just, you know, get off Amazon like it does that because they, they don't. Uh, this is why we do what we do. Now, there are – I'm going to mention a few that if you read them, they're not going to be at the level, you know, in terms of, of the worldview, you know, kind of stuff uh, that, that Unseen Realms at or Angels or the, the Demons book, you know, when that comes out. Because especially the Demons book, that's going to be unique. Uh, to, to anything ever ever published, only because you know I, I approach the the problem of or the issue of the powers of darkness from the perspective of the three rebellions. No one does that. Okay, that happens in scholarly literature and dissertations. Nobody has published a book like that. So th- that's part of the problem. But again, having listed out all those caveats, uh, C. Fred Dickinson for many years, Angels, Elect, and Evil. This was the standard book. If you if you went to Bible college or seminary and you had a course on that included angels and demons, you're going to read Dickinson's book. It's, I mean, it it's good, but it's English Bible based. I, mean, I don't I don't know any other way to put it. it. It's not trying to contextualize these topics in in terms of the ancient world. It just doesn't. It's English Bible based, but there there's still you know good stuff in it. So that's an accessible book. Um, but th- it, that's what it is. Uh, Clinton Arnold's book, Three Views on Spiritual Warfare, I think is good. I think Arnold is, is really on the right track there. So there, there's one topic you know, within this larger you know, picture, a, a book that's very accessible and readable. And Clinton Arnold is a good scholar, and he's, he's doing something intentional there for the lay community. It's, it's good, but it's limited. It's just about the spiritual warfare question. Uh, Stephen Knowles' book is a little more academic flavored angels of light and the powers of darkness thinking biblically about angels satan and principalities he's got a couple pages that includes the divine council you know which is nice because a lot of these books don't you know the older ones so th- this is a book that you could read and get get some you know good nuggets good details out of it but none of them are are at the detail level of unseen realm or the drill down books angels of demons that's why i feel like i'm supposed to produce them but there are things out there that are worthwhile. And, and these things I've just mentioned are, are definitely worthwhile. So this is actually, it, again, it's a tough question because, you know, I don't, I don't spend any time reading, <laughs> I hate to put it this way, reading normal books. <laughs> you know, I am reading dissertations. I'm reading journal articles because I view it as my task to take that material and make it decipherable to, to you guys, you know, to, to the audience here. So they're just, there isn't much that does that, so it's really hard to recommend anything. But again, with those caveats in mind, there are I just gave you you know three three titles there that are definitely worthwhile you know to, to pick up. But just realize what they are, and they're they're some sometimes they're focused, they have limitations and whatnot. Chris was just wondering when church images began to emerge, like murals and statues. Was paganism part of the of its beginning? Yeah, I, I don't. I really don't know. This is a church history question. I'm not a church historian. Uh, I can tell you though that images of angels are very old. Um, you know, it, with and we're talking about here within the believing community. You know, obviously, you know, you're going to have 
in the pagan community, you're going to have images of things. I mean, if, if it's a thing in heaven like cherubim, well, that goes back to the biblical period because you have cherubim in the temple on top of the ark, you know, and so on and so forth. But this is something a little wider, obviously, this question. Um, if, you, if you're looking at something like, you know, murals or uh, the, the, the thing that – the example that pops into my head are zodiac mosaics, like in Jewish synagogues. And these are all like 4th, 5th, 6th century and, and, and later. So late antiquity. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to have icon – you know, images in, in you know, the, the Eastern Roman Empire, you know, Byzantine. Uh, again, late antiquity is going to be the period. So uh, that, chronologically, that's about the best I can do. I mean, in the Zodiac mosaics, you actually even have depictions of God uh, in human form. The one I'm thinking of is uh, God in, in his heavenly chariot, which, and, and it uses, this is a Jewish synagogue, it uses uh, Sol Invictus, uh, you know, the conquering sun imagery, you know, for, for how... Um, how you know sort of the imagery that pagans would have used, but but in this case it's the it's the God of Israel that, that that they're using it for. You say, well, how in the world could that appear in a synagogue? You know, when they have the commands about not making a graven image. Well, they didn't consider it a graven image because they're not worshiping it. A, and it's not an idol; it's just a picture. So they they looked at pictures differently. They're tr- they're still transmitting correct theology about Yahweh. He is the the one who made the sun and the constellations. I mean, no no other deity did that. So they're they're still you know transmitting you know good theology through it, but that that's the thing that pops into my head about at least images of God uh, being pretty early you know again late antiquity I think is is the evidence we have for that. But ultimately I'm not I'm not a church historian, so I couldn't I couldn't tell you when the kind of thing that you'll see occasionally in a synagogue when that sort of moved over into the churches. I, I don't know. All right, Wayne has a comment here. He says, keep up the good work. I am a late comer to the podcast up to number 240 and really like the content. I've also read Unseen Realm, you reversing Mount Hermon. As a truck driver, I can say the podcast has been a feast while running the highways. All right. There you go, Mike. <laughs> good. I love, I love, truckers are awesome. Man. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I could be a trucker. I, I, yeah. I would love that. Just sit there, listen I, to the podcast or coast to coast or something late at night, just cruising. See, that, that's, that's why I like it too. Cause I, like I, I did the late night paper routes, you know, and I like to drive and, you know, road yeah. trips and you get to listen to stuff. So yeah, I, yeah, I'm into that too. All right. Terry wants to know prior to Abraham, was Yahweh worshiped by other polytheistic people groups? Was he referred by them as a God of war? Oh, this is something, you know, I've, I've talked about probably in other Q and A's, um, you know, every, every civilization had a God of war. Okay. But there, there's no, there's no evidence that Yahweh was part of a pantheon that is non-Israelite. And, and I think the easy reference here is DDD, uh, dictionary of deities and demons. Uh, and I, I quote, this passage, like on the on the website for more unseen realm, uh, extensively because I get this question a lot. I, th- I think you might also even find it on on my homepage on the blog at, at some point because again this comes up a lot. But I'm just going to read a few sentences here. This is DDD Dictionary of Deities and Demons uh, in the Bible. The uh, the entry on Yahweh is by Carol Vander Torn, who is nowhere near you know evangelicalism. Okay. He says, outside Israel, Yahweh was not worshipped in the West Semitic world. And then he goes into, you know, claims that it was and basically dismantles them. Uh, another sentence, Yahweh was not known at Ugarit either. The singular name U, Y-W, or Yao, vocalization is actually unknown. In a damaged passage, the Baal cycle cannot convincingly be interpreted as an abbreviation for Yahweh, the divine name. So he discusses that. He writes elsewhere, the earliest West Semitic text mentioning Yahweh, except for the biblical stuff, is the Victory Stella written by Misha, the Moabite king from the 9th century BC. This is the Moabite stone. Uh, So he mentions it, but Yahweh, again, is is the deity of Israel. But there you have the name in it, and that's the earliest West Semitic text that even mentions the name. 9th century, so the 800s BC. Uh, further on, he says, uh, da, 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 let's see, the, the absence of references to a Syrian or Palestinian cult of Yahweh outside Israel suggests 
that the god does not belong to the traditional circle of West Semitic deities. The origins of his veneration must be sought for elsewhere. Now, here he, he starts to get into Edom and, Mid- and Midian. So Edom and Midian. A number of texts suggest that Yahweh was worshipped in southern Edom and Midian before his cult spread to Palestine or Canaan. And, and here he's referencing things like we've talked about in the podcast in relationship to the location of Sinai with the Exodus. So those episodes, the, the march from the south passages that link, you know, Seir and Edom and Moab and so on and so forth. And lo and behold, the descendants of Abraham are there. Ooh, who'd have, who'd have suspected that? Uh, again, so it's not non-Israelite points of origin. These are, these are sites, these are places connected in some way with the descendants of Abraham still. Now, van der Torn goes on, there are two Egyptian texts that mention Yahweh. In these texts from the 14th and 13th centuries BCE, Yahweh is neither connected with the Israelites nor his, is his cult located in Palestine. So these are sort of, what they are, these are toponyms, uh, place names. So the texts speak about Yahu in the land of the Shasu Bedouin, uh, you know, something like that. So there, there are, they're either referring to places that bear the, the name or, you know, again, just a generic, the Shasu Bedouin. Again, this is just, these are generic references to, yeah, this is a deity worshipped over in these parts of the world that we've already, you know, talked about. You know, Palestine, Canaan, Edom, you know, Midian, that, the, these areas. Uh, and again, we, we discussed those in, in the Exodus series because those two texts can actually be dated uh, to either the early or the late date of the Exodus. Isn't that a wonderful coincidence? Uh, he, Van der Torn comments, in these tech, Egyptian texts, Yahu, YHW, is used as a toponym, yet a relationship with the deity by the same name is a reasonable assumption, so on and so forth. So, again, I'm, I'm just going to stop there and basically say, you know, you, you don't have Yahweh worshipped in a foreign pantheon. That's, that felt like the trajectory of the, uh, of the question. So, I would, I would just Google, you know, some of that. Maybe Yahweh and Ugarit, uh, Dictionary of Deities and Demons, you know, something like that, drmsh.com or un, moreunseenrealm.com, and you'll find the uh, a, a longer portion of the entry there. Timothy wants to know, one, what happened to casting out demons, and two, which Psalms in the Dead Sea Scrolls were for casting out demons? I don't understand the first part because demons still get cast out. So what, I don't, I'm not sure what he means by what happened to casting out demons. So I, maybe what happened to the demons? I can't take that. Out? I can't take that any further. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe what happened to the demons that did get cast out? The the, the Gadarene you know, account we know. Other accounts we're not told. So I yeah I, I I'm I'm not going to exegete the question because I'm probably going to be wrong uh, as to what what was really behind the question. The second part is a little easier. Uh, which Psalms in the Dead Sea Scrolls can were for casting out demons. The, the the best thing to look at here is episode 87 of the podcast. This was the episode where we talked about how the exorcism of demons uh, was part of the messianic profile. Again, and this is this is actually going to be traceable to a couple of Qumran texts. A one of the Qumran Psalms you know, and, and the language in one of the one of the the, the biblical Psalms that sort of made this part of the messianic profile that he would have power over demons. Let's just, let's just say it a little more generically like that, power over demons. Because uh, it has to, it depends on how you take certain words in the psalm of, about uh, spells and whatnot. Again, having, having power over the powers of darkness. Uh, and incidentally, this is another element, you know, for those out there, and this is common even in, in evangelicalism, you know, th- this notion that the demonology of the New Testament is foreign to the Old Testament. It depends how that question is framed. If you're asking, well, is the demonology of the New Testament articulated in the Old Testament? Well, the answer is no, in, in many respects. You know, they're, you know, it's just not spelled out. If you're asking, though, on the other hand, are the data points that are used by Second Temple Jewish writers and New Testament writers to articulate demonology and a theology of Satan, are those data points that they use, can they be found, maybe not together, but disparate data points for all that in the Old Testament? The answer is yes. And, and you won't find a lot of people say that 
or pursue it. Again, this is why the Demon's Book, when it comes out, and yes, I'm as frustrated as you are, because for me, this is 18 months that this thing's been written, but let me, let me try to contain myself here. When that book comes out, it'll be, again, it's going to be unique. It's going to be unique. So yes, buy it, distribute it, you know, market it for me. I mean, just get it out there because th- this is going to be a different book. My view is that while you don't have something like this, this is a good example. Where in the world do New Testament writers get this idea that the Messiah can cast out demons? Why, when Jesus runs around doing this, why, oh yeah, that, that's, yeah, he's son of David. There he is, right there. You know, you, you, go, you look back in the Old Testament and you wonder, well, where's that at? Because we don't see demons being cast out in the Old Testament, and we don't. So how did they get it? And most of the most of the scholarly world are, oh, this is just foreign. There's something invented. Is a new I no no okay? It, it's new in terms of the way it's articulated, and and the development that it gets. But the data points are in your Bible, because Second Temple writers, you know what they're doing? They're not sitting there at their desks wondering what kind of stuff they can make up, so that their people read it. They're trying to. They're writing about. The Old Testament, they're writing about their Bible. They're doing what scholars do today. They're looking at the sacred text, and they're doing exegesis. They're writing about the Hebrew Bible. They're looking at the, at the data points, and they're asking, well, how do these things fit together? I mean, I see these data points here, and I'm like, like, what do we do with that? What does it mean? How do we think about it? Let's noodle the problem. That's what they're doing. They're not inventing things out of whole cloth. They're not sitting there wishing, oh, I wish I had a better grasp of Zoroastrianism, you know, so I could, I knew what to write here. And again, I'm not saying that, that, you know, Zoroastrian isn't a context for something. Okay. I'm not completely divorcing that, but the notion that they have to use that or some other pagan source as a pool from which to get data to write something is not true. The data points are in their Bible. And so, again, this, this is a good illustration of this. And, and this is what distinguishes me, again, from other even Old Testament or Second Temple or New Testament writers. I think a lot of scholars in the evangelical world are too quick to bail on the question. They're, they're, they're not quick enough to really think about even asking the question, well, are, are the nuggets that form this thing in the New Testament, can they be found in the Old? Where would they get that? Yeah, and the answer is, yeah, they can. They really can. Again, the, where, where, where these trajectories you know, end in the Second Temple, and the New Testament's part of the Second Temple world, so this is why the New Testament writers will pick up on Second Temple material, because it's part of their world. It's part, it's part of what, what, what they're reading. They're reading this stuff. And again, under, the, the, under Providence, it's useful. A lot of it's useful to articulate you know, things about demons and Satan and so on and so forth. This is why there's similarity. But at the end of the day, what those writers are doing is they're looking at their Hebrew Bible. They're trying to, to, to struggle with the Hebrew Bible, the data of the Hebrew Bible, trying to answer questions based upon, you know, what, what they find there. And, you know, it, it's not, honestly, that this isn't like a rocket science kind of thing. But I, I'm, I'm glad this question came up because it, it, again, is a good illustration you can have scholars that just look at a question and look at what, what basically everybody has said at that point, and they don't probe the answer sufficiently. They think it's a settled issue. And, and I'm just not prone to do that. I'm just not prone to do that. If there are things about the answer that are unsatisfactory, if, if, if there's some reason to wonder, well, how does that make good sense? You know, just putting yourself in, in their world, boots on the ground, you know, kind of thing. How would this make good sense? I, you know, that's just, I can't help it. That's just how my mind works. And, and so I will, I'll think about it. I will, I will be willing to think about it. And, and I'll be willing to say, you know, I don't know, but I'm still thinking about that. Rather than just say, oh, here's the answer. Because this is like what everybody else says. And I'm not saying I, I, I may not end up there, you know, if I, if I exhaust something, well, okay, that, that, that does look like the best answer. But in many cases, it, it, it isn't. And so this is, again, what we try to do. But this is a wonderful illustration about this, where somebody, again, some scholar could look at the Old Testament, the New Testament, and say, no, that's, that's, that's just not in there anywhere. Well, then how did they get the idea? 
because they never question it. The casting out of demons actually is part of the messianic profile. And it, it's not anywhere overtly. It's key word, overtly, in the Old Testament. So where are they getting it? And it's not satisfactory, you know, to me anyway, and it wasn't to them, you know, a little, you know, just to, to sort of advertise here. It wasn't satisfied to them to, to just sort of sit there and make something up. They're not going to do that about Messiah. They're not going to get information about Messiah from a pagan source, you know, like, like, oh, we don't have this data point anywhere. So, you know, the profile is incomplete or oh, we'd like to give them another superpower here. So let, let's go to, you know, no, that's not what they're doing. It's not what they do with anything else. Why would they do it here? So again, my little little commercial for the Demons book, you know, when it comes out, there again, this is a good question. I, this topic's kind of close, you know, to me because I just think it ought to make sense. <laughs> you know, pardon my naivety, pardon my 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 view of providence here, but I just think the thing ought to make sense. So you know, that's where I'm at. Seems like Jesus did it, and that's the end of the story. Yeah, but and. and why would they why would they associate that? I mean, if it wasn't part of the messianic profile based upon their own sacred scripture, I mean if if it wasn't in there, you would think when Jesus did the, does this and start, ah, oh, look at this, kingdom of God has come, watch the demons fly, okay? They'd look at him and go, Are you nuts? This isn't part of what Messiah does. You just invalidated yourself, dude. But that's not what they do. That is not what they do. And there needs, I'm sure there's a reason that they don't do it. And there is. So again, it's a good illustration. We'll be looking for that book uh, someday, Mike, someday. You, you say you wrote a book, but I don't know if I you know. did. Or, 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 <laughs> I, don't, I don't see it anymore. Oh, so. uh, yeah. Uh, I know. I know. All right, know. All right. Dylan. It's a, would, it's, it's a tragedy. <laughs> uh, Dylan would like to know what is going to happen after Dr. Heiser finishes going through every book of the Bible. Thank you guys so much for your ministry. It has helped me and those around me very much. Well, Dylan, we ain't going to get through all the books of the Bible. <laughs> yeah. You should have started yeah. 60 That isn't going to happen. Uh, not yeah. at all. And, then, and then the end will come, world without end. Oh, man, you know, it just, it, it's just, that's not going to happen. Right. No way. But we do, uh, we will take a break from the Bible after Exodus and, uh, You've got some uh, pretty neat content to cover after that, right? Yeah, I, yeah. But yeah. so. yeah. we, we have plenty of topics. You know, we we we've, we've actually gotten like two or three here. You know, that we need to drill down on. So that's not going to be a not going to be a problem. All right, Jamie has a comment here. I want to read this. This is pretty good, Mike. Uh, I would like to leave an exhortation for you and the whole team. So here we go. For the first four, almost five years of my marriage, I watched my husband get pulled into a world that seemed to not only drag us both down, but caused us pain in him to pull away from God. I understand the false argument of being raised in the church and already knowing everything. We both were raised in the church and knew a lot, but we used that to defend ourselves from needing anything deeper. Long story short, my husband found the name of your podcast. And our lives have been changed ever since. My husband has had a revival in his heart to learn more and has challenged me to learn more. And that has made our marriage stronger and our family happier. Thank you for challenging us to go deeper, to look for more, to read really what's there and to understand the Bible and not just listen to the stories. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's, that's why we do it. Yeah, absolutely. That right there. You know, I mean, that's what that's what drives the bus right there. Hundred percent. All right, Derek wants to know the best way to understand okay. biblical tongues and recommend resources for it. Well, you know, for for me personally, uh, I think it's very clear in Scripture that tongues are known languages. Uh, you know, for I, I'm in the cautious but open category. So if, to me, when you have the same context today as you did in the New Testament, in other words, people aren't going to get Scripture. They're not going to get the gospel any other way. I think God can do this. I mean, I I know missionaries that were in tight spots and somehow were able to speak the language of that they needed to speak, you know, at the moment, either to do ministry or get out of a real jam uh, that, and that had never studied it, didn't, didn't know a word of it. So, I, I mean, this, this kind of thing does happen. So I look for a similar context to the New Testament and, and known languages, but th- those, are, those are the two rules of thumb. 
Um, I, I know people do the, the prayer language thing. I, I have to be honest, it, it, that never made sense to me, but I don't pick at it. Uh, if that's something that draws people to the Lord more closely, well, that, that's a good thing. Um, it didn't make sense to me because God knows every thought of your mind anyway, so why do you need a special language for it? Um, God knows already. But if it helps you, again, the practice helps you. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it too much. Um, I would suggest as far as just sort of getting the lay of the land for the kinds of things that need to be thought about. Uh, the book, Our Miraculous Gifts for Today, Four Views. Uh, this is a, I think it's Zondervan that put this out. It's it's fairly old. I mean, it's been around probably 20 years. But uh, it's a good book to to give you, again, an overview and then responses of all the other authors to the other views on on this issue. So our miraculous gifts for today, you know, four views, I think is a good good resource. Brad would love to hear Mike's thoughts on the agrarian nature of Genesis 2 and following and our archaeological evidence of early humans, Adam types, as using stone tools and being hunter-gatherers. Is Adam picked like Abram was? Genesis as theological polemic treatise without the historical? A bit of both? Up to 4% of Neanderthal DNA is in some populations today. Yeah, I I would say... Genesis and the writers has nothing to do with Neanderthal. I mean, their writers aren't thinking about Neanderthals, you know. So, I, I don't, I don't see that as as germane to the question. Uh, the the rest of the question, though, I, I do think you know is is uh, you know worth thinking about. I mean, when it comes to scripture, you know, metallurgy is is credited you know to the era before the flood. So prior to that, well, they they would be using non metallurgically created tools. So we would expect, you know, that people would be using stone tools. So using a stone tool doesn't mean you're a Neanderthal. You know, it, it, there are primitive tribes in the Amazon today that are completely cut off and civilized and are uncivilized, you know, by our terms. And they use stone tools, but does that make them Neanderthals? Well, you know, of course not. You know, it, so the, these these two things often get discussed in tandem, and they may or may not be related. Um, again, just just the, the mere use of a stone tool doesn't say that everybody was a Neanderthal or, or make any comment on you know the Neanderthal genome and the Homo sapiens genome and all that sort of stuff. So I, again, that's I think that's the, the the quick way to do it. I don't I don't see you know, the the content of the early chapters of Genesis divorced from history. Uh, I, I, they're not trying to. They're not trying to do science. I, I, you know, I've said that many times. They're not trying to make. You know, they're not trying to articulate science itself. And I, I think you know, even despite that, though, that we are dealing with things that did occur. Okay, so there, the there, there are events. I mean, there, there was a first, you know, human pairing in my mind. I mean, I, I realize that some evangelicals don't like that because, oh, the genetic data takes says that there had to be a couple hundred pairs instead of just one, blah, 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 blah. So in other words, it depicts what, what we'd have, the conditions we'd have after a flood. Is that what you're saying? You know? So I, again, that, that, that's a bit of a jab that I, I think, you know, we, there are people who retroject the science back too early and, and they don't, and they kind of miss what it might point to that's actually part of the scriptural narrative anyway. But I, you know, at the end of the day, I don't, I don't worry too much about these things because the enterprise of scripture is not to give us science. You know, yes, it's true that statistical genetics is in its infancy as a discipline. That's fair to say. Uh, the work that, like Pete Enns, you know, refers to to articulate his view of this has been criticized by other people in the statistical genetics field. It's not like immune from criticism uh, because it's, it's an, you know, it's, it's a discipline that's in, still in, in its early stages. So. And however it pans out, I'm, I'm fine with it because I don't I don't view uh, the articulation of science as being what God cared about when He prompted people to write books like Genesis. If He did care about it, God would have made better choices of writers. I mean, by definition, if He's picking someone in the second millennium BC, that person's not going to write content that is amenable or would satisfy a 21st century scientist. That just that, I can't think of many more things that are more obvious than that. So we let, let's honor God's choices. God must have had something else in mind that was the real concern for what he wanted written down. But that doesn't mean that it's divorced from things that actually happened. All right, a couple comments here. The first one's for Brian, and he says, First of all, you guys are great. 
I anticipate your podcast every week. I can't wait for it to drop to my podcast app. I purchased and read The Unseen Realm for myself and purchased Supernatural for my mom and sister to read. I teach an adult Sunday school class and I've begun to work in the divine counsel approach and our studies and minds are being blown by it. I've introduced it to some of my friends and they've begun to study it as well. The biblical worldview you guys present makes so many things click into place, not only in the biblical past, but also what is going on in the world right now. Thank you so much for all that you do. It is greatly appreciated. And more importantly, you guys are making a difference, Brian and Goodman, Missouri. So thank you, Brian. Yep. Thank you. Tom also says, Mike, your books and the podcast have led me into a deeper, freer, happier, and more meaningful relationship with the Lord. Thanks to you and Trey for all you've done for me by his leading. All right, Tom, there you go. Mm -hmm. All right, Laura, if a deceased loved one appears to you, is it a hundred percent for sure an evil spirit in disguise? Uh, No. Um, I think the, the the best thing for this answer would be uh, go to Google, put in drmsh.com, and put in the, the phrase "discerning the dead." Uh, that that will take you to the series I did, boy, years ago on the vocabulary for you know for uh, for lack of a better way to put it the uh, the 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 entities that exist or or are in the afterlife or the underworld because the, the short version here is that. You know, I, I think the terms like team the dead, refer to the spirits of human dead, spirits of people who have died. And that's different than evil spirits, evil non-human spirits. I think scripture actually does distinguish this. You know, if you're the dead, you would have had to have lived and then died. And you can't really say that about a non-human spirit. They don't die. Uh, so, I, again, the vocabulary is a bit different. And in that series, I talk about, you know, some of these, these sorts of things. So short answer is no, longer answer is, you know, what I just gave you. But ultimately, you know, just go to, D, go to Google, drmsh.com, and then discerning the dead, and you'll get a, a series that I think will, will be a little more helpful. All right. Kara has a comment here. She says, your show has really helped me to understand the theme of believing loyalty through scripture after spending about a year of being pulled into legalistic performance-based Christianity, where I never knew if my salvation was secure. After being suspicious for some time that the continual fear and stress I felt over my salvation didn't seem in line with the heart of God for his children. Your podcast was just what I needed to feel free to bury some misguided doctrine in the ground for good. It has felt like coming home again, and I can see the fruit of resting in the finished work of Jesus again in my life, no longer striving to be secure, but free to serve God from a thankful heart and see my sanctification as a gift and not the hinge and not the hinge on which my salvation hangs. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's, that's well said. Testimony. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right, Tom. Yep. 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 Tom. We'll wrap it up here, Mike. We got last question and one more comment. And Tom's question is, okay. what's it like being a celebrity among the Bible nerds? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, uh, I don't even know how to answer. I, I, I don't, I don't feel like a celebrity. You know, it just, I don't, I don't know what else, what to say. Cause it, it, for me to say it feels good or bad almost requires me to assume that it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you to do with that one. To it. Yeah. I, well, do you get recognized? I, yeah. I mean, I, it, before it's, the show, Mike, I have a question before the podcast. Did you get recognized when you, every time you went to ETS and SBL, would you get recognized more or less, you know, after the show started? Okay. That, all right. That, that, yeah, that, that's a fair way to put it. Um, no, I mean, it, like this last ETS SBL, I mean, I, I, I don't know, seven, eight times, you know, people would walk up, are you Mike? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that happens now. It, it didn't happen earlier. I've had, I've had people recognize me in airports twice, you know, and, and it's like, then it's just, it's just the voice. They overhear me talking or, or something like that. I, well, maybe it's, oh, I, I think in one instance it, it was me because of Skywatch or something like that. So yeah, it happens, but you know, I'm, I'm not a celebrity. I mean, when I think of celebrities, I'm thinking of people that have a, have difficulty living their lives, you know, just 
normal, you know, day to day things. So I, I don't, well, I don't he, think he about it. Uh, among the Bible nerds, so I mean, Bible nerds. So, so like if you put if you filled a, a room of Bible nerds, you know, yeah, I, I guess I, I guess that's fair. You know, I, I used to I'd tell my kids I'm nerd famous. So okay, yeah, I guess that fits. <laughs> nerd famous. <laughs> Good wording, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Perfect. yeah, there you go. We're going to end this with Richard. He says, thank you, Mike and Trey, for this podcast. The content is so vital to us Middle Earther, Earthers. And congratulations to 300 episodes of Getting Naked. There you go, Mike. Getting Naked 300 times. <laughs> so you, I, think, I think you planted that one. I, I think you planted that, that one. I didn't plan it, but I <laughs> made it last. That's for sure. <laughs> We still, okay. Still got to make the shirts and stuff. Says get naked and then Bible podcast. See, there's a great That's philosophical okay. question for because if you're wearing something, then you're not. Oh, never mind. Just forget no. it. What? No. I, I don't. I don't want to do any. I don't want to do anything to help you. So. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I don't need lots of help, Mike, as you've learned over these five <laughs> years. But that's it, Mike. I'll tell you, it was it was it was funny at Naked, at Naked Bible to hear Carmen Imes tell me about a conversation where she had to explain to someone that she was speaking at something called the Naked Bible. That was funny. Even yeah, um, I did get a laugh. Out of that. Even uh, the other day, uh, my wife's grandmother's here. She's like, "Why do you have to call it naked?" You know, she, after I explained <laughs> that, just why do you have to call it naked? Yeah, you know, just still. Yeah, well. That's the whole yeah. point. Yeah, but, it's um, just it's memorable. That's the point. All right, Mike. Well, any other thoughts? I got you a gift actually. Um, but since we weren't there in San Diego for the conferences, I you know I didn't give it to you. My should I be, like, should I be frightened? So, no, it's a good <laughs> gift. I got you a good gift for three hundred <laughs> episodes, and you owe me a party for the next time. Uh, we did a Q and A, Q&A. boy. It's over a hundred episodes ago uh, at this point. So even though it was quite a long time ago, you know, we have people listening to the podcast, you know, and going back and listening to old episodes. And there was a and a where a listener who goes by the name Slash uh, asked about whether Adam and Eve could poop. And I want to, I want to apologize for the way I responded to that because that, that one really you kind of, threw me for a loop. And I think I was a little too flippant. I, 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 I went back and read the transcript after I got this email because someone said, Hey, you know, you were just too, you know, you took that too lightly. So I went back and read the transcript and was like, yeah, yeah. I, uh, guilty as charged. And I was, I was too flippant with that question. And the more I thought about it, it's like, well, you know, it actually is a decent question, even though it was so unusual at the time. So I wanted to, to give a shout out both to the person who emailed me and also to uh, to apologize to Slash for not treating the question a little more seriously. So I wanted to throw that in before we even got started on our next Q and A, even though it was so long ago. Well, do you have any other uh, information how you would answer that differently? Uh, no, no, I no, I I would answer it the same way. Yeah. Um, it's just it was sort of the the manner in which it was treated. So you were kind of stinky. That's what you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're you're working on a bun there. I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I would great. I would answer it the same way, but it just, you know, I, it it it's one of those things because it's you know to use the big word, it, to you, it's it's scatological, and so it sort of lends itself again to to you know being treated in a less than serious way. But I I think I was a little overboard uh, on that. Well, if we're going to start apologizing every time you get grumpy, we're we're going to be here a while. <laughs> I wasn't grumpy. <laughs> I wasn't grumpy. It's just like, oh, I can't believe I got this question. I, you know, and I, and I, it was one of those things where I didn't I didn't think about it right away as to why the question was was being asked. But then when I got into it, I mean, people can go back and listen or, or get get the, uh, the the transcript. When I got into it, it's like, well, of, of course, this is why you know this question is being asked and. You know, it actually is a meaningful question, but it was just it was just so odd, you know, at the time. But again, I I I, I should have handled it better. So I'm I'm just glad that somebody brought it up, um, you know, to give me an opportunity to tell tell Slash that look, you know, you know that that was something I should have handled better. So that's what we're doing. All right, awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to apologize for since we're 
on the subject? Anything? No, no. no. What are, do you, are, are you? Are you? No, I got nothing in mind. I, feel, I was just I, I was saying. Now's the, say, now's the like chance to get it out. <laughs> now's the chance to get it out. I mean, yeah. Uh, so okay. you've turned like therapist now. Is that, <laughs> yeah. that your? Uh, <laughs> You that, or you've been waiting to throw something at me, you know? No, no, I'm but, uh, good. No, I'm good. Nothing, nothing's going no, off I, in my head. And to make amends, we actually have three questions from Slash. Actually, we didn't even plan for this. It just worked out this way, but uh, uh, kid you not. And the first one is, in the Old Testament, it is through human senses that one perceives God in the world. What range of verbs relating to the high senses is found in the Near Eastern writings in relation to the gods and their interactions with man? And what were the primary senses in the epistemic process? Well, for, first I'd have to know how Slash is defining high senses. I actually don't see much of a division. and I, the, My answer is going to stem from a guess as, as to how I think he might be defining high senses, but I don't actually know. I don't see a division of, of senses in perceiving God, but again, perhaps the division that he's suggesting is between cognitive processes like reason and intuition, maybe even dreams, since those happen in your head, and maybe tactile or sensory processes like sight and touch. Maybe that's what he means by higher and lower. I, I don't know. But all of them are at work uh, in the Old Testament in divine encounter, and they're all used by God. Uh, in the Old Testament. So, you know, same for the ancient Near Eastern literature. Uh, but I have to guess on the questions. Maybe I'm in the ballpark with what's being asked. I don't specifically know, but that's how I'm parsing it. Slash the second question has the word of the day. If they, men, had visions, <laughs> <laughs> did they have an angelic interlocutor that explains their meaning to them? How did they perceive the divine fully? Are there any recorded visible acts in history in the text that you study? Uh, so in, interlocutor is the word of the day. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they did. I mean, they, they had angelic mediation, angelic interpretation, um, you know, all that sort of thing. And you see that a lot in, in the Bible. Um, you, again, you also see it, you know, in, uh, you know, other literature as well, but especially, you know, in, in, in the Bible and the Old Testament. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I keep referencing the Old Testament because that was the the first part of the question when he mentioned ancient Near Eastern stuff. So, but it, you know, it's it's true in the New as well. So, you know, do, does perceive the divine refer to sensing presence, or does it refer to parsing information? In other words, what the person was told by the interlocutor. I'm I'm not sure again by the wording of the question. Um, so. Again, I'm, I'm just going to take a stab at this because I don't quite know. I don't know with precision what what is, is being asked, but I'm going to take a stab at it, take a guess here. Uh, I, I should throw one other thing that, that sort of makes me wonder, well, what are we really angling for here? The qualifier fully, you know, how do they perceive the divine fully is also ambiguous. You know, how, how full is full? You know, how, how much do I have to understand before I think I have a full understanding? Well, I don't know. But, you know, circling around here, if the question is asking, you know, how did they move beyond the interlocutor or did they move beyond the interlocutor or did they want to move beyond the interlocutor to see more in a vision or hear more from the ultimate source, God, you know, again, those, all of those things would, would be factors in how I would approach this. And I would say ultimately it depends on the text. It depends on the incident because they're not all the same, you know. I mean, they have the same motifs, but but you're going to get differences in these areas that I just sketched or just mentioned. So, for example, some texts, we'll just call them, you know, Jewish mystical texts or Merkava mystic texts for convenience. So some texts have the human participant moving through levels, okay, levels of divine access. And usually, I would say overwhelmingly with an escort. You know, whether they're an interlocutor or an interpreter or not, they, they, they typically have an escort. You know, other texts have the human involved being so paralyzed by the experience, he doesn't want to go to any more levels. <laughs> you know, it's like, let's just stop right here. So, you know, sometimes you get these levels and you get the, the, the sort of the wonderment that's increasing with, with greater access to the actual, you know, focus of the divine world, which is the presence of God. And other times it's like, 
let's just stop. Um, so it, it, it's a variable experience. There are all sorts of, uh, you know, other things going on. So, you know, talking about this, how, how do they sense or perceive the divine? Well, there, there's lots of things that happen in these sorts of episodes, these encounters or these visions or these dreams, again, whatever they are. So there are all sorts of visible acts. Uh, and I'm sort of playing off the, the question. I think it had the word actions in it. There are movements. I mean, the, the person and his escort can move from point A to point B. Use, you know, so sometimes they, they, they like fly there. Sometimes they're just sort of there. Um, you know, but there's, there's like motion. There's movement in, involved in some of these episodes. There are postures that are observed. Archangels doing something or positioned in a certain way. There are gestures that figures in the vision do, you know, in God included. And of course, you know, the, the, the heavenly host around him. There's worship. There's speech. There's sounds. There's even natural forces operating, you know, in the, in the divine world. Things like you, they hear the sound of wind or they see fire. They feel heat. They hear the sound of waters, you know. So there, there's lots of things going on. So it would just really depend on the, the particular episode or text in, in terms of how to answer the question. Interlocutor, a person who takes part in a dialogue or conversation. Yeah. There you go. There you go. All right. Slash also wants to know, was there a sight knowledge relationship between the gods and their people? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, part of what we just said factors into this. If if the knowledge of the divine world is mediated to people who sort of didn't go on the journey, you know, think of think of somebody like Enoch here, you know, he, he relates what happens to him or, or or the apostle John in the book of Revelation. So that would be non-physical, even though it's cast in physical terms in so many ways. Um, so the fact that those episodes, again, live in, in written literature, you know, it communicates to readers both physical things and non-physical things, but of course they're not experiencing them directly. So for them, it would be a, a non-physical, you know, experience. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, depending on who you are, both could be in play. I mean, certainly again, in the, in the Bible, ancient Near Eastern literature, there, there are stock patterns here uh, of the way these things work or the way these things sort of are described might be a better way to put that. Um, for, for those you know, slash, of course, and and anybody else who's listening to this, for those who are interested in this sort of thing, I'm, I'm just going to recommend a few books here. Um, I'm, I'm doing this because these are not on my recommended book list on my website, so this is you know more specific. And maybe I, maybe I'll put these there at, at some point. But if you want sort of a good academic overview of of the kinds of things that are in this question or that relate to this question, I would suggest a few. There's a book called The Origins of Jewish Mysticism by Peter Schaefer. Uh, there's one called Paradise Now, Essays on Early Jewish and Christian Mysticism. It's by April DeConnick. Uh, she's the editor for that. I'm, I'm sure she makes a contribution too. Be, be advised, you know, and, and again, this isn't a pejorative because April would be very warm to this, but she's a Gnostic. <laughs> Uh, but it, it, that, that's an excellent book. You know, again, it's a, it's a Society of Biblical Literature book. It was a symposium. There's another one called Flights of the Soul. The subtitle is Visions, Heavenly Journeys, and Peak Experiences in the Biblical World. It's by John Pilch. That's P-I-L-C-H. Another book called Death, Ecstasy, and Otherworldly Journeys. It's by John Collins. And lastly, there's one called The Three Temples. On the Emergence of Jewish Mysticism. That's by Rachel Elior, E-L-I-O-R. You may have heard me reference her name in other contexts on the podcast. Her book, The Three Temples, gets into a lot of, of what we would call astral theology in Jewish mysticism as well. It has a lot to do with calendar and celestial objects. And she dips a lot into the Enochian stuff. So she's, she's, she's kind of doing a a, a survey, a history of, you know, Old Testament on through the Enochian literature on into the New Testament of these sorts of things. But her book revolves around Merkava mysticism. Merkava is the word for the throne chariot, the divine throne, like in Ezekiel 1, or just the, you know, the throne, uh, throne of God, you know, described in other passages. That's what it means. So Merkava mysticism really gets its start in Ezekiel 1. Like, what in the world was it, you know, what, what was that all about? Well, there's lots of speculation, lots of mystical thinking 
about the meaning of that chapter and also even the, the, the meaning of the elements, four faces, the cherubim, all that kind of stuff. So it, it was a chapter that, that led to a lot of speculation. And there's a whole history of that, a whole history of interpretation. And since, hint, hint, uh, since Ezekiel 1, the, the, the four faces of the cherubim are the cardinal points of the zodiac, that actually meant something. It takes us into calendar. It takes us into constellations. You know, it takes it takes you to a lot of things. So, I'll mention that title last. The the other books that I mentioned before I got to Elior's book are really just about like heavenly journeys, these these visionary experiences, these encounters. You know, in that vein. Uh, but hers does some of that, but then it peels off into this other this other aspect of Jewish mysticism. So, if you wanted a really technical book. You have to be able to read Hebrew for this on Ezekiel 1, the, the throne chariot. Uh, there's probably nothing better than David Halperin, H-A-L-P-E-R-I-N, the faces of the chariot, early Jewish responses to Ezekiel's vision. That is a scholarly work, uh, very detailed, and you, you have to have the, the languages to deal with that. But um, those other books, again, you don't have to have training in the biblical languages to to get most of the content there. So I'd recommend those. All right. Kimmy from Anderson, South Carolina is puzzled by two themes, if you will, in judges one, the iron chariots preventing Israel from driving out the Canaanites, even though Yahweh was helping them still to win battles. This is making him appear weak, which we know isn't true. And number two, how they, the Canaanites, could be made slaves but not be driven out. To make a group into slaves requires conquering them, right? Or am I missing something? This is one of those questions that could be a whole episode. <laughs> um, I'm going to reference a few things here. I'm going to have to you know, reference a few things um, from, from judges. Like uh, I'll, I'll use Dan Block's you know, judges commentary. I, think, I can't remember which one it is, but um, this is – Gosh, Judges 1 is, is so involved. Uh, so many problems here. All right, well, let, me, let, me just, let me just start in with, pick off a few of the, of, of the little things here. I'm not sure why Kimmy would consider the Canaanites slaves. Judges 1 is pretty clear that there are a lot of Canaanites in the land that were not driven out of the land. And they aren't slaves to the Israelites or anybody else. I mean, they're fighting for their homeland in verses 4 through 8. In Judges one, they're under a king, uh, so I, I I don't I don't understand the characterization about slaves. But anyway, we'll we'll set that aside. Uh, the conquest, just generally, I mean, let's let's think about Judges one. What what the point of Judges one is? The conquest in terms of driving out all the inhabitants, of course, we know wasn't completed under Joshua, which is part of the point of Judges one. Basically, what where the failures were, what went wrong. Now, incidentally, again, you might recall that Joshua defined success earlier in the book of Joshua, Joshua eleven twenty two through 23, as there being no more unakim in the land, except for the ones that got away and went to the Philistine city. So, um, you know, in, in what sense has, has it been telegraphed even before we get to Judges 1? that the conquest is incomplete and what sense is it complete? You know, you, you have that stuff going on. Now that, that might seem like it helps, but in some respects it doesn't because Judges 1 is a long-standing historical problem in the conquest narrative overall. So one problem of several is that Judges 1 repeats, can I, this is important to catch, Judges 1 repeats events that have already happened in Joshua, specifically Joshua 15, which is after Joshua 11, incidentally. Uh, it repeats events that happened in Joshua 15, specifically the episodes with Caleb at, at Hebron and Devir, with the Anakim. You read about those things in Joshua 15, then you read about them again in Judges 1. But you can read those two things and it, it'll feel in Judges 1 like there's a slightly different outcome because of the matter of the chariots. 
And if you go back to Joshua 11, where Joshua made this this claim that, uh, yeah, there's no more Anakim in the land. Again, that, that's sort of his his victory statement. And I think that's important because I do think ultimately uh, the, the, the harem, the devote to destruction idea, is aimed at the giant clans. You, you, you all know that if you've read Unseen Realm. But if you go back to Joshua 11, the Israelites have no problem with the chariots there. It's Joshua 11, 1 to 9. But in Judges 1, the report is mixed. Okay. So, you know, how, how do we, what's going on here? You've got a repetition of accounts. You've got slightly different, uh, you know, outcomes in these accounts. You've got, oh, it's finished in Joshua 11, but it's not finished because Joshua 15, they're still fighting, you know, Anakim. And then that gets repeated in Judges 1. I mean, it, it's a mess, right? You, you look at it and you think, just as an English reader, this is, this is a mess. So you need, you know, some sort of, you know, how, scholars have, have approached this, you know, any number of times. And there are ways to sort of understand why things are presented the way they are presented that, that help. They may not you know, help in, in every respect, but they do help. So I want to, you know, go to Block's uh, commentary here. And he has a long discussion of, of these problems. And I'm just going to cherry pick a little bit of it. Um, and I will try to, at the end of the episode, I'll try to give you the actual source. I think it's his, well, he's done a couple of these commentaries, so I don't want to guess here, but I'll, I'll, I'll just look it up quick when we get through this. But as far as what Block says, he, he kind of introduces the whole, um, you know, the whole problem with Judges chapter one by, by giving us an overview before he even gets into the actual text itself. He does this in sort of an overview. Uh, I think this is the New American Commentary. So he says, first, although it is generally recognized that Judges 1 is dependent on the narrative account of the conquest of Canaan found in Joshua 13 through 19, our text summarizes, recasts, and continues the story of the process of Israel's taking possession of the land of Canaan. And in so doing, the form adopted resembles that of an Assyrian summary inscription of a military campaign. In such documents, events are not arranged chronologically, but they are arranged according to geography. Okay, so that's a point to hold on to. Skip a head to, um, in block. It does indeed begin, again, Judges 1 begins with a chronological note highlighting the fact that after the death of Joshua, Judah was the first tribe to attack the Canaanites. However, it is impossible to construct a chronology of the conquest from this chapter. You're going to find out why as we proceed. One may conclude, therefore, that the present document is not intended as a corrective to the normative narrative found in Joshua, but as a summary of Israel's fortunes after the death of Joshua, without which the theological narratives that follow in, in the book of Judges would lack historical context. And he raises another point. Second, in order for the order in which the fortunes of individual tribes are presented is deliberately geographical. So again, we're focused on geography, not chronology. Third, Block says, and again, he has long discussions of each of these points. I'm just pulling the points out. Third, although the document reports the fortunes of individual tribes, as in the rest of the book, the author is concerned about the nation of Israel as a whole. So let's not get too fixated on the tribes. Fourth, although the author is concerned about all Israel, he expresses special interest in the Judahite experience, you know, what, what's happening with the tribe of Judah. Not only does he delight uh, the pride of place, or not only does he highlight the pride of place given to Judah, in the tribal conquests after the death of Joshua, but fully one half of the chapter, verses 3 through 20, is devoted to the accomplishments of this tribe, Judah. Furthermore, two of the three anecdotes, verses 5 through 7 and verses 12 through 15, add interesting details concerning the conquest of two significant cities, Jerusalem and Hebron, respectively. The narrator's emphasis on the positive achievements of Judah, I catch this point, which contrast with the reports of the failures of most of the other tribes, is often interpreted as a tendentious effort to glorify Judah and to lessen the stature of the northern tribes. 
However, this interpretation fails to take seriously enough the implicit criticism of Judah. He, I'll just stop. He's saying, look, if you look at what's, what's going on in Judges, especially chapter 1, Judah is held up. Judah has this special interest, and the, and the other tribes, and they're basically the northern tribes, you know, are, are basically just, they only, it only focuses on their failures, whereas Judah, Judah get, you know, gets a lot of success language, but, but Block says, yeah, you know, it gets some criticism too, so let's not forget that. And then he adds here, the same presence of Yahweh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me just skip down a little bit. Uh, okay, he comments on the chariots problem. He says, most seriously, you know, the criticism of Judah is given for failing to take the lowlands because of the Canaanites' technological superiority. Verse 19, this is the reference to the chariots that the, you know, Kimmy had brought up. The same presence of Yahweh that had provided victory in the highlands, verse 15, should have gone before Judah into the lowlands. After the conquest of a major city like Jericho, accompanied by Yahweh, in verse 15, Israel should have found no enemy too great. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 5 more or less says that. Accordingly, the attention and space devoted to Judah probably suggests no more than the author's Judahite citizenship and may, together with his description of pri the primary role of Ephraim among the northern tribes, point to a date of composition after the division of the kingdom. Seventh, the author has deliberately arranged and shaped the conquest summary to reflect the moral and spiritual decline evident in the rest of the book. The catalog of tribes begins with the most positive example, Judah, ends with the worst, the most negative, Dan. Now let me just stop there. What he's saying here is that, look, we got to think about geography. It's not about chronology, so it doesn't matter that Judges 1 is going to talk about things that happened back in Joshua. It's not about chronology, it's about geography. Judah gets a special emphasis, but but it does get criticized, and that they're the ones that can't, you know, beat the Canaanites because of the chariots. And he suggested here that the writer might have there might there might be a reason why Judah is the only tribe that gets anything positive said about it, and the tribes that are from the north are all negative; they're all failures. Now, what you might not be aware of, and he 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 doesn't have a comment about authorship there, is that most people, whether they're evangelical or otherwise, believe that Judges, you know, and and, and Joshua for that matter, they're they're part of some, something scholars call the Deuteronomistic history, which is really Deuteronomy through Second Kings, but you could say Joshua through Second Kings, because Deuteronomy is still part of the Torah. Um, that is the idea that all of this is written not only after the conquest, but after the monarchy fails after the days of Solomon. It's written after the time of Solomon because that's when the kingdom splits. The southern kingdom, which is Judah and, and little Benjamin, is where the Davidic dynasty is holed up, you know, where it survives. And then the, the northern uh, tribes, the ten tribes in the north, are called Ephraim. Okay, That's the northern capital. They're the ones that go apostate immediately. So there's this rivalry between the north, the northern kingdom, and the south, southern kingdom, Judah. And so Block is saying the, the writer seems to, to be using you know, a lot of this occasion to write this, this, this story to basically get at this rivalry and, and ultimately ask the question of how did, how did this just all fail so, so terribly? You know, how, how, did, you know, how did this just go so wrong? So if he's living during the days of the divided monarchy, he wants his readers to know where the, the, where the unfortunate sad story gets its start. And that's what he's doing in Judges chapter 1. Now, if you read Judges, and Block has a nice table on this, you will actually see where there's, there's some victory, okay? And then there's mostly defeat. And the victory, again, is going to go to Judah. But again, they, they do suffer their, their own loss. So he, he goes, you know, he goes through all that introduction and then he, he, he tries to get to the heart of the matter. And I'm going to confess, I'm, I'm not completely satisfied with where Block lands on this, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. And then I'm going to riff on it a little bit. So he says, the author ends his survey of Judahite fortunes. Okay. In chapter one, in the fulfillment of the divine mandate to take the land by offering a summary evaluation. Positively, they were able to wrest control of the hill country. Okay, so they did, they did have some victories. Negatively, they were unable to take the river valleys because of the Canaanites' technological superiority, again, with the chariots. 
The infantry of Judah were unable to devise an effective strategy against these state-of-the-art military resources. Chariots were useless in the highlands of Judah. But in the valleys and the river plains, they proved a great advantage. Now that, that's important. I'm going to stop there because where, where the Israelites succeed, the chariots aren't a factor. Okay, so even though the, the enemy has chariots like in Joshua, you know, 15 or you know, these other places in Joshua, I can't remember exactly where they are off the top of my head. But even though, you know, we get accounts from Joshua where the Israelites are successful and then there's a comment about, oh, the Canaanites had all these chariots, but Israel still wins. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the conquest is still successful. Those victories in the highlands, you don't take chariots up into the mountains. Chariots are useless in the highlands, so they are not a factor. In the lowlands, in the plains, in the valleys, they're a big deal because then you can actually use them. Okay, so hold that thought in your mind. What, what I'm angling for here, and what I, where I'm going to go, and I wish where Block would have gone, but he, but he he doesn't. Where I'm going to go with this is that, you know, ultimately, when God promises you know victory in the conquest, this isn't what He's saying. Hear, O Israel, you don't have to do squat. I'm just going to hand you the land. I'm God, and I can beat down all of these enemies. So, you know, kick back, do stupid things, do nothing at all, and you're still going to win because I'm God and I'm bigger. That is not the case. In in all the conquest accounts, uh, you know, Jericho, I think, is an exception because it's the first one. God illustrates the fact that he is present in a, in a dramatic way. But in the other accounts, Israel has to use strategy. They actually have to think about it. Like the incident with I, God even gives them a strategy. Okay. But Israel has to use strategy. Their, their people, their soldiers still have to be brave. They still have to go out into battle. They can't be morons on the battlefield. In other words, there's still a human element to this. This is not a passive conquest. Soldiers still have to be brave. Commanders still have to be intelligent. Your strategy still has to be coherent. Okay, and that's going to matter. It's going to matter, and I'll loop back to that in, in a moment. And again, I wish Block would have spent a little more time with that, but he doesn't. So to, to go back to Block, he says here the authors note that there were iron chariots. You know, is extremely significant not only because it expresses the impressive nature of the Canaanites' military hardware, but also because it announces the beginning of the Iron Age in Palestine. And he goes on a little bit about that. Moving on, he says, however, the significance of the author's reference to the Canaanites' iron chariots lies in the theological implications of Judah's inability to overcome superior technology. In light of Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 3, and after the miraculous conquest of Jericho in Joshua 6, no one, no matter how technologically superior to the Israelites, should have been able to withstand Judah's attack. And that's Kimmy's, that's the gist of Kimmy's question. This verse must be read in light of Joshua 17, 16 through 18, according to which Joshua had encouraged Ephraim and Manasseh by specifically declaring that the Canaanites' superior strength and their possession of iron chariots would be no hindrance to the Josephite tribe's conquest of the river valleys and plains. In our text, verse 18, the narrator explicitly attributes Judah's successes in the hill country not to equivalent military power, but to the presence of Yahweh. Then why could they not take the lowland? Why is Yahweh's presence canceled by superior military technology? The narrator does not say, but presumably the Judahites experienced a failure of nerve at this point, or they were satisfied with their past achievements. And that's where Block ends his discussion. And I, and I just, I really don't find that very satisfying. So I'm going to riff on this a little bit. You know, th that sounds unsatisfactory. You know, and it is. The, the fact is that we are not given an explanation. Well, let's just start there. You know, all, all that's backdrop to, to Kimmy's question, you know, to me sort of, you know, approaching it. We're not given an explanation. So let's begin there. Everything, you know, beyond that point is speculation. So we aren't told, for example, if there was some sort of unbelief rippling through Judah. We could surmise that based on the failure of a strategy in the lowlands that had worked in the hill country, you know, apparently, or, or some sort of strategy. And that much is hinted at, but why would that matter? Why did God not give them a strategy like he had at I, for example? And again, we aren't told. We aren't told why God gave them a strategy at I, and he doesn't give them an alternate strategy here. Overall, however, I think the point that Block makes is, is you know, it's worthwhile and shouldn't be missed. Jericho, I, you know, I think it's fair to say was unique. 
in that, it is the beginning of the conquest. It's, on, it's the only part of the conquest where God does something miraculous. I mean, have you thought about that? The rest of the conquest, we don't, we don't get like miraculous victories where you know, people are just marching around armies and everybody falls over dead. No, it, it, it's, it's human effort. Okay, there's a significant element of human effort. You got to have people, you gotta have, you got, they have to go out to battle, they have to be brave, okay? You don't, every, every engagement, in fact, none of the other engagements is Jericho. Jericho is unique. So let's not use Jericho as a measuring stick, you know, for, for this question or, you know, for what, you know, for, for the rest of the conquest. That, that is not only unfair, but it's also unwarranted because we don't get that in the text. So I think Jericho is unique because it's the beginning. You know, God is going to show them that he is present. It's the only part of the conquest where God does something miraculous, basically to show he would be with Israel. The walls fall down. And I mean, just think about it. What, what, if, what if the walls come down there, the Israelites are, what if they just stood there and laughed or clapped or had lunch? No, they have to, they still have to go into the city. So even Jericho with, with, you know, the, the miracle there, there's still a partnership here. The Israelites still have to go in there and do the job. They have to go in and fight. Every succeeding engagement has the Israelites fighting. At times, we're given specific strategery. Again, my point is that God saying he would be with Israel doesn't remove the necessity of Israelite bravery or intelligence. God being with them didn't remove their role and activity. There's no, I'm with you so you can kick back, you know, let me annihilate the Canaanites for you. That, that just doesn't happen. So the failure against the chariots could be read as the result of possibly an unworkable strategy. But then we're back to the same question. Why would that matter? Why did God not give them a better strategy? Again, we aren't told. So at, at this point, I'd only interject one other thing. You know, Block mentions it, but I think it gets lost in the details of his commentary. Judges is a book, again, very likely written at a time after Saul, even after the United Monarchy. You know, and Block talks about all the attention and space given to Judah over against, you know, Ephraim. Judah, Ephraim, those are the two, the, the two kingdoms after Solomon. So if we take that, you know, seriously, it means that the book is written to explain how Israel went wrong. The book has to explain the rise of Saul, Israel's first and its awful king. So Judges, Judges explains why Israel needed a king. I mean, that's part of the book of Judges. It explains why Israel even needed one. And the book ends this way. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So great. You know, the reader would say, okay, you've convinced me. We needed a king. And now our, ki our kingdom, if you're living when the writer's writing, again, after the days of Solomon, now it's split in two. Wonderful. How'd that happen? You know, well, it happened because Saul versus David, ultimately. You know, we had petty rivalries. You know, we, that, this is where it began. The, the, the unity began to crumble. You know, we had a, you know, we had a king like Deuteronomy outlined. You know, the Deuteronomy actually gives us rules for a king. So having a king wasn't wasn't evil or bad. It was the kind of king, and it was really why they were asking in First Samuel eight. We actually answered that in a previous Q and A. What well, you know that that's the issue of, that Samuel was getting at. They wanted a, they wanted a king who would go out and go in. You know, go out to battle and come back in. They didn't want God to fight for them. They wanted, you know, something, something else, you know, like to be like the other nations. So it seems like we had a good king for a while, David, but did we? Did, did David really follow the rules of Deuteronomy? I mean, you, you could, you could, you could look at the rules, you know, don't multiply, you know, armies, don't multiply wives, don't multiply wealth, you know, all this kind of stuff. Solomon basically violated everything. You know, David, you know, you, you could get accused of all those things as well. So the whole thing's a mess. You know, the, the, the whole experiment you know, has, has turned out to be a mess. And Judges, again, gives us a perspective as to where the mess started. And that's what Judges wants us to know. We aren't told why God let the failure happen or didn't intervene. That isn't the point of Judges. It's just, it's just telling you, here were the cracks. Here the cracks started to show up. You know, we can read between the lines. You know, as Block suggested, we can say the Israelites gave up, they got tired. Uh, you know, you know, we, we can we can make up reasons why, you know, God wouldn't have been with them or wouldn't have helped them. You know, because God wasn't going to just remove the Canaanites, and that's how Judges one ends. The Israelites just capitulate. They give up. And I think that's an important point too. It's not just the chariots. 
you know, if the only failure here was the chariots, then I think Kimmy's question would, would be the most challenging it could be. But it's not just the chariots. If you read the end of the book of Judges, they just give up. You know, they, they, they intermarry, they're, they're content with what they have. They, they, tribe after tribe after tribe, they just give up. There's no mention of chariots anywhere else. So it's really not the chariots. This reflects, again, a something bigger than chariots. There's something going on where in the face of resistance and in the face of defeat in certain skirmishes, they just come to the point where apparently they just don't believe or they don't care. And they just give up. So Judges 119, with the reference to the chariots, is actually an outlier in the problem. It's not the problem. It's an outlier. Let's add one more element. Judges 2. <laughs> okay. The second chapter. This is where the angel of Yahweh shows up and tells them that he isn't going to lift a finger in response to their failure. You know, and if you read the end of Judges 1, let's say Judges 1 around verse 27 through the end of the chapter, where tribe after tribe after tribe just gives up. You could, you could read what the angel says is essentially saying, you've given up. I'm not doing the job for you. I'm out of here. There will be no Jericho. Yeah, we're, we're not doing a miracle here. There will be no Jericho. In other words, you have to do this. You can't fear. Okay? You can't give up. Even when you lose, I mean, hey, there were, there were some losses, you know, earlier, okay? Even when you lose, you cannot give up. You must persist in doing the thing God wants you to do. He is not going to do it for you. You know, ultimately, I, I realize that that doesn't really resolve the question, but it, it does put the question into, a, into something of a different context. And, and by the way, when you hit Judges 2, let me just throw verses 6 through 10 at you, and you'll see why you can't do chronology in these chapters. Remember Judges 1.1? 1, 1? Let me just read you Judges 1.1. 1, 1. Let's start there. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, you know, who's going to go up and fight the Canaanites? You know, even the question. They're looking for somebody else to do the job. I mean, nobody says, well, you know, time to get to work. This wasn't all Joshua's job. No, they, like, then they ask, well, who's, you know, how do we do this now? So it's kind of a dumb question. But anyway, after the death of Joshua, now I go to Judges 2, verse 6. This is after the angel of the Lord has met with them and said, I'm not doing the job for you. I'm out of here. Listen to what verse 6 says. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went back or went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance at timnath Harris in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. What am I? I thought Joshua was dead. Okay, the, you can't construct a chronology from this. So again, you've got geography. You've got a whole situation. Apparently, this problem, again, Joshua's either dead before or after the problem. Now, since Judges 1 rehearses things that already happened, okay, in Joshua, then what do we do with, with that now? Are they having this problem, you know, when Joshua's still alive, maybe? You know, but at, at some point, Joshua actually does die. And there we go. You know, again, th this chapter is, is just full of the, these problems where can we even think about them chronologically? Should we just throw chronology out the window? We try to overlap them. We try to come up with a picture. Again, I think Block's advice is just think about the geography, where they had success, where they didn't have success. They didn't have success in the lowlands because of the chariots. But the chariots are only one tribe, Judah. It's only one problem. You know, and isn't it interesting that since the chariots are only mentioned with Judah, why include it? Well, if you're writing after the kingship, 
if you're writing after the monarchy, after the monarchy is split, that the, the, the dream of a, of, of a united monarchy under David and Solomon and David's line is dead. Okay, if you're writing then, you know what the messaging is? Even the tribe that God chose because he chose David, even the tribe out of which God chose his king, the man after God's own heart, and of course, ultimately, you know, his line, and you know, even after that, you know, the Messiah, even that one didn't do the job. Even that one. The other ones just give up. This one, you know, we have the chariots problem, but but they should have known. They should have known how to do the job better. Okay, because chariots, okay, in, in the highlands, that's easy. In the lowlands, you're gonna need you're gonna you're gonna need to approach it a different way. But they don't. They fail. Were they stupid? Were they ungodly? Again, we don't know. It's curious where Joshua gets buried is in Timnath Harris. Okay, without rabbit trailing into this, because this is a subject again for another episode. This place is named after the sun and the sun deity. One of, one of these words, you know, Harris, is, is a word for the sun. And that doesn't mean that the Israelites gave it the name. It, it, it does become, you know, sort of Joshua's place, okay? You know, part of his, you know, where, where, that was associated with his property, so on, his inheritance and whatnot. Is this an indication that there was a spiritual problem, you know, in, in this place? You know, I, I, we don't know. Again, we, we'd have to read that into it. But there, there are things like that. You know, ultimately, there are, there are things in this chapter, the first two chapters, that raise questions about their willingness to do the job, possibly their, their spiritual commitment. Uh, again, we, we just don't know. There are just things, there are undercurrents that, that might contribute you know, as to why, you know, why things worked out the way it worked out. You know, we just don't know. Let's move move on. And one, I'm going to read one more passage. This is what happens later in chapter two. Again, we can't read this chronologically. So since everything up to this point, from one one to chapter two verse ten, we it's not a chronology because we you know is Joshua alive or dead? We don't know. You know, there's there's stuff that's repeated that happened in Joshua's day. Again, it's not chronology. It's a summary, and, and ultimately it's about geography. But if that's true. If it's not chronological, then listen to these next few verses, and we're going to end with this. Maybe this really was the state of affairs with Judah and with everybody else in real time. In other words, this isn't something that happened after the failure. This is something that explains the failure. Here's Judges 2, 11 through 15. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods, from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the hands of their surrounding enemies, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. Now, we read that as chronology. What happens in chapter 2, verses 11 and 15? That's not the explanation for why they couldn't win with the chariots. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Because these chapters defy chronology. For the reasons that we've just, you know, overviewed here. And I know that this was, a, this was a long answer, but you, you have to, you have to be sensitized as to what's going on in this first chapter. That it, and it's a fundamental point. It defies, it defies chronological reconstruction. So we have to throw that out the window and think the thought that maybe all of this is sort of simultaneous. Maybe all of this is going on both before and after Joshua dies. And if it is, good grief, that would explain why they give up, why they don't care. It would explain why God isn't with them in the, mar in, in the matter of the chariots. Again, it's just that we, we have to, again, be alerted to the fact that we might not want to read this chronologically, and that might produce you know, a, a, an answer. Again, none, none of it's for, for sure, 
But it is certainly, you know, on the table as a way, again, to process this question, which, again, is quite involved. Um, but there it is. Again, so that that might be really the solution to throw the chronology out the window and say all of this is going on at the same time. You know, a little bit before Joshua died, after he died, it it just it goes south. It just goes south. And even Judah, even Judah, the tribe, you know, from which God is going to select the man after his own heart, even Judah falls victim to this. You know, so again, that that would be my take on it. It's very long. I understand it's almost an episode itself, but there you go. Thanks, Kimmy, for that question. That was a good one. <laughs> thanks for that episode. Thanks, Kimmy. thanks, Kimmy. <laughs> Kimmy, <laughs> no, that was good. All right, perfect. All right, Mike. Well, that's all we have for this episode, and uh, we appreciate uh, everybody sending in their questions. And again, thanks for answering them. And. Hope everybody out there is staying safe uh, and uh, staying well. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, appreciate everybody listening to the Mecca Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 